Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So you want to be on the question list? Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Apologize for being a little late. You gotta love that BQE. Uh, was on it for an hour and a half, so uh, got to know it very well. Um, good morning, I'm Council Member Danny Drum and the Chair of the Education Committee. Welcome to the fiscal 2017 preliminary budget hearing on the Department of Education. Today we'll be hearing from the DOE's Chancellor, Carmen Farina, followed by testimony from unions, parents, advocates, students, and others who wish to testify in front of the Council. The Department of Education's fiscal 2017 preliminary budget totals $22.9 billion, excluding pension and debt service, which represents 28% of the city's $82.1 billion budget. This year's budget is $971 million more than the fiscal 2016 adopted budget. This increase, in large part, funds priorities of the administration. Additionally, school budgets will grow with an increase in state funding for fair student funding. In September 2015, the mayor announced new initiatives aimed at raising achievement across all public schools as part of an equity and excellence campaign. These programs total $76.8 million in the fiscal 2017 preliminary plan and will help ensure students master critical skills on time and prepare them for future success. The administration has also provided $70 million for new mental health services as part of Thrive New York City, the administration's mental health plan. Additionally, building upon the Council's restorative justice initiative, the administration has allocated $7 million to restorative justice programs, which aim to change school culture by changing the approach to student discipline. Lastly, there is a $158.7 million increase in fair student funding, or FSF, which will increase the budgets of some schools. Those with FSF below 87% of their enrollment will see a boost. The funding will be given directly to schools to raise their operating budgets so that all schools will have at least 87% of funding. Renewal schools budgets will increase so that they all have 100% of their fair student funding budget. Though I am very happy to see any increase that directly affects school budgets, until we have all schools receiving 100% of their FSF budget, our work is not done. While the overall budget of the DOE continues to grow, I am always concerned that not enough of this funding is trickling down to the classrooms. How are students gaining from these large increases in the DOE's budget? Do we ensure we are providing adequate special education programs to all students who need them? Is there additional funding for supplies and new technological advances in the classroom? Do students have the fields and gyms they are entitled to so that they can become high achievers? How do we make classes smaller? As a former educator, I know the value of class size and what it can mean for a child's education attainment. The council has stood firm with the mayor in our demand for funding from the state as it is legally obligated to provide increased funding to New York City schools based on the Campaign for Fiscal Equity. We will continue to relentlessly fight for our funding because I, like other educators, know our students deserve it. We hope the DOE will continue to fight to gain equity in our schools as well. This leads me to my next hope for today, that we can have an honest conversation about equity for our students. The mayor is investing a lot of money to improve equity in this budget, and I know we can do more to directly affect students. Every student, regardless of neighborhood, family income, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and learning abilities, should have access to a sound education. The disparities in grade advancement, reading and math proficiencies, and graduation rates must end. We need to make sure that as a city, we are preparing our students and giving them the opportunity to become successful adults. We cannot wait on the state to get us there. We have to find creative ways to generate more revenue and be as efficient as possible. Today, we want to examine the DOE's budget in areas like the Fair Student Funding Formula and many of the needs added 
to the preliminary plan to further clarify our areas of concern. However, we do know that the DOE is making great strides to improve. A recent IBO report from February 2016 highlighted the advances New York City schools are making in student achievement. According to the report, the 2015 English Language Arts or ELA and Math test administered in grades three through eight show continued improvement in student proficiency rates in city schools and a shift in the performance of city schools compared to the rest of the state. For example, in 2006, New York City students' test scores were 11 points lower in ELA and nine points lower in math when compared with students across the state. However, last year those statistics changed when it was reported that city students performed essentially the same as those in the rest of the state in ELA and were less than three percentage points behind the average in math. That shows tremendous improvement that our teachers, administrators, parents, and schools have been able to make. While we applaud the Chancellor on all the efforts toward creating more equitable schools, the Council wants to make sure the community and the Council are involved in every step of the way. We want to see real and tangible parent engagement for all communities, dedicated staff to support our LGBT student population, and a true investment in language access services so that all New Yorkers can be engaged in their children's education. Before I conclude, I would like to thank my staff of my committee, Elizabeth Hoffman, Ken Grace, our finance analyst, Asia Schomburg, our counsel, and Jan Atwell and Joan Pavolny, our policy analyst for the committee. I'd also like to introduce my colleagues who have joined us this morning. I see Vinnie Gentili from Brooklyn, Andy King from the Bronx, Councilmember Alan Maisel from Brooklyn, Helen Rosenthal from Manhattan, Mark Traeger from Brooklyn, and Antonio Reynoso uh, from Brooklyn and Queens. And we will be joined by a number of other council members as this committee has grown somewhat because we welcome Councilmember Helen Rosenthal as a member of this committee. Thank you, Helen, for joining the committee. And also our newly elected Councilmember Rafael Salamanca who will be joining us shortly. And um, I think with that, uh, we thank you and we welcome the Chancellor's testimony. So I'm going to swear you in. If you would raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council members' questions honestly? Thank you. And would you please begin, Madam Chancellor. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Drum and members of the City Council Education Committee here today. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss Mayor de Blasio's proposed fiscal year 2017 preliminary budget as it relates to the Department of Education. Seated with me are Ursulina Ramirez, DOE's Chief Operating Officer and my Chief of Staff, and Ray Orlando, the DOZ Chief Financial Officer and a member of my senior leadership team. On the outside, I would like to thank Speaker Mark Verito, Chairperson Drum, and all the members of the City Council for your strong partnership and support on behalf of the city's 1.1 million students and all that you do every day for our school communities. With, this, with your support this year, we enrolled a record 68,500 children in free, full-day, high-quality pre-K, nearly 50,000 more students that were enrolled before Mayor de Blasio took office. These students are receiving a crucial year of problem-solving and vocabulary building that will put them on the path to long-term success. With these pre-K children come their parents and our engagement of parents at this level is at an unprecedented high. Over the past two years, we have worked to transform the school system. We have implemented a number of reforms to achieve equity and excellence and ensure our students have access to high quality education. Before I discuss next year's budget for our schools, I would like to highlight some of our accomplishments. To create a clear line of authority in our school system, we align responsibilities of supervising and supporting schools under superintendents. And these are also aligned with geographical areas, as many of you are aware of, because of your political involvement. We created new geographically-based borough field support centers that provide integrated supports to schools, 
in the areas of instruction, operations, student services, including health resources and counseling, support to students with disabilities, and support to English language learners. To share strong practices, we created two important programs, Learning Partners and Showcase Schools. Together, these initiatives demonstrate a commitment to professional development and collaboration among educators and schools that foster student learning and school improvement. This Monday alone, we hosted 170 superintendents from across the country to come see some of the programs that we are doing here in New York City. We created a model dual language program to foster collaborative pra practices among dual language educators, elevate the quality of programs across the city, and provide support and guidance to schools, staff interested in opening programs. We invested $23 million annually in arts education funding, allowing for the hiring of 300 new arts teachers and resulting in 22,000 more students receiving arts education. This Saturday, I attended the Sing of Murrow, Midwood, and Madison, where the three schools performed together, and they invited the 10 new schools that will be getting Sing money to be the judges so that we will start spreading that particular program across the city, particularly to our large high schools. In addition to which, 20,000 of our 11th graders will be attending Hamilton as a, for $10, which I think is phenomenal. Um, we launched a multi-year physical education initiative to work intensely with all our schools in eight priority districts to identify barriers to PE, develop solutions, and recommendations for citywide strategies to ensure that all students receive PE that meet state requirements. Our 80 minutes in the contract PD ensures that all our PD teachers actually go out for PD at the borough offices so that we have a consistency of approach and curriculum for our physical ed education teachers. To continue to engage students in the learning process over the summer, this year's Summer in the City will include a new curriculum, college level and STEM oriented enrichment program, and visits to the, some of the most important cultural institutions in New York City. Both mandated and non-mandated students will participate in these programs. There will be no stigma attached to going to summer in the city. And finally, in collaboration with the city council, we created approximately 220 new athletic teams, the majority of which are for small schools and for girls teams. As a result, an additional 3,000 students have access to interscholastic athletics. Additionally, with generous funding from City Council this year, we've been able to provide intensive restorative justice programming in 15 schools. With City Council funding, for the first time, our school communities will benefit from the programming and support of an LGBTQ community liaison. We've also worked together to provide all students and their families with free Microsoft software to use at home and increase civic engagement and voter participation among high school students. It was my privilege yesterday to be part of the press conference encouraging high school students to vote, and I would like to see a major campaign so to see how we can increase voting across all our high school students in this year's November election. Civic engagement is a much needed practice in our schools. As part of our work to meet the needs of every student, we created 130 new community schools. These schools are customized to a committee's, community's unique needs and create opportunities for students, families, and communities, including expanded learning time, school-based health centers, mental health programs, dropout prevention, parent workshop, and adult education opportunities. These resources are embedded into and outside the school day. We know that student achievement improves when parents are involved in their students' education. We have taken strides to improve engagement and communication with all parents, including those parents who are limited English proficient. I appointed Executive Superintendent Yolanda Torres to redesign our Division of Family and Community Engagement to strengthen relationships between communities and their schools. We are providing increased professional development training for parent coordinators, parent leaders, family support coordinators, and family leadership coordinators. We are pleased that data from the fiscal 2016 preliminary mayor's management report, looking at the first months of the school year, show that the number of school-based parent workshops and workshop participation rate increased by 60 and 59 percent respectfully, and parent-teacher conferences attendance increased by 38 percent compared to the same time last year. 
Much of this has to do with our emphasis on student-led conferences, particularly in the middle school grades, but also that we now have an additional 40 minutes a week that is committed to parent involvement and parent engagement. I want to say also that one of the things that um, Ms. Torres has done, which I think is phenomenal in my, in my presentations around the city, more and more grandparents are raising their grandchildren. So we now have a grandparent advisory council that works with Yolanda to see how we might reach more grandparents and particularly in the Asian community. This has been extremely well received and we have a whole list of uh, requests that we have around the city to hear more about how we can help them. Left parents make up approximately 43% of our families. To better communicate with them in their native language, we recently announced the expansion of language access services. Now schools have direct access to 200 languages via over the phone interpretation services, including after hours. You don't have to be coming in at two o'clock in the afternoon. You can do it after you get home from work. And citywide community education councils will have expanded language supports. This spring, each of the borough field support centers will have a full-time field language access coordinator who will be responsible for ensuring that all schools deliver translation and interpretation services to parents. We know we are making progress. Data released early this year showed a strong increase in our city's graduation rates and college readiness indicators, as well as a decrease in the dropout rate. Graduation rate was over 70% for the first time in the city's history. I was particularly pleased to see a decrease in the dropout rates all across ethnicities. While we have made critical progress, there is still much to do. We will continue to focus on strengthening instruction, expanding opportunities for all students, and engaging families to ensure there's a clear path for college and meaningful career for all our students. The mayor and I have pledged to meet rigorous benchmarks. 80% of our students will graduate from high school on time and two-thirds will be ready for college by the year 2026. To achieve the administration's goal of equity and excellence throughout the system, we are implementing eight new initiatives. These initiatives will provide students with a firm foundation in the early elementary school grades, support teachers in providing a rigorous curriculum by building their capacity, increase student access to the courses they require to be successful later in lives, and engage students in the communities where they live. The following. To boost literacy, the Universal Second Grade Literacy Program places reading coaches, teachers with demonstrated experience in literacy instruction in every elementary school. These coaches will provide kindergarten through second grade teachers with additional training in early literacy acquisition and in strategies to strengthen literacy instruction for English language learners and students with disabilities. We will be starting with two districts that are in high need and ensure that the pilot then moves on to other districts as we see success. Algebra for all, AP for all, computer science for all, seek to provide students with the skills and courses that they need to be successful in college and in today's market. Thanks to an unprecedented public-private partnership, the Computer Science for All initiative will ensure that to, by 2025, all students will receive meaningful, high-quality computer science education at each school level from elementary to high school. A few weeks ago, we had an open workshop for teachers who are going to be teaching algebra in fifth grade, and we had close to 100 teachers who came, and the commi commitment is that this, those teachers in those schools will have a departmentalized approach to mathematics, so all the students in those schools in fifth grade will actually have a very extensive pre-algebra course. And I think for the summer and even during the vacation time, we have more of those courses coming up for teachers to sign up for. Middle school access for all will provide students early exposure to college while high school access for all will also ensure our students have resources and sports they need to pursue a path to college. Recently, we had a college awareness day where we asked people throughout the city to wear the shirts of the colleges that they went to and spend 15 minutes during the school day talking about why college, this goes even down to kindergarten, why college is important, what their experience was like. I caught some members of my staff kind of fudging a little bit what college they went to because they took a two-week institute in a prestigious college, they were wearing those shirts. Um, but the idea is to make sure that kids understand the word college and that our aspirations are for all kids in all neighborhoods to have that aspiration. The Single Shepherd Pilot in Community District 7 and 23 
will pair students with dedicated counselors who will support them through high school and see them into college. It's crucial that kids who may not have, they may be the first going to college or don't have support at home, have a, an adult who's totally committed to them and totally committed to ensuring that they know all the ramification of how to fill applications, or how to know the process of doing this. All students, regardless of what type of public school they attend, deserve to benefit from the combined knowledge of our supremely talented and gifted teachers and administrators. The District Charter Partnership Program will pair district and charter schools together to foster stronger relationships and the sharing of best practices. Now I will discuss next year's budget for our schools. In the 2017 preliminary budget includes an allocation of approximately $22.9 billion in operating funds, another $6.3 billion of education-related pension and debt service funds. Our funding is a combination of city, state, and federal dollars, with city tax levy dollars making up the biggest share at 56%, state dollars at 37%, and federal and other dollars at 7%. The Mayor's 2017 preliminary budget reflects this administration's ongoing commitment to provide every student in every school with critical tools to prepare students for success in college and the workforce, and to make New York City the best urban school district in the nation. The preliminary budget builds on this administration's progress and makes targeted investments to ensure students have access to rigorous instruction and instructional and non-academic support to boost student achievement. The 2017 budget directs $76.7 million to support the Equity and Excellence Initiatives. With an investment of $187 million in 2017, the City will continue to provide targeted, tailored supports to 94 schools in the Renewal School Program. The preliminary plan also reflects an unprecedented commitment to enhance social and emotional learning in our schools through significant funding for restorative justice programs, climate supports for educators in high-need schools, and mental health programs. For all our schools, we are offering new programs to enhance school climate and reduce punitive disciplinary measures, including restorative justice, a form of discipline aimed at reducing future incidents through dialogue and self-reflection. As part of Thrive New York City, the administration's action plan to support the mental well-being of New Yorkers all pre-K students will learn social-emotional skills, and the 100 schools with the highest number of suspensions will receive mental, mental health supports. And we are offering three new mental health trainings, Youth Mental Health First Aid, At-Risk Training, and Making Education Partners in Youth Suicide Prevention. There is no worse email for a superintendent or a chancellor to get that we've lost a child at their own hands. We need to be able to say this is not acceptable. Since 2009, the state has not met its court audit obligations under the cam Campaign for Fiscal Equity lawsuit. In this school year alone, New York City public school students have ensured change $2 billion in state education funds. We are hopeful that the state will provide us with additional school aid for the next school year with adequate funding from the state. We will be able to reduce class sizes as well as hire more arts teachers and guidance counselors in schools throughout the city. While we are confident that we're headed in the right direction, we know we have a lot of hard work ahead. I look forward to my continued work with the City Council on behalf of our 1.1 million students and their families. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chancellor. Just want to start by saying we've been joined by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson from the Bronx and Councilmember Brad Lander from Brooklyn, Councilmember Ben Kalos from Manhattan has also joined us. Um, so let me just go directly to uh, questions regarding the school budgets. Uh, we understand that the weights for the English language learners, or ELLs, and students with interrupted formal education are increasing due to uh, an increase in fair student funding. Um, what will the fair student funding increase look like uh, to school budgets? And how many schools will receive additional funding to get to the 87% of their budget? Yeah. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, so the, we've, it, we, what we are doing in the fair student funding formula, uh, we're taking two steps, as you mentioned. Um, 
the, uh, we have created uh, new weights for English language learners and for students with interrupted formal education. Uh, those uh, weights are going to be embedded in the formula so that schools that serve these populations are better able to, are better funded and better able to provide services to these populations. The students with uh, interrupted formal, uh, the weights themselves are, are posted online and I can read them to you. I'm not sure how helpful that would be, um, but uh, the CR 154 uh, requires us to continue to provide services to English language learners after they've been deemed proficient for a period of two years. So we've created a new weight for uh, those students in K to 5 and then a new weight for 6 to 12. Uh, in addition, we've created a new weight for bilingual students, um, both K to 5 and 6 to 12. So there's five new weights. The other weights all remain the same. We've just made new weights uh, for those purposes. Uh, the second thing we've done is uh, the mayor's preliminary budget includes uh, over $150 million to raise the floor of the fair student funding formula, uh, which, is, which the mayor raised last year from 81% to 82% for schools at the bottom, as well as raised all renewal schools to 92%. In the upcoming school year, uh, we're proposing to raise the floor from 82% to 87%, which would be the highest floor we've seen since the formula was created over a decade ago. Um, and the, uh, the over 650 schools would see an increase. Um, there, are, there are over 650 schools below 87 currently, all of whom would be raised to 87. That would lead to a system-wide average of 91 percent, which again would be higher than we've seen. And I want to be clear that one of the things, it's not just about money, but it's about professional development. So in, in every borough office there is a team that is working specifically with English language learners. And we have increased our professional development because they're not all the same. So you have bilingual students who have been here a few years. You have bilingual students who have just arrived into this country. You have dual language programs. And we're trying to make sure that we have very discrete professional development for each of these categories. And that has been very helpful in terms of meeting the needs of different parts of the city. And we want to ensure that we've also done a lot of the training in conjunction with the UFT and as many resources as possible because this is a high need area of teachers. So even our recruitment for teachers in this category is going to be um, much more extensive this year than it has been in the past. Okay. And so um, what will happen to the schools that are already at 87 percent? Will they see an increase? Uh, they will continue to. Sorry, uh, they'll continue to receive what they received this year. So if you're at 87, you'll remain at 87. So they'll be basically at the same amount? Same, essentially the same, okay. yeah. And um, oh, what, I should mention that all renewal schools this year are being brought from 92% to 100%. Sorry. So with, with the renewal schools at 100%, what, um, how did you decide or why did you decide to go to 100% in those schools? Well, I mean, obviously, they are our most struggling schools. And one of the things that we are putting in those schools is extra support for students. Those are the schools that, wherever possible, have smaller class sizes. They also have uh, lead coaches for principals. They also have a um, special reading program we put in, Reading Rescue, which is showing really good success. We have, to, in our middle schools, we're using the MSQI uh, approach. So these are schools that we look very carefully at their data and look to see what it was that each school needed. So in some schools, they wanted more guidance counselors, but we wanted to make sure that no student fell through the cracks in these schools in particular without that extra support. And we're already seeing schools, I mean, I was just talking to Council Mourinho, like a school like MS50 in Williamsburg that is already going to have an extra class coming in next year. MS80 in the Bronx, 80 kids applying for that school that did not apply before. So it's very crucial that we not only help our renewal schools, but we build them up so as they get much better that parents see them as attractive choices. How much more money would be needed to bring every school up to 100%? Uh, this year that would have cost $700 million. $700 million? Yes. Now, with the, um, the money that we're owed from um, CFE, estimated at $2 billion, would that would bring additional services to the system? Would that would cover the $700 million? Yes, that $2 billion could be used to cover the $700, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to ch shift gears here a little bit, in your testimony, I know that you mentioned the LGBT liaison, something that's very personally important to me. Um, how is the LGBT liaison doing? Can you give us a little bit of a description? I know he only started about six weeks ago, but I do also know that he has been swamped with phone calls and goodwill and good wishes, et cetera, so forth and so on. Well, I think that the most important um, sign of success 
is that he can't keep up with the people who are calling for his services. So that's number one. I think also that he's being shared by several departments. And I think the department that for us uh, has brought us the most satisfaction is the fact that he's engaging so much with parents. Because where we found a real need is to explain to parents how to um, ex relate to their students who have come out. And where we thought we would have more requests from certain parts of the city, this has been universal. I mean, he is set up to be work in every single borough at some point. The other thing we want to make sure is that principals who need extra support, we've asked superintendents who may have more of a need to ask him to speak at, superintendent, at principals meetings in their districts so that principals can understand how to have conversations around these topics. One of the things we'll be doing for next year is we will be creating one or two showcase schools where this is an issue and the principal has dealt with it well so that other principals who want to go and see how to do workshops around transgender youth, for example, how to talk to parents, not just the parents whose kids are doing this, but the other parents who then are going to have their children asking questions. So I think he's been a wonderful addition, and I think also every time he goes somewhere, he figures out one more handout that he had to develop so that he can do it more across the city. So I'm, I'm really very uh, excited about this particular person. So I recently visited Newtown High School, um, both uh, to see the uh, GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance that they have there, but also on Monday uh, regarding um, the provision of uh, feminine hygiene products in that school as well. But I was so pleased when I walked into the building to see posters all over the school announcing the, G the uh, GSA and the meetings that they were going to have. It was really very, very nice to walk in and see that. In addition, um, another success story maybe perhaps in areas that people might not think about because they consider Queens to be a little bit more conservative than some of the other areas, is uh, Rocky Sanabria, who testified here about two years ago, has now been elected the president, you know, a transgender student, has now been elected president of the Maspeth High School Student Council. So I think little by little we are making progress, and I want to see that continue. I know that um, in the funding that we did give you last year as well, some of it's to be used for um, the implementation of a balanced literacy program through Lambda Literary. Can you give me a description about how that's going? And the other piece of it was for Peace for Professional Development um, in June, I think, on the um, Professional Development Day, what we used to call the Brooklyn Queens Day. Well, that's been, uh, professional development has been one of our major goals. When you're talking about the money that affects the classrooms, I believe that's the money that affects the classrooms. So we have definitely started using our 80 minutes on Mondays to be doing more of a cycle kind of approach. So six weeks of teaching literacy approaches to teachers across all grades. We put out this year um, a reading and writing scope and sequence for high schools. We will be coming out at the end of this month with curriculum units in social studies. We've already done it in science. So one of the approaches that we've taken over the last two years is to come up with more curriculum guides that teachers can use universally across the city. This is not about teachers in their own schools having to sit down and write guides just for themselves because, first of all, it's not the best use of their time. And also, we need more consistency, one of the things that's very clear to me. So I think the balanced literacy in terms of making sure that kids the read 365, New York City reads 365 has also said these are the new books that are out there. We put these books in every school. Um, we have posters everywhere you go, including high schools. You'll see these are the books that the kids are reading based on our citywide initiative. Also, a lot of parent workshops on how to encourage literacy at home. So I think we have done a pretty good job in terms of the literacy component. I think now one of the things we really want to start focusing a little bit more on is the math. You know, how do we look at what's working, what's not working? I was in District 21 yesterday and was one of the issues. Um, that a lot of parents haven't learned this way, so they have some questions about how they can more um, get involved. But I think in this particular area, we've done a very, very good job. And the satisfaction rate among teachers for our Monday PD is at 92% in one of the surveys we did. And that's something, as you know, Danny, is almost impossible. 92% of happy people on anything is almost impossible. So in, on PD, that's really good. So with, specifically with the Lambda Literary, that's going to move forward, am I right? That's going to about 20 schools, I think? Yes. And then the Professional Development Day for the LGBT stuff, that's moving forward, yes, I understand, as well. And um, are we still on schedule to have a Pride celebration at Tweed? Yes. We are. I have to. Yes, are. So many things are happening. I have to figure out. Okay. I, I love celebration, so yeah. I'm. No, I go. I believe in celebrations. I am the queen of celebrations. So, to me, um, I remember. 
Now, the one thing we haven't done enough in education, and, and I always feel this, we always point fingers on what's not working. And we have to spend more time and energy on what is working because people do not rise to the occasion if they don't have high morale. And I think one of the things I'm proudest of is I, as I go out throughout the city, will teachers will say, you know, I feel good about being a teacher or I want to stay in this profession. And I think that's something we have to focus on. So celebration for me on every single level possible is all good. So I think another area of major importance for us and, um, and, and, and a credit to your commitment to uh, changing discipline policies in our schools has been the emphasis on restorative justice uh, practices. So what is your long-term goal for expanding restorative justice and other alternatives to suspension in the schools? And I believe the suspension rate was down, if I'm not mistaken. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Well, I think one of the most important things we've done is that we are working with NYPD in terms of the, you know, retraining of school safety officers to take a more de-escalation approach to talking to kids. I don't think there's enough conversations prior to, you know, having a negative approach to a student, so I believe that we have to train all teachers about how do we use mindfulness, you know, wellness training. I went to a school recently in Queens where all students are taught how to take a moment out when they think they're about to do something wrong and, and just relax and really think through what they're going to do. So I think a lot of training of teachers and students on how to do more de-stressing exercises. But I think a prime example of where we're going is that um, some, uh, there are a few things that set me back in this job. I'm, I'm, I'm having a great time and I try to do as much as I can in a positive way. But my first visit to, to Rikers was a really eye-opening experience. So my end goal is to have less of that or the students that we have reshifted, thanks to Mark Rampasant and Tim Santi and a few other people, we have put in books in the classrooms. All the books have themes of social justice, which I actually got from the reading list of Satellite Transfer High School Academy. Uh, we have put a lot more volunteers there. We're looking at uh, five hours of school versus, so our goal for restorative justice is also giving the kids more opportunities to do things that are meaningful for them. That's where after school programs and middle schools matter. That's where I think also having community organizations that work in the after school program. So we have to take a long range approach. We should not be looking at a pipeline to prison. We should be looking at a pipeline to college. And that's really the goal should be in terms of how we look at our restorative justice. It's interesting that you mentioned Rikers as well because I've, I've been there twice um, to see the school and uh, the difference between the first time I was there and the second time was, was, was great. Um, I saw a lesson being taught by um, the teacher uh, on persuasive speaking and he had a very innovative way of um, introducing that to the students. He, um, or she I should say, actually used a whiteboard, a, um, a smartboard smart to um, pull up a speech uh, that was being given by a Miss America candidate and everybody sat up and took notice of that woman giving that speech. I'll tell you that was very true. Um, we so have a master principal there now, uh, ambassador teachers. We really are trying very hard to change the whole culture there. One of the things that does concern me, and we're going to talk about this later on in a, um, in a uh, corrections um, hearing, but is how, how many students are actually getting to those classes. Would you know offhand how many are getting to the classes or have there been refusals to show up to class or problems with uh, transporting students to class? No. We have had tremendous cooperation, cooperation from Commissioner Ponte. He has sat in on a lot of our discussion. He has made things possible for us that we thought were just part of the rules. So we have not had that as a resistance. We now have students actually got a, a Mm -hmm. bunch of letters from them in terms of how much they love the books that they were getting to read. So we're just going to be expanding our work there to, to make it, you know, again, many of those students are there for a certified part of time. So our next step is to ensure that students who have been incarcerated are given support when they move back to their regular schools. So we have two or three plans on what we're going to be doing there, and I'm happy to share it next time because that's still a work in progress. But this is really exciting, and um, Tim Osanti is working on it with Anna Bermudez and her department. So I met with some advocates yesterday, actually, about Rikers, specifically and about the school on Rikers. And um, while I think there's been some good, really good things going on with the 16 to 18-year-olds, there continue to be uh, some issues regarding 18 to 21-year-olds and their access to education programs. 
Have, has anybody talked with you about that, and, and what is the rule on that? I think we're trying to get this done right, and then we're going back to the conversation. It has been brought up, but it hasn't been followed through on yet. Okay. Yeah, it was just recently brought to my attention as well. And, and um, in terms of um, access to the Internet and computers, which um, you know, for prisons is, a, is, is an issue, yeah. but most of these youth who are on Rikers are not, have not been sentenced. Right. Um, and so restrictions around Internet is a problem as well. And actually, it's a main way to motivate students to do learning, as I saw in the lesson that I observed while I was there. Are discussions going to be held around that issue with the We're Department hold, of Corrections? Yes. The, the, the issue there is like many of our schools, we had that issue um, even in our regular schools, is the wiring capacity and the old structures that don't allow to wire easily. So it is under discussion, and we're looking to see how we, we are able to succeed with that. So for capital projects on Rikers, it falls, I think, into, if I'm not mistaken, Council Member, maybe the Speaker's District, or Council Member Custom Needs, I believe, District. But if other people were interested in providing capital dollars or Res OA money, is that a possibility? Is that something that they need there? It would have to go to a different department, but I, mean, I would never turn anything away that has money that helps our kids. So, <laughs> and one of the things we've gotten very good at, and I think this is also a compliment to the council, we've done a lot more work with interagency supports. I mean, we meet with just about every commissioner. Um, so that, because it, it's not, you know, it takes a village is not just a cliche, it's a reality. So just to work on Rikers, we met with at least four different departments, uh, and probably more going forward. And I think that's really important. So I would say if there's money forthcoming, it's where does it go, but how does it get spent? So just to go back to restorative practices, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, the other council members. Um, how much uh, in total is the DOE investing in the fiscal 2017 budget toward restorative practices? And how much of that is for internal staffing? Uh, how much is being sent directly to schools, et cetera? So I want to say thank you, too, to the council who gave us funding last year to uh, initiate some of our restorative justice projects. 2.4 million. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was fantastic. And what we're doing is learning from that and trying to expand upon it. Um, this upcoming fiscal year, we have approximately $7 million in restorative uh, practices um, in school climate work. Um, I don't know the breakdown in terms of how much is being spent centrally and how much is being spent on schools, but a big portion of it is um, going to be dedicated to our um, 20 most highest offending schools. And we're really trying to pr provide comprehensive supports to those uh, principals, um, whether through social workers and guidance counselors. 5.4 million goes to the schools. 5.4? Yes. Okay, thank you. And um, are renewal schools being included? Is every renewal school being included in, in, in using uh, restorative practices? We're taking a hard look at what supports are giving to renewal schools, either through community schools and also through restorative justice uh, programs. We are um, being delicate of how much supports we're giving to our renewal school programs because we don't want to overwhelm the principals. Um, so depending on what their suspensions rate, rates look like, we will assess. But um, as you may know, we've seen a drop in our suspensions in some of our renewal school programs, which has been um, really on the effort of the principals and the superintendents. And uh, in terms of the model that's being used in the schools, I think from the information I've received so far is that the model is that you are putting a full-time staff person into the schools to conduct or to lead in the area of restorative practices. Am I correct on that? What we're trying to do uh, is our capacity building framework, which is to train five individuals within a school on restorative practices to be experts to come back to the school and train all of the staff on restorative practices because we know that you, it does take a village even within a school to understand what restorative practices look like. Um, and so we're going to have five experts in the building. Um, and we're really looking for schools who really want to do this and have an openness to it. Um, and we have some superintendents who are interested in trying to figure out how to do it in their entire district. You should also know that one of, we received a grant this year of about over a million dollars mm -hmm. to work on social emotional issues with adults. And we put this money in our, for our training our superintendents, emotional well-being for adults. And all our superintendents have spent a year working on what we call LCI model, but we want them then to turnkey to the principals. 
So we're looking at social emotional research justice for everyone in the system, not just for the students, but how does, how does a teacher de-escalate? How does a principal learn how to talk to a group of angry parents? So this is a consistent all the way down approach and I think the superintendents who have chosen to do this deeper because they've actually uh, been studying this together and they have put in uh, proposals to how they can expand it is much better than my putting out a mandate across the city, all of you must do this. We really people, we want people to come to the table on many issues and say, I really want to get better at this, I'm willing to own this, and I'm willing to make sure that if I get better at it, other people will get better at it as well. So that's part of the process in how we've done this. So I agree, and I, th I think even um, involving uh, kitchen staff, custodial staff, school safety agents is really important in terms of turning the culture around in, in schools where we have issues because if a student is acting up during lunchtime, you know, and, and aid is with that child, and then all of a sudden it gets thrown back to the teacher when the teacher comes to pick them up, you know, it's not being helpful even though the teacher has been trained in the restorative practices. So how will those five people ensure that the professional development and the change in the culture of the school is actually going to occur? Well, one of the things that we've said to superintendents who then in turn say to principals, we want to see the 80 minutes on Mondays not just to be about academics. We want to see five to six week cycles. One of the things I've just told principals in elementary school, I want to see speech teachers doing PD because we know that if you have speech teachers teaching early childhood teachers, things like phonics and phonemic awareness were much more likely to get them to read earlier. So the restorative justice team is also supposed to be working in those 80 minutes to train other teachers. The other thing is also, and I totally agree with you, we know which points of the day are the most problematic. Early morning arrival if they have nothing to do, lunchtime without, without a doubt. So we've been trying to uh, train principals on how they do all kinds of things. We look for models, flip-flops, you know, more physical activity. We said. You can hire your phys ed teachers to do lunchtime as long as it's part of their program. Um, and also dismissal time at 3 o'clock. What you do in the schoolyard as a leader says a lot about your school. And also restorative justices, and again, this is a little bit more fragile, um, when parents are not in agreement. Because if you have two or three factions in a school, how do you resolve issues? So it's a multifaceted, and also we've asked um, Yolanda Torres through the parent engagement to do restorative justice to the parents. Um, so we've been trying to do this multiple ways. There's no one way. It has to be everybody on board. Mm -hmm. And uh, the issues of um, racism, homophobia, that enter into why many students may be acting out, is that something that these restorative uh, programs are addressing directly? Yeah. Yes, and I would say that within the 20, you know, and further our, one of our programs that we got funding for, which is our SSOPE program, we would have an MSW, a full-time MSW or LM, LMSW on staff who would, um, I am an MSW, so I know that there is training around how to talk to students um, who identify as LGBT and how to um, really deal with children with different, uh, uh, different issues. Also, we have been training people on Lois Herrera to have these conversations at the school level. The same, I think you were there when I went to the Manhattan borough planning for, uh, for trans, the LGBT event that the borough office held. We asked other boroughs to start having the same thing in their offices. So that we start doing these things much more universally. And also even with parents, how do you talk to your child and how do you get your child to tell you that they're being bullied? I mean, everything I'm learning about bullying, I shouldn't say everything, but a lot, I'm learning from my grandchildren and what they tell me and, and I, well, I don't tell anybody, you know, and this is, um, so I think we have to also even use literature to get kids to talk about certain things. And our guidance training this year has been ramped up quite a bit and on this particular issue there have been extensive workshops for guidance counselors, not to wait until it comes to you, but how do you start having discussions to school as a whole so that you'll figure it out in open conversations. And with the restorative justice programs, are we also working with teachers on implicit bias, their own issues as they come to the disciplinary process? I think that's a very, very important part of really changing the culture of the schools. If, if they're not addressing their own issues, then it's hard to get them to buy into the overall restorative program. 
I think this is something that the Chancellor and I are working closely with um, our partners in labor on in terms of conversations about um, you know, prejudice and bias um, within our staffing and also looking at uh, some of the disproportionality in some of our numbers. And, and everybody's open to having these conversations um, and it's something that we want to address. So is there any money being put aside for that? I think it's part of our overall PD because it's easy to change laws, not easy to change hearts. And this is one of the things that really involves a lot more principal training on how to have these serious conversations at a teacher's meeting. And I do think this is moving in the right direction. I generally discuss it with, you know, Michael Mulgrew with the UFT. You know, what are the kind of workshops that we can do? I know we're having one, I think, in two weeks uh, with guidance counselors around different issues. But this is something that has to be very local uh, and very careful because we want people to do this because it's the right thing to do, not just because we're mandating it. And I know I said I was going to make that my last, but I just have one more, one more issue that I want to bring up before I turn it over to my colleagues. Community learning schools, both the UFT and the DOE initiated ones. Governor is talking about putting, I think, $100 million into the budget. Hopefully we can raise that. I think the advocates were asking for closer to $500 million. Um, can you just tell us, give us a breakdown, how community learning schools are going um, and what you see in the future moving forward for community learning schools? Well, I think it's a work in progress. Um, we started them, some of them were already in place, but I think it's the matter of first finding the right partners for the schools. Not all partners are good for the schools that they might have been assigned to. So I think that's number one. We're in the business of looking at that right now, asking for principal and teacher feedback. Is this the right partner for you? What is it that you want to accomplish? Are they letting you do this and so forth? I've been visiting a lot of these myself to get a sense of also are they embedded during the school day or are they just being seen as an after school program? Our model is embedded during the school day. Um, they should be in classrooms supporting, you know, I went to a school where I've been communicating with this teacher since September. First year teacher, very idealistic, wants everything to happen and she, so every two weeks we talk to each other, how are things going? And I went to visit her classroom and she has all L students, struggling students, and her energy is cont contagious. And she had two of the community-based partners sitting in the back of the room working with two kids individually, each of them, to make sure that they were following the lesson that she was doing with the rest of the class. That to me is a model. Also with community-based organizations, I want to see more emphasis on working with the whole family, where they have been particularly successful is in raising attendance in a lot of our renewal schools. We've been looking at attendance as one, as our, one of our benchmarks and they went out and knocked on doors, rang doorbells, um, call parents or kids if they don't show up. So I think that's been wonderful. I think we still have work to, to do in terms of how we co coordinate better what they're doing in the school. Went to see another school recently where they're doing a lot of the preparation for high school exams, this particular organization. So on the Chris Caruso, we've been doing a lot what works, what doesn't work, and we're going to be having a big meeting now towards the end of the year to look at what are the best practices that each of them do so that others can learn from that. So I visited uh, PS1 on Friday and I was very, very impressed by what I saw. That's a UFT collaborative learning school. And I think the key there was, um, in essence, the principal selection of the CBOs that she wanted to have work in the building. And uh, she had picked um, one of the two of the groups that I saw that were actually working in the classroom was the American Ballet Theater, which was great, and they were doing some dance and movement with kids. And then the other one was, uh, I think it was the New York Architectural Society, oh. and they were doing the bridge building with the kids. And so that was really interesting as well. But just to um, you know, uh, promote that, because I really do believe that um, when we deal with children holistically, it's the best approach to addressing all of the needs of those children. And so I want to continue to move down that lane as well. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now we're going to go to questions from council members. Sorry. Yeah, we're going to go to council member Mark Traeger, followed by council member Rosenthal, King, and Reynoso. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum, for your leadership, and uh, welcome, Chancellor. Good to see you again. Uh, Chancellor was, uh, spent some time in my district uh, last night uh, at a CEC town hall. Welcome. Uh, and Chancellor, just to uh, continue on some of the, uh, the conversations from, from last night, uh, I, in a different capacity, I, I chair uh, the Committee on Recovery and Resiliency. We've talked about this where the mayor has a very uh, ambitious 
plan called One NYC, how to make the city more resilient and more sustainable. And to me, uh, I've been very uh, vocal on not just building physical resiliency, but human resiliency and building up human capacity. That, you know, if the goal is to place solar panels and, uh, you know, all other sustainable measures across the city, that that should not equal t to a jobs plan for Germany or China, but a jobs plan for New York City. And to start retrofitting uh, our public schools that are geared towards these CTE areas to train them with the skills to build these types of technologies, to build them here and to install them for the future. Some of our CTE programs are, are great, but some of them are working on things that, are, that will probably be obsolete in 20, 30 years from now. Um, and so you and I have had great discussions about, about this. You pointed out some schools in Staten Island and others. But I would love for us to send a message to work with school districts in the uh, Hurricane Sandy impacted communities that witnessed the flooding in their communities for those kids to be a part of the answer to minimize the risk of a next Sandy. Uh, it will be something if they grow up to have the jobs and the skills to make their neighborhoods and make their city more, more resilient. So this is something that I, I would really appreciate to work with you on to figure out PS 97, one elementary school in my district that has TCUs that need to be removed. If we can build an extension that is in the resiliency sustainability frame, that would be a fantastic opportunity to create a pipeline from elementary, middle school to, to high school. And lastly, just to reinforce the point, I don't know, uh, I don't know if we're on the, I am on the clock, uh, just to, um, I'd love to work with your office and SEA as well on making sure that the, the, the wiring in our schools is sufficient. I know this, the chance where you hear us on this, we agree. But the number one request that, that my office gets for ResoA funding is constantly wiring bathrooms. Um, and if we're setting a goal of computer literacy, uh, computer science by 2020, uh, sometime there, our schools are still wired to the early 20th century. And Absolutely. so what, what is the plan to make sure that all of our schools have adequate wiring so our ResoA money can be used for computer labs and science labs. So I, I'd like to hear your feedback. And I do want to, again, Chancellor, just yesterday listening to you answer questions about homework, answer questions about such technical granular things in schools, it's great to have a Chancellor who gets it, who understands this language, who understands what parents, children, educators go through. So I, I commend you for really getting it. And I'd love for us to work together to really advance this school system to make sure that our kids are learning 21st century things and giving them 21st century opportunities. Uh, thank you, right. and I wait your response. Let, let me take two different things that you just sure. said. We have made a major investment um, in CTE. Um, since the last time I was here, we have a new head of CTE, John Woodland, who used to be um, head of Co-op Tech, but also George Washington High School. Right. And as a result, as you know, we have been highlighting what are the CTE programs that, as you say, are, are, we need for tomorrow and the year later, because a lot of the programs are no longer needed. So he's been doing an assessment of all our CTE programs and also seeing what are CTE programs that we could use that we haven't really started expanding. To me, computer science, uh, robotics, I went to the robotics fair this Saturday and I was very impressed by the things that kids could do, but not enough kids are doing it, including at Grady. And how do we make sure that we have centers? We don't have these centers in every single school, but how do we have them in at least one in every borough? And we have plans for some of that um, so that all kids will be exposed to the work of technology. But also our best CT programs are culinary arts. I, was just, I just got an email yesterday. One of our CTE um, graduates is getting a full year internship in Paris studying under a three-star Michelin uh, chef. I mean, those are the kinds of things that we should be doing because it's career ready, college ready. It can be both or it can be one or the other. So I think CTE is really in good hands and we need to make sure that when we look at them in the high schools that they are doing, going in the right direction. They also need to be the CTE as I, as I feel. They need to be more engaged in what's happening in their communities. So one of the CTE programs, particularly in Staten Island, that has an, um, an advertising component. The teacher uh, was formerly worked for one of the, I just connected to Helen Rosenthal. I want them to do the campaign 
for voters for high school. Let the high school kids develop a program, give them a little extra money for their program, and then they can do that. I think the wiring issue is much more complicated, not because we don't want to solve it, because it's extremely expensive. And until we get the fair share of funding and everything else, and also over, figure out how to override buildings that are over 100 years old, that no matter what you do, um, may not have the right wiring. My feeling is a lot of the wiring that we can, you know, like even using cell phones in our schools. I've been to schools where they're developing apps. The Y plan program in New York City is moving to almost all our high schools where they use apps as part of their learning. So I don't want to say to you this is going to happen tomorrow uh, because I, I don't know financially. I'm, you want to ask something? Uh, very expensive. Uh, there's uh, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, a cost that would be, you know, measured with, in billions of dollars to bring all of the buildings up. And so ultimately, we have plans to uh, wire buildings for infrastructure, purchase the hardware necessary, do the voice and data systems, uh, all of that. There's baseline technology in the capital plan. Most of this work is capitally eligible. Um, but uh, the, it's, it's a lot of work, it's very expensive, and as the Chancellor points out, the buildings themselves are, are quite old. So Mr. Chair, when we go to Albany for Lobby Day, we, we have an agenda to fight for money for our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go to Councilmember King, followed by Reynoso, and then Councilmember Gibson. Well, by the way, we're going to, everybody's on a clock for five minutes. And uh, we ask that you stick to the issue of expense budget items. You mean we can't talk about the cookout? No. <laughs> mm. Well, good morning, Chancellor. It's always a delight to have a welcoming conversation, which I will say, hearing you speak lets us know that there is a dedicated educator at the helm here and not just a figurehead coming to talk with us. So thank you um, for your expertise. I have about four questions for you. I'm going to jump right in. I do have a statement, though, regards to charter schools neither for it or against it, but just like to see a school system that, that's merged into one that can help all our children learn and be productive people when they, when they grow up, graduate out of high school. Um, and I find it a little odd that due to the fact that all the money that's being spent on charter schools and the space that they use in public schools, that we, ha they ha we haven't figured out a way that you oversee and have really control over how charter schools are operating since they, a lot of them are in our school building. That's something that we need to figure out how to change to help you move that conversation. Because at the end of the day, my first question goes into um, kind of, of how do we, or what is the plan for all these different schools, builders that have different schools in them, how do we make them work together because of limited space, limited resources, where you once had one building where you had Absolutely. a set of sixth grade classes, now you have four schools that have sets of sixth grade classes. How do you, or is there a plan to consolidate? How do you manage all of that financially being responsible? Because these buildings are administratively top heavy with all the money that's being spent for administration in some of these, in, in these buildings. So that's one of my first questions. What's, what's, what's the Can plan Can I answer that? that one before you go to the next one? Sure. Okay. I, as you know, you, you and I visited a school together where there was a charter and a public school in the same building. To me, the most important thing is to figure out what each of them has that the other one wants or can use. So that it has to be of mutual benefit for both schools to share. And we saw very clearly that the charter school in that building had done some really interesting work in terms of individualizing mm -hmm. student needs. The other school was doing some interesting work in some other areas. So we, are, we put out a grant this year, actually this last month, to, for charter schools and district schools in the same building to write a grant on what they would like to do together. Most of the schools are requesting to share after-school programs, which I think makes a lot of sense because neither one has enough money on their own. But also, it's not just about sharing practices. We need to break down the barriers that kids think that they're better because they're in this school versus this school. So if they are doing things together, they're more likely to work well. And we have a school in the Bronx right now, three middle schools, one elementary school. Elementary school is a charter school in that building where all the principals meet once a week and decide what are the things that they're going to do together and what are the things they're going to send kids from one school to the other school to learn more of. And three of the schools are renewal schools. So I think there's a lot more work can be done in this. Again, this is not an area of mandate. This is an area where people with good will want to say, I have this. We've already designated several 
charter schools that I think are doing some innovative work to work with some of our public schools, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. We have a lot to learn from each other, but we need to do it, you know, openly, and also no one has all the answers. This, you know, 1.1 million kids, we need all the help we can get. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, my next question goes into diversity and leaderships in the schools. How is your budget going to, um, as I guess say, develop um, leadership and builders that reflect the students in the building. So there is, I heard you talk about you know, distressing out at times in the school. Sometimes when there is there that bond, just because we come from the same cloth and the same history, some of that stresses can go away. So how do we, how, that's a question of how do you plan to make sure that the schools reflect the principals and teach the faculties reflect the neighborhood? Just as a question for you. You also mentioned in your testimony about 3,000 3, more students have access to sports. I know over the last couple of years I've been an advocate for SSAL. Just like to know if there's a plan to grow that number as well. And finally, the renewal schools that we've put all these monies and community schools resources in, what is the plan once these schools get up to par, everyone's functioning, everyone is happy, kids are graduating, um, do we continue to keep putting the monies into those schools? Or what happens? Because if we take it out, we might be back to where we started. All this in just a few minutes. Okay, let me start with leadership. Um, I really want to feel that if we have the right leaders in New York City, that the color of their skin doesn't necessarily affect how they're going to talk to kids. That's not to say that they, there aren't people who serve as good models. If you look at our superintendents, we are as diverse as diverse can be, and we run the gamut. We, we probably have one-third, one-third. If, if there's one area that we're not as diverse, we don't have as many males as we have females mm -hmm. uh, because there is still the sense that teaching is a woman's job. You know, uh, we're trying to change that. We're trying to create, um, and I was in Chicago two weeks ago, where they started creating future teachers clubs in the high schools and made sure that the future teachers are not all women. So there's a lot of work to be done in diversity. I think as long as every student has someone in the building they can relate to, certainly for me, being able to seek Spanish to a family that's in dire need of something does lessen the tension, so I get that but I want to say that that shouldn't be the determining factor for what makes a good leader. I think your question about renewal schools, and I forgot what this other one was. I have PSA. Oh, PSA, okay, sure. Um, I want to be clear that there is always going to be, in any system, a bottom 10 or 20% of schools, always, forever, as long as I've been around. And whether we call them renewal schools or something else, they're always going to need extra support. We're looking at our renewal schools a little differently. We're looking at them as we're going to give every child a chance, but we are also going to, and we've already done so, close some of them. We are going to merge and consolidate others. If you have two schools, both of which have like 110 kids, together they'll be able to provide more services for their kids without an administrative overhead. So we're looking at that as one of the other things and how we look, not just at our renewal schools, but schools in general. We had schools literally with 67 children, with the principal and the assistant principal, and so to the degree that we are going to constantly need building leaders, might these leaders be better? And we've been working with the unions on this. This is not something we do unilaterally. But I do think that the merging, consolidation, closing, and supporting of renewal schools is an investment in our kids. No child should be in a school where they won't be successful. The other thing, we have made it very conscious, there are several schools based on the state criteria, the 94 schools that already sort of came off the list. We're keeping them there because they need a whole harmless year. They need a year where you're not pulling out the rug from under them. I remember years ago when you have a SIR school. I mean, I forgot all the acronyms that we had. And then all of a sudden, this was happening. They had after school programs. Had, and then all of a sudden, it disappeared. We need to support, in particular, certain parts of the city where there's a lot more trauma, where we, we see what a wraparound service is all about and how that helps. So I do think this is all part and parcel of our plans. In terms of the PSAL, uh, yes, just specifically, we're going to add approximately 500 new teams over the course of the next four years, and we're focusing on both the small schools and also developing girls' teams. Okay. And any of you who might have won, I don't know if any of you went to the PSAL on uh, Saturday. Uh, Saturday. Uh, very exciting, and uh, the Jefferson campus won. Lincoln High School unfortunately lost, but I did get a T-shirt from the Lincoln <laughs> High School principal today. <laughs> to remind me that he's not just about sports, he's about academics too. So, And for, uh, for the girls, South Shore won uh, okay. and Francis Lewis lost, just in case people were wondering. And okay. the other thing we're trying to do, you didn't ask this, but I think it relates to what you're saying. 
We're looking on how do we work differently with co-located high school campuses. Mm. Because if you have, and I'll use an example of a school I'm particularly proud of, and I have to say thank you out loud to Mark Rampersent, who's been unbelievable with all these. You have six schools in a building, six principals who don't talk to each other, not by, you know, just because they don't. And we are now trying to do something a little different. Um, we're trying to develop building managers. So one person, and this was as a, at a request of to your city council, actually, I had um, Councilman Klein and Councilman Lavaca meet me after school. And we put certain parameters in place that we want to do at more of our campus high schools. For example, a building manager who makes all the day-to-day -day decisions around safety and dismissals and all the things that you, six people to agree on this might be too many. We also created a building council of students, two from each school. We're now going to be creating a parent council of two parents from each school. So they will start having opportunities to talk to each other. We are also developing AP courses that each school will take on one area of expertise, but that students from other schools will be able to partake of, which requires one of the most difficult things, a common bell system. Now, if you think it's difficult to break the code, try to have a common bell system in a school. But it's something we're doing, and we're going to be using that school as an example, and I have five more high schools on my agenda to go meet with. I sit, we talk all the principals, and we develop a plan that's going to meet the needs of that school, but how they can work, because that's how we utilize better resources. And also, one sports team for the campus, Yes. Um, one after school, pro one debate team for the campus. Um, we've been rewarding schools uh, with tickets to, Jeff to Hamilton. Um, it, it works to see that when schools put their minds to work together, we're doubling our money. Um, and also, kids have a whole different attitude when they know that they're working cooperatively. So that's something else. Well, I want to thank you for answering my question. I did have one more, but my time is out on libraries. But when we have a hearing about libraries, I'll ask my question then. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember King, Councilmember Reynoso, followed by Councilmember Gibson, and then Lander. Thank you, Chair, and welcome, Chancellor. I wanted to ask a question regarding uh, English language learners, uh, IEPs, and um, uh, special education children. Uh, I asked this question a while back and never really got an answer that I thought was uh, sufficient. I know we get more per pupil funding for students with special needs, uh, but at a certain point a school has so many special needs students um, that it starts, become a, it starts becoming a systematic, uh, a need for systematic change within the building to accommodate the needs of many of these students. I have stu uh, one school that has over 50% of their students are either IEP or ELL, and some of them mixed in that. Uh, and the per pupil funding is not enough, what I don't think is sufficient to deal with the needs of this school, for, the, for this school. Is there ever a point where we can have a conversation about uh, additional funding to schools that have a, an, an, uh, a percentage of the students that are special needs outside of per pupil funding, additional resources? Anything is possible to talk about, but you know, it's really the amount of money and where you prioritize. But I want to answer specifically the overlap, the Venn diagram right. between L's and special ed. Because yes. we really have to, and this has been an agenda that we've been talking about, we have to really de dig deeper and make sure that kids who are labeled both deserve both labels. Because there's still been a lot of labeling of students and we haven't really done a good enough job is it really special ed or is it, you know, that they have some language issues that we need right. to deal with first? So that's right. something we've been talking about. I've certainly been talking with Deputy Chancellor Baez into how we start looking at this in a school by school decision. The other mm -hmm. thing is with special education, we need to really be clearer um, in terms of how do we, I'm hoping that pre-K is going to make a big difference and that we're trying to identify earlier the kids who have certain particularly, you know, speech language delayed issues, and not all special ed kids are in the same category. There is a difference between a child who should be in ICT class uh, versus a child who should be in a class, a NEST program, which is kids with autism. We're now looking at definitions of 12 to 1 to 1 with kids with dyslexia. There's a lot more layers on special ed than even there are in L. So I think it's really doing a deep dive. But in terms of specific schools, we're also looking, just particularly in the high schools, of making sure that no school has a percentage that you're talking about, unless it's, it's his own school and that's what comes in. So we, this year, we actually had principals in the high schools come in one-on-one -on -one 
to say to them, we're looking at your numbers and you have less than 10% special needs kids or else, how do you get your number to a fairer? So we have quadrupled the number of special needs children particularly in uh, many of our high schools and we, are, we had to do it one on one and that's what we're going to do, continue to do. But I think it's also using the right programs um, for these students and, and how do we, and we're looking for, here again, we're looking for technology, assistive technology that makes sense. One of the reasons I went to Chicago, I went to attend the NABE conference and look for materials um, that might be more appropriate to use in New York City. And interestingly enough, one of the things that all the leaders that I met with told me that not enough materials are being written for this particular population. So, so but, but, what, at what time, Chancellor, does it become a problem that needs more than just um, extra programming or some more per pupil funding and it's like a systematic assistance to the school that is providing a, 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 a I, I 50, think over 50 percent and this yeah. is a zone school I just want to make sure yeah, you know. just give me the number Layla. and a lot of this has to do with how the superintendents also identifies certain schools who have more needs and that's that's a conversation I have with superintendents so, all the time so we should I would love to talk to the superintendent Absolutely. and just uh, the burden of having to educate these children um, coming to a school, the per people funding is just not enough. His whole school is, is geared around I, I'll tell you students. what the problem is even more than the money, although I shouldn't say I don't want any money. Uh, we need our schools of education mm -hmm. to graduate teachers who are trained to work with these students. Yeah. And we find that the biggest lack of teachers going forward are teachers who are trained to work with special ed kids, a whole gamut, and teachers who are ready to work with English language learners. I'm meeting today with the deans of education of all the community colleges, and this is one of the things I'm going to be asking them to do, to work with us more intensely in this. So a lot of it is, where are the teachers coming from? One of, and are they well trained, or do we have to retrain them once we get them? So this is, this is part of our conversation. Great. We'd love to sit down and talk about that. I think that would be great. I just want to bring support to the school that I think is, uh, unfor unfortunately, is being unfairly uh, I guess, targeted because of the high needs it has and its low performance. Um, I also want to talk about uh, the MSQI. Thank you so much for coming to one of the debates at uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Tech. I don't know if you stood to see any of the debates, but those kids are pretty impressive. I can't imagine doing anything like they were doing um, at those debates. Uh, it was, it was, they intimidated me. I can only imagine how they feel competing against each other. But it's an extraordinary program that is really using debate uh, to assist children in more comprehensively understanding what they're reading, which is, I think, uh, part of what the Common Core wants to do, and this is actually getting that done. And um, the, the students are articulating it and being able to break that down on, in, while they're debating on the spot, which is remarkable. It's, they're not taking days or weeks to, to comprehend what they're listening or reading. They're kind of doing it on the spot. So I just want to, uh, we were able to fund the MSQI program through the city council. I was, ever one, was wondering if that type of programming or MSQI could ever be something that the Department of Education really looks to, to either match our funding or do something more, I, you know, of course, citywide. Uh, I just think it's so valuable. And we no, talk I, about, you I mentioned M you that, um, MS50, and I just want to say yeah. MS50 is, a, is, my, is like my, I, I love the school, and it has a lot to do with the MSQI programming that's in it. But MSQI has really, um, and again, I've been visiting schools just to see it in practice, but I think it has another value. I am so totally committed to students talking in class and being interactive learners. And that doesn't, it, it, you must do it. I mean, it's not an option. The other thing is I heard the, uh, the keynote speaker who happened to be a former MSQI student, someone who came to this country, I think, as a teenager, learned everything she did in her school, and now I think she had a full scholarship to Dartmouth or one of the Ivy League schools. This is a kind of message we want all of our kids to have. But the other thing is when I was there, all the teams were all over. This is a Saturday morning. They had, many of them had been there the day before practicing, and they were all engaged in learning. What I would love to see, and I feel the same way about the robotics thing that I went to on Saturday, I would love to see a varsity letter t-shirt. The same way that our athletes get varsity letters, I'd like to see a varsity letter for our debate teams, because there were, what, 300 students there at Brooklyn Tech, and they need to get the credit for academic competitions. I'm a big believer that, you know, we need to do a lot of things even playing field, but there is a place for competition, and this is one of the places. So you don't have to sell me on MSQI. I'm thrilled with it. I appreciate 
uh, the initiative that the council has taken on this will take any more money for this particular cause, but it has to be, been, has to be used with fidelity. Here again, in some cases, principals were given this as a gift. I am not a big believer in gifts. I believe you have to work for something you're going to get. So in order for MSQI to work, principal has to designate some teachers who are going to take it on, go for the training, and then implement it with fidelity. One of the schools that is doing it beautifully also is um, MS 111. In, it's a campus, and all the campus schools are doing it in District 11. So there's a lot of examples of where this is done right, but it's where the principals have embraced it, the teachers have gone for training, and the vocabulary development is part of what they do. All right, so, and Chair, I just want to say to the council members that are sitting here on the dais and are just listening, MSQI, amazing program. If you sit on BNT, you'll be hearing me uh, advocate for that as well, alongside restorative justice. So just want to make my pitch, um, and thank you very much. It's a great pitch, and uh, support it. <laughs> <laughs> And I was also at Brooklyn Tech and saw the uh, debate league, um, which was fascinating. Just to follow up a little bit on, on something Council Member um, Reynoso brought up, um, <clears throat> special ed training and um, ELL training. When I was teaching, I think we had six special ed credits that we had to get before we were licensed, only six, which is really two courses. And I don't think we had any requirement for L training. Is that still the case with the state? Pretty much, we're, we're changing that because the other thing here, special ed training, and this is something Deputy Chancellor uh, Raniello and Selmy is doing really well, is different because we now have many more categories. If you're teaching in an ICT class, it's not the same as teaching in a 12 to 1 to 1 or the same as teaching in an S program. All of these require different skill sets. And what we're asking our universities to do, if you're going to be doing special ed programs, distinguish between the three. Because these teachers need to come to the table already ready. I mean, obviously nobody really learns how to teach until you're in a classroom. But we find that we're actually retraining. Um, one of the things we did at the beginning of this year, we went around the city to every first year teacher. We had borough conferences. Uh, Michael and I went to all the boroughs. And one of the biggest issues that came up, which is why we're doing so much intensive training on it now, that we might not have been explicit enough in ICT classrooms, what do, do teach, what do two teachers do if they're in the same room together? Who does what? How do you evaluate two different teachers? So a lot of the training is now going to retrain the people we already have. If you're working with kids with Asperger's and uh, dyslexia, you need a different set of skills than kids, for example, um, if that have behavior issues. So we're, we're looking at the whole uh, map of learning disabilities and then how do we specify the kind of training. This is going to be training that's going to take place all the time. We're doing some training during uh, the next week we have off and during the summer. So our, this is an ongoing process. There's no one answer to this. Thank you. And uh, now we have Councilmember Gibson followed by Councilmember Lander and then Kalos. Thank you very much, Chair Drum. Good morning, Chancellor, to you and your team. Thank you so much for being here for all of your work. Um, just incredible. There is so much information to continuously talk about, but I appreciate your commitment and the numerous visits you make to the Bronx, to District 9. I might as well live there. Yes, and that's okay. That's fine. We want that in our Chancellor. Uh, I chair public safety, and DOE has had a major uh, partnership with the NYPD school safety around school crossing guards. So I certainly thank you for your work. Last year's budget, we uh, allowed funding to hire 80 new school crossing guards. We want to make sure every elementary middle school has a school crossing guard as well as new schools coming down the pipeline so your partnership with school safety with SCA DOT is going to be extremely critical so I thank you for that um, I wanted to quickly talk about a little bit further on restorative justice uh, the school leadership climate team of which DOE is a major part of there are recommendations that will be coming down I wanted to know if you can give us an update that's coming from the working group are there any instances you could provide us on metal detectors and the rotating metal detectors that we're looking at and certainly beyond the initial stage of this working group is this a group that's going to continue uh, further on in the long term uh, thank you councilwoman um so i, I am a co-chair of the leadership team and our last meeting was on monday or i wouldn't say our last meeting for the last right. year we've been working very very uh uh, hard on our recommendations. Um, a quick update on metal detectors and scanning in schools. 
right now we're in the process of developing a policy and protocol for uh, with the NYPD and school safety around um, the data that we're going to look at, the community involvement that's going to be involved, um, but we're still working on it. Um, okay. and we're, it's an analysis both that is data-based but also, uh, you know, principal and community-based to, uh, to assess whether principals want to keep their scanners, remove their okay. scanners, um, or even some principals who have requested scanners. So we are taking a look at all of those three things um, and we should be coming out shortly with um, our protocols. Okay, great. I appreciate that. A lot of work has been put into that, so I really thank you for that. Um, the restorative justice in the 2.4 million that we have currently, 15 schools, um, what has been your feedback on that? Have you seen uh, already any reduction uh, in the number of students that are arrested, suspended, given summons? I know District 9 has had over a 50% reduction, which I'm extremely proud of. And I also want to make sure that's coupled with graduation rates, test scores. So have you seen any correlation between the restorative justice work and how that relates to many of our students in terms of academics? I think I'd have to come back to you on the correlation piece um, only because I haven't looked at the 15 schools in particular and how that has impacted both suspensions, arrests, and summonses, but we'll come back to you on that one. Um, okay. But we, I should say that with the 15 schools, we are learning a lot and we're taking what we've learned to expand for this upcoming fiscal year, which we received additional money from right. in our preliminary budget. Um, to really expand more restorative practices and also have more restorative practices in, in specific districts. Okay. And District 9 is really leading the way on a lot of this work. Absolutely. I, I thank I, you yeah. for that. And I also want to say that, you know, I, one of the things I'm proudest of, bar none, is our superintendents. But there are some superintendents who took on yeoman jobs. Mm -hmm. And District 9, I think, in particular, stands out. She's got the most renewal schools. Um, she is one of the hardest to staff districts and yet she comes with full energy, has proven to be a leader for other superintendents in the Bronx and I think one of the most amazing things that I've seen there is how they have uh, monthly meetings among themselves to talk about where, how they could share resources across, you know, the district lines mm -hmm. and it's been amazing and Letitia in particular has gotten China, literally China, from flea markets so she can serve people Right. Um, as they discuss their way forward. And I think that's one of the things that we really need, again, besides celebrations, collaborations. Mm -hmm. If we have an answer to a problem, it cannot stay within our own districts. And I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of things are working there. Right. Thank you. I was also going to give her a shout out. District oh, 9 yeah. Superintendent Leticia Rosario, amazing. I appreciate her leadership. Um, the one challenge we face in District 9 along with District 23 in Brooklyn is that we unfortunately have the highest distinction of students living in homeless shelters and transitional housing. So your partnership with DHS is critical and what I'd like to know is within this fiscal year are there targeted programs that we're investing in that focuses not only on these families getting into permanent housing, right, which is DHS's responsibility, but from DOE's perspective, what are we doing to drive those numbers down? In my area, I have schools that are at 30%, as high as that. So it's very alarming to me, and I want to make sure the District 9 is given attention that it needs. Yeah, I, I would say that that's one of the numbers we're looking at all the time. And we also looked at what is the number that would generate an extra funding to deal with that. But it's also been a matter of training. Um, and one of the things that I've been working with the superintendents, how do they, say, how do they support principals who are constantly having a transient population? So mm -hmm. we're making um, more of an effort to allow students to stay in the schools they feel comfortable with, even if their shelters change. But this is definitely a very big problem because of the numbers. But I, I think that if anyone can do it, that district is going to be able to do it. Okay, and certainly I pledge to work with you and your Great. team on that focused approach. And thank you for the yellow bus service and the increased bus routes so that many of our students in transition to housing can get to school. So I appreciate that. And thank you very much, Chair Drum. Thank you very much, Councilmember Gibson. And I can't tell you how I was struck by the fact that um, we have changed so much of our emphasis within the council and within the DOE to promoting restorative practices rather than zero tolerance practices. And I have to say it, um, but I look at some of these charter school networks who have been written up in the papers uh, because of their harsh discipline policies on Success Academy, KIPP, um, Coney Island Prep, who use degrading methods in, by which to um, 
force children to conform to their norms. It's such a wonderful thing to hear that our own Department of Education is moving in a different direction than that, and this council is supportive of that. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Council Member Lander, followed by Kalos and Levine. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chancellor. Mr. Chair, I'll just uh, echo that. It happened that uh, my son's uh, intramural championship basketball game uh, this Sunday was at the building that houses um, Cobble Hill Success Academy, and like thinking about what that video is, and um, you know, that made me deeply unhappy. But I think the the point that we're making progress in our schools is really quite significant. Um, and I was also encouraged to hear your response to Councilmember Gibson uh, on the metal detectors, and a little more. That's a little more clarity than we've gotten from NYPD. That what we're going to get is some clarity on how you seek to have them removed. Um, how, if anyone wants to seek to have them added, they could do that, um, and some real clarity on what the data says uh, as well. I mean, I, I think you know that that process for too long has been shrouded in secrecy, and in addition, if you were able to get dem school demographics, it would be shrouded in secrecy with deeply un uh, discomforting racial overlay. So getting that policy on the table so schools can know what they need to do and move forward is really significant. And, and our goal to is to be coming. transparent in as many ways as possible mm -hmm. and also making sure that we don't do something but then we'll backlash on us. So it has to be based on data, which is why we want to be very careful. And not just data, but what are the types of incidences that are happening in certain schools versus others and then making sure that everyone in the building is comfortable going forward mm -hmm. with whatever decision we make so that you don't have one principal talking against another. That's right. Um, a couple just quick thank yous. I was just out at the new building that houses the upper school of PS 130 and MS 839 and a D 75 school and like anyone that needs to see a campus that's working together, go see that place. It is really just uh, inspiring. There's a UPK center there. They're really working together in, in wonderful and, and creative ways. And I also want to appreciate the flexibility that you all showed in allowing MS442 to have some more time before its relocation. We need those new seats in the annex uh, where PS32 is, but of course we want to help make sure both of those schools can succeed and grow. So thank you for doing that. Um, and I was very encouraged by the early data on the diversity admissions pilot to see that the schools were able to hit their targets. I don't want to use the budget hearing to talk more about it. There's a, a lot more conversation to have about those issues of uh, uh, diversity, but maybe we'll find another time to do that. But one of those schools, the Brooklyn Children's School, PS372, I just want to inject into the um, special ed discussion because to my knowledge, they're still the only school that has the model of uh, collaborative team teaching and inclusion across a district school, D15, and where the special ed the students with IEPs are from D75. And I have found that a very encouraging model that is really working. And I just wonder, as we're working with universities and building that program, is that a model that we're looking at growing? It seems to me to be a very effective one. It, it may be expensive, but it sure seems to be succeeding. I, I think we're looking at several different models. Um, there are certain things that Corinne and I have been talking about. That certainly will always be a model, but I think also what are the categories on IEPs that will make this more balanced? Because not all IEPs, when you're blending schools, should be speech delayed issues. They should be a combination. So, but we look at everything that's working, uh, and just so that I know you want to talk about it later, but you should know that one of the ways that we anticipate growing our diversity is we will be putting out shortly our pros um, applications, and we're encouraging principals who have different and unique ideas on how to do diversity to apply for a pros, to become a pro school. A pro school is a school that doesn't have to follow certain rules. The only rule they cannot break is if they have zone students, they must accept their zone students first. But if they have space, they can put forth ways of how to use that space. That's great. And we're hearing as this from the schools that are in yes. doing this work about a desire to have you know, professional development, talk to each other, being able to grow and strengthen that practice. And there's also a growing network of high school students interested in this topic. The Integrate NYC for me is bringing together. At some point, I'd love to introduce no, you no, to and them. I, and They're honestly, very the other thing is we will be people. making one of these schools um, a showcase school so that other schools who want to do this can go visit that school and see how it's done. Uh, certainly, um, Julie Zuckerman has done some of this work. Anna Allenbrook is doing some of the work. 
So highlighting the schools that have done it so other principals who may be thinking about it can go visit it because it's better to see something and see how it's working rather than try to imagine it all on your own. Uh, that's great. Um, I had two topics, but I'm not going to get them both in, so I'll leave school food, breakfast, and lunches to someone else. Councilmember Levin is here. Maybe he'll pick that one up. But I just want to ask about um, uh, college guidance, and uh, we're going to hear today later from some of the uh, people from the Student Success Centers, the College Access uh, Research and Advocacy Program that I think we're hoping maybe we can put more money into and grow those centers. And I just want to know how you see those fitting in with the existing network of college guidance and support um, and what we can do together to make yeah. sure every kid, uh, and especially those I think those working on this together like would be great. One of the things that, again, when I'm talking about campus models, if you have six high schools in a campus, you should have one college office where all of them are working together. Because if you're looking at a, a, a trip, let's say, to a school, you know, you want to go see SUNY, well, if there are three kids in each school who want to go see SUNY, we should be doing that all together. So we're talking, how do you maximize your resources in a building where you could have several guidance counselors actually talking to each other and say, maybe I'll work with the kids who want to go to CUNY schools or SUNY schools or private schools. We need to have a better approach, but I'm certainly interested in expanding them. Um, I just, I think next week we're going to be visiting one of the success centers that I understand is doing some wonderful work. So I'm curious to do more of that, but I do think having shared space in a high school building is another way to go. And, and, I'll and if I just make an addition to that, in our college access for all programs, both in middle school and high school, we are, and our single shepherd program, we are looking at success centers as an element of that. I would just encourage members, it's, a, it's an amazing sort of peer education model, and they'll be here later today. They have a little video, so uh, I hope people can stick around and, and see that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh -huh. And we've been working with them very closely, too. Thank you. I love her. Uh, Councilmember Kalos, followed by Levine, Williams, and Chin. Good morning, Chancellor. Good How morning. How are you doing today? I wanted to just touch base on uh, four different areas, one being uh, UPK, uh, civics, uh, food, as uh, Councilmember Lander already knew, and thank you for giving me the chance to ask the question, though you are ahead of me in line, and just investing in our staff. Uh, with regard to UPK, as of 2014, WNYC reported 2,118 four-year-olds in my district, and in 2014, we got 123 UPK seats. Uh, it's now 2016. We are up to 425 seats. We've quadrupled those numbers, and I believe we have 72 more seats in procurement but that still only gets us to just shy of 500, which is one quarter of the way towards making sure we have universal pre-K for every single child who is four-year-old in the district. And this is not just my district. There are districts all over the city. There's only about one or two or three, I think, districts that actually have more seats or as many seats as are necessary for children, according to WNYC. So what we can do to make sure that we actually get the seats so children aren't traveling for more than an hour from Roosevelt Island to Chinatown and back and have longer commutes than most adults do. Uh, with regard to civics, it's an election year. It's a presidential election year. Would you be willing to work with us to do a pilot with the kids to uh, have them do a mock election in April for president? And then, uh, interestingly enough, it turns out that voting is a hereditary trait and uh, social yeah. science has shown that if parents take their kids to vote, they are more likely to vote themselves. So rolling out vote with kids in November when we will be doing the presidential general election, the kids aren't in school. We could work with the kids and the parents to make sure that the kids get a chance to stop by or even fill out an absentee ballot with their parents. But uh, those two pieces together combined with the Student Voter Registration Day and the Young Adult Voter Registration Act, which would change it from handing it out with diplomas to in class, I think might help us ensure that the 1.1 million kids in our schools right now are in a habit to continue voting when they graduate. On the uh, topic of school food, uh, we have an opportunity to make sure that 1.1 million children don't have to worry about hunger, which would be huge. And with that cost savings that would be generated to the family, those families might have additional income so that they could worry about the rest of the family's hunger. Uh, last year, we gave $6.25 million from the council, but it only ended up costing $3.6 million. It wasn't rolled out as a full rollout to all middle schools, only standalone middle schools. Uh, and so one key piece is, uh, can we please have free universal lunch? I believe advocates are saying that while we would 
have significant, it might have costs that we would be seeing a $20 million reimbursement from the federal government, so it would only cost $3.6 million. Along the same lines, making sure we actually get breakfast for every single one of our kids. And then last but not least, as we're doing the uh, community schools, we can actually qualify for free federal supper, which means we could actually get three square meals a day and the federal government will pay for it and that will bring more money into our local economy. And then just on investing in our schools, uh, last year the council provided half a million dollars for the Executive Leadership Institute. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm curious if you've had a chance to attend Eli as a principal and whether or not it is something that we can continue to invest on. Uh, similarly, I put member item funding and uh, the council provided 9.6 million for teacher's choice so that teachers aren't spending everything out of their pocket and whether or not we can see a baseline or a match from the administration. And then just last but not least, an expansion of positive learning collaborative. I see what he did. You see, this is very something to learn. He asked all his questions at one time, so I have to use his time now to answer them all. <laughs> clever, clever. I have to remember that as a strategy. Um, let me take one at a time. I am totally engaged in civic engagement. I am a total believer that we need to do more because we are not going to flourish as a democracy if kids don't understand how we got here and what we need to do to preserve this democracy. We have a civics curriculum. We have it starting in kindergarten. It is um, totally laid out right through 12th grade. Um, maybe not being taught the way it should be taught, but we have the curriculum and certainly one of the things that we'll be highlighting more as I talk to superintendents. I think also that one of the things I would encourage more city council people to do um, is to engage the communities in um, participatory budgeting. I would love to see civic engagement being done by getting our high school kids to participate in participatory budgeting, really, no, we now. Eleanor have Roosevelt High School in my district, which is one of the only high schools that's actually in my district that serves local constituents, will be having a PV vote site. We have changed the age to 14 just so that uh, they can okay. vote. But we also have something now called Y Plan, which is an app. It's a whole training process, and I actually have sitting in my office um, proposals from high school students based on participatory budgeting and different things about civic engagement. In terms of how do we get kids to vote, we are going to do a campaign for high schools. My concern um, about mock elections this year goes back to bullying a little bit because what I'm hearing from elementary school kids that it's already become a source in some schools, who's your parent going to vote for? And unless this is done right, this could be something else that's going to create more contention. But one of the things I had read years ago, I believe it's Minnesota, one of our top five states with good election results, that they have many election boards right outside the voting booth for kids to go with their parents. And, student, and parents are encouraged to take their children with them to vote so they understand, like you said, that this is a family um, job and that kids get to do that. So I'm all for whatever's going to get us to vote. I think the percentage is embarrassing, and as I said yesterday at the press conference, there are countries that dock people days pay if you don't vote. There are other countries that you vote on Sunday, so there's no excuse, and we need to make voting a part of our everyday life. As far as um, food and middle school, with all the money we spent, we have seen a percentage of about 6% in terms of students eating more than they might have. So this is still something we're looking at closely before we expand it in any way, because our numbers are not reflecting that this has made a major difference. That's not to say for the, the kids that it does make a difference, but I, I think we need further study. And for the UPK? Uh, for the middle school, that's not the age where the bullying for being financially destitute. And it's, for me in high school, the issue was that it's high school and that's where the kids are starting to bully each other over who eats what and whether or not you even have enough money for lunch that day. Uh, so yeah. I think okay. if we rolled out in high school, you would probably see different numbers. And 6% is a big number. Okay. Go ahead. 
we'll continue to evaluate and evaluate high schools as well. Um, on UPK, and I, I know you, you speak to Jeff, Deputy Chancellor Wallach fairly regularly around uh, some of our Roosevelt Island seats. We, we do have an RFP. We are looking at space there, evaluating space. So we'll keep you abreast of anything that we find in through the uh, RFP process. Thank you. Uh, breakfast, sorry. Breakfast in the classroom has, has had a little bit of a rocky start. Um, we're trying to really listen very carefully to individual schools. And one of the things we've been doing is asking schools what some of their issues are. And the issues have been that in some schools, parents really do not want uh, the breakfast in the classroom. They feel that they should have the students should have breakfast before they leave the home. It varies from school to school. It's been a very interesting phenomenon in that there are schools that have um, all kinds of reasons for this. The other thing that we have to make sure, we I think I've eliminated the issue of it's interrupting teaching time. It shouldn't. If you use breakfast in the classroom as a time to teach socialization skills, you know, eating, breaking bread is a social skill. So how do you get that to look like that? In schools that uh, we've received some uh, complaints we've asked principals to take it back to their SLTs, to have the discussions with SLTs how this could be done more smoothly. So this is one that we are rolling out, we're rolling it out slowly. We want to make sure that we answer all the concerns from the field um, so that we can actually do it across the city but in ways that make sense. Eli PLC. What? Uh, executive leadership and oh. uh, Well actually we're working them very closely with them now on our renewal schools. They are supplying for us and doing the training for the, uh, the coaches that are working with our renewal schools. So we have a very good relationship, although I've never been part of it. I've always been a guest speaker, even during my years of retirement. Um, and it's a certainly an organization that I think adds value to the system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Levine, followed by Williams, Chin, and Barron. I'm sorry. I have Levine. No. Okay, Levin. No, it's not no. Levin. Okay. All right, so we'll go to Williams. I'm sorry. Williams, Chin, and Barron. Williams, not here. Well, I guess it's my turn. Okay. <laughs> we'll take. Good morning, Chin, Jess. Chin, Barron, Joyce. Good morning. And uh, thank you for coming to visit my district with the EC1. I think there was a very um, fruitful town hall with lots of questions for you. And hopefully, um, we're working together to get parents more engaged and also help them to make sure that um, the dual language program that's working in that school continue to uh, be a really a great program. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions in terms of the language access. Um, in terms of this year's budget, how much uh, funding is available to hire and train multilingual uh, staff to have material uh, translated for the home? Uh, interpretation and translation service for parents. Um, the other question is that we were very pleased that when DOE announced expansion, you know, of the phone interpretation program for our school, and we were wondering why that was not also implemented for pre-K students who are attending uh, school that the pre-K program run by the CBO. Um, and can we? Uh, make sure that we extend that service um, to be available to parents of pre-K uh, in the CBO programs. Um, the other question that I have is focus on the dual language program. Um, Want to know how many ELL students are enrolled in these dual language programs and also what kind of support that DOE is providing to do teacher recruitment, support for teachers, teacher training, and also really to, to have a pipeline um, that could be the future dual language teacher. I know that we don't have um, that many high school programs right now, but we do have a few. And I'm looking at these students who are in our dual language program in the middle school and high school. They could be our future dual language teacher. Yep, we got to make sure that they, they're interested in doing that. Um, and also supporting schools that are starting dual language program in the elementary school level. Um, I visited one of the kindergarten programs. Just amazing how the kids can 
switch from one to the other, even on basic, you know, number counting or, or basic terminology and learning the culture. So I think this is uh, something that I know that you're very supportive of, and we just want to make sure that we have the support there uh, to keep it going. Well, I think there are several things. In any dual language program, 50% of the students are native speakers. So that's already an L student whose parent is willing to put him in that program. And the other 50%, which is one of our challenges, have to be monolingual English only students. That's the only way these programs work. So we now have parents coming to us in groups who want us to start dual language. And the first thing is, do you, ha do you have enough children who fit both of those categories? You're absolutely right about our challenge is finding teachers. And actually, you and I were in an event, I believe, with the China Institute. And I would love to see things like the China Institute, the Asia Society, even look to see if they could start working with the university to certify teachers. Because that, to me, is where we're going to be getting the teachers of the future. I think also, and I think you and I discussed this, getting parents who may have, and that we actually did the ethnic media, who may have been teachers in their, far, in their country, to get the certification here to become teachers. But also moving more aggressively to find paraprofessionals who speak two languages to be able to become some form of assistant teachers. We're working with the UFT in a special category of this so that they can become um, the next level of dual language teachers. But this continues to be a big challenge. When I went to Chicago, one of the things I was told that there are certain parts of the country that actually have a surplus because a lot of cities are doing away with dual language, so we encourage people, we're going to be doing a national uh, recruiting, this uh, actually in two weeks, we're going to start to get more dual language teachers from other parts of the country to apply to work in New York City, because that is definitely one of our challenges. The future teachers is something I really want to start in our high schools. If we have really good dual language high school students, we want to encourage them, and that's one of the meetings I'm having later today, to take the coursework necessary to become the teachers. And it's also pay forward. If you have been a first generation American and you come into a school, wouldn't you want to give back to your community? So I think there's a lot of ways we can do this, but it's, it's definitely one of our bigger challenges. Just to comment on your um, language access, um, one of the things we announced fairly recently was the position, nine new language access coordinators within our borough field support centers, um, which uh, equates to approximately $675,000. Um, and these folks are going to be incredibly helpful for our borough field support centers, but also for our principals and superintendents in accessing uh, language access uh, documents and interpretation. But it, she means so that program, is that, I mean, that service, is that available to pre-K parents whose kid is attending the program in the CBO? And we, and we are assessing, so we've done, a, we've done a lot of work in increasing interpretation at the BFSCs and in some of our district schools. We are now looking at some of our CBO partners um, and we'll continue to have conversations with you how we improve our interpretation services for our CBO partners. Well, we definitely need to expand that service and make sure that every kid, uh, every parent have that access to the interpretation or the translation because they're just starting out. So we want to make sure that they're on the right track. So hopefully in terms of the budget, make sure that all the kids, whether they attend pre-K in the public school or CBO, get the service for their parents. Thank I you. hear you, and we will evaluate. <coughs> okay, Council Member Barron, followed by Council Member Deutsch and Levin. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. Chancellor, I'm glad we have a chance to talk again, and thank you for the follow-up that I received in regards to a question that I had asked at the PEP regarding uh, lunch in middle schools, because there's going to be a co-location, and my question was, now that this would no longer be a standalone middle school, what would be the impact of the students who had, in fact, been receiving, uh, have been eligible for free lunch, <clears throat> but now perhaps were no longer in a uh, standalone school because there is an attempt to bring in a high school. And it leads me to the question of how many students in middle school grades are in co-located buildings that are not eligible for the free lunch because, in fact, there are other grades in their building? That's not true. No, I, I don't have that exact information. I'll find out. But most middle school 
Standalone middle schools, even if they're in buildings with other schools, get the free lunch. But let me get you exact numbers, okay. and I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. And regarding the CTE program, uh, in my district, there is the FDNY High School, which is uh, on a campus with Thomas, Je with Thomas Jefferson, which, as we have heard, won the city championship this past weekend. But the FDNY is not able to have firefighters who are perhaps retired and are interested to come to teach in the school, they're not able to employ them because of the state regulation. What are we doing so that those experts in the field, in a profession, in a career, who want to come and work in our high schools, in these CTE, CTE schools, can in fact uh, bring their services here? What are we doing in that regard? What I'm going to do after this meeting is over, I'm going to come over and give you a hug. Uh, because what you're asking is what I'm asking, and this is something I need your help in terms of talking to the state. Okay. We have this problem in many of our CTE schools. We have it in our nursing programs. Mm -hmm. We have it in our pharmacy programs. We have it in our automotive programs. This requires a special licensing that only the state can do. Mm -hmm. we have, I have gone to Albany at least three times in the last two months, and this is my major issue. It's my number one issue other than money. Um, and this means that we need, and the new commissioner is very supportive of us getting something done, but if you as a city council were to work with someone on my team to ask for this to be one of the priorities, if we're going to do more work with CTEs, we need to recruit the retired everybody's. Okay. And what happens is they need a supplementary license, mm -hmm. uh, an ancillary license, I believe, that has a special name, and it can only be approved at the state level. So I absolutely agree with you. I want to see this. I want to see iron welders come in and, and volunteer. Yes. We need this in all our CT programs. And also they have access to something that we've been trying to kind of, you know, get in. It's like you have a lot of people who have union cards. So if you have some union people working in a school like Queens Vocational with plumbers and, um, and electricians, which they have great programs, they're much more likely to mentor them and then support them when they apply for it. So yes, we need this, but this is unfortunately out of my hands, but I would love support from the council in moving this forward. Thank you, and I'm sure that the chair would be able to have us to lend our support in that regard. I have a lot of other questions, so I'm going to use a strategy that some of my other colleagues have used. I like to pose a question and get an answer so we can have more of an exchange ongoing, but here are my other three questions. In returns to co in regards to co-locations, my feeling is that as charter schools have been co-located, they've been the proverbial camel's nose getting in the tent, and eventually what happens is that there is a takeover. In terms of buildings that have more than one school in them and have three, four, five, six principals getting principals salaries, regardless of what the number of students are in their school, some perhaps larger than others, what is the impact that we can see in regard to that? And can we continue to justify paying four, five, six principals in a building that was designed for one administration? That's the first question. Secondly, in terms of uh, charter schools over which we as a city, with you being the chancellor, have no jurisdiction, no ability to respond to parents' complaints of things that are happening that they feel are unjust in that school. What is your plan to address that? Uh, thirdly, in terms of um, the homeless students, I've been told that each school should have a poster visible someplace that brings the parents' information about the McKinney-Vento Act. In all of the schools that I've been in, I haven't seen that poster uh, visible so that parents would know that that exists. And finally, in terms of teacher training, I did have a hearing regarding teacher training to look at how effective are the training programs that teachers are going through who eventually wind up in the New York City schools. And there was a lot of information given, a certain set of metrics, uh, which I don't know are a good measure for how effective teachers are that was presented. But what can we do to make sure that schools of teacher preparation, in fact, go beyond just understanding that it's a curriculum of information 
that teachers ought to bring, but certainly another understanding of the sensitivity of the culture, the economic conditions, and the language, which was referred to easily uh, earlier, that is important for teachers to address and embrace as they teach students, especially in New York City school system. Okay, I will do my doctoral dissertation uh, starting right now. Well, let me be clear. One of the things in co-locations, there are all kinds of co-locations, and one of the things we're looking, we already started doing it, is merging and consolidating schools within the same location. If we have seen that there are two schools in a building that don't have a certain number of students or that might work more efficiently if they were one school with one administrator, we started doing that. We did about what, 10 already? We're, we're doing, an, uh, and by the end of this year, we'll probably have done about 25. And that's being done exactly for what you said. We don't need two administrative overheads, but more importantly, we need the students to have more resources. And if you're spending your percentage, because you get your money, as you know, based per student. So instead of having 120 kids, you have 325, mm -hmm. you're going to get more services for the kids. We've already started to do that. The other thing is also, in schools where there are too many co-locations, and it depends really mostly in high schools, mm -hmm. the idea of putting in a building manager that handles the safety issues, the programming issues, any issues that having six different people's opinion on something is going to keep us from getting something done is the way to go. I said that one of the examples is the work we've done in Lehman High School just over the last two months. And we have been doing a lot of this building manager idea to make sure that kids get better services and that it's more coordinated. The other thing that we're doing, particularly when it comes, when there's a charter school in the building, adding them to the mix of the discussion. What do you want to do differently? What do you bring to the table? How do we unify our resources? I will tell you right now that one of the charter schools in one of our public schools is sharing, actually sharing an assistant principal. Um, they decided neither one of them had the money or the resources. They wanted to spend their money on other things. So they decided, it took us a little bit of time to figure out how do we do that in our budget, but I think it makes sense to kind of come together and work together. I think as far as um, teacher professional development, I said it before, I will continue to say it, you really, the best professional development is actually working in a school, and we need to figure out more ways, and we have a few, we're looking to expand internship, apprenticeship programs for teachers, which is different than student teachers. We need to put teachers in the schools where they're more likely to work. Um, we have several pilots this year where we specifically are looking to put them in high need schools so they'll know what it's like to work in those schools. And definitely um, a discussion with universities in terms of what should their programs look like mm -hmm. to fit the needs of today. Um, having some of those conversations over the next two weeks. Uh, I will let you know how it goes. And as far as cultural diversity, this is something that we've been talking to teachers about. It goes back to the, the bullying. It, it, goes, it goes back to everything we are as a city. And I do think there's a lot more discussions on this. Um, and it has to be school specific. Thank you. And just one last point. If we could get the most recent report on spending of charter schools that are co-located so that we can verify that those amounts that are $5,000 or over have been recorded, reported, and that the whole school is getting uh, that same amount of money. I don't think we've gotten that report lately, so I would appreciate getting that. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Councilmember Barron, uh, I had the fortune of um, visiting the vocational high school out in Queens with the Chancellor about a few months ago, and this issue of credentialing people who are experts in the field coming into C TCE schools has been an issue that we've been looking to um, move forward. So we will join in on that with the DOE as we move forward. So now we have um, Councilmember Deutsch, Levin, and then Rosenthal. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, I want to thank you, uh, Chancellor. I I know you were in my district Saturday night. You uh, went to Madison uh, to sing performance. I, I think I just missed you. I missed your dance performance. I, I heard I missed your dance moves. <laughs> <laughs> That's an exaggeration. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I want to bring up a few issues. Number one, I went to visit uh, one of the schools in, in Councilmember Renosi's district uh, where they uh, had the children had debates. 
on certain issues. So one of the things I brought up is to maybe um, have like a certain debates, we talk about bullying, to have debates about the issue of bullying, to listen to what the children, uh, what the ideas are and what they think and what's on their mind when it comes to bullying. Um, and number two is also um, depression. To talk about depression, to have a debate about depression because uh, many children come, you know, they come from different households and different areas and uh, from single, single parents. Uh, and sometimes you have issues in different households, so the kids come in to school, they come to school very depressed at times. So just to get um, what's on their mind, to see what they have to say, and when you have debates on certain issues like this, you could actually have the children uh, bring out these what's on their mind, and, and we're able to work with them um, and better understand uh, what children are thinking, what our, teen what our children are thinking. So that's uh, one thing I want to um, mention. And the second thing is, is that um, when a educator, when a faculty member of a school goes to school and they have to drive around looking for parking and sitting in traffic, I have five children, I know what it is when you leave home and dealing with kids and then you have to go and deal with kids, school children in the class, um, the, the hassle, the aggravation, of looking for parking, um, that alone could affect how a teacher goes into the school and how her, day, or how her or his day may start. Uh, so I wanted to bring up um, if there's any type of feasibility um, through capital money or through an elected official, through my office, through my district, to do some type of faculty parking by um, doing underground parking at the school, at the playground. Uh, area because um, a lot of schools have the playground nearby and it could be done underneath there by excavation underneath and to put some type of parking for faculty members this way teachers could come in they don't have to look for parking and they don't have to be late uh, there's no excuse for being late just because you're looking for parking but just the hassle the aggravation will make their day start off in a better on a better foot so that was that was one that was number two Okay. And number three is the mayor has his plan, the MIH plan, and I would like to see if we have MIS, MIS uh, mandatory inclusionary schools, schooling. And if we could look at some of our schools and maybe increase the heights in areas where there is no residential nearby, where there's a schoolyard, like uh, in my district, I like with Lincoln High School, there's really no residential around. We could increase it by, let's say, one or two floors because um, sometimes I see that children are going into uh, other areas, other schools that are not too close to home. So if we could keep them within their neighborhoods and increase the heights, because I have seen uh, through the Department of Education that when they have the real estate department looking for schools, um, they just grab sometimes anything they can find without outdoor recreational space, like I had in, in my district, uh, several years ago before when I was working for my predecessor there was an Ocean Avenue, Avenue L, where they wanted to build a school but there was no, it was basically like a box with no outdoor recreational area for the kids to go out and play. So when you have existing buildings uh, that have already the outdoor space, we could just increase it by slightly just to have um, children in the, in the areas in the neighborhood able to attend the local schools. And uh, one other thing. Uh, regarding school safety, we have uh, uh, metal detectors, um, we also have uh, school safety officers, but I haven't heard anything mentioned about um, the Argus cameras, which I think the DOE is mandated to have, um, but it doesn't, it's not done, and as well as having security cameras throughout the schools. Um, yeah, fortunately, we had an incident right across from my district. Uh, I was at a meeting with Council Member Germani Williams where there was a dispute outside of a school which, caused, which is continuing to cause tension over there. So having cameras indoor and outdoors to monitor, not to, not to rely on someone's phone camera to take videos, um, but by having security cameras, there are federal and state funding that encourage institutions to have cameras. So there's no reason for a public school not to have cameras. And uh, if we need a waiver from parents because it's a, a public uh, area, then we should have the parents sign. I'm sure nobody will mind. Okay, let me take one at a time. Parking has been an issue as long as I've been in education. And that is even when not everybody 
um, drove to school. And I remember as a teacher, people getting there at 6 o'clock in the morning because first come, first serve, and you got the first spots if you got there. And people literally staying in their cars for an hour until they, they left their cars. So this is not a problem that's easily solved. It is something that we are pri prioritizing, for example, in high need areas so that, you know, certainly a preference to teachers who may be working in renewal schools was one of the things because we need perks to get teachers to go to the, some of these schools. So that's one thing. I hear what you're saying in terms of using available space nearby. We've already started working, Elizabeth Rose started working with parks and recreation to talk about how we might use parks, um, not only for, for our gym times, for other purposes. We started looking also at big fields. I believe it's the Thomas Jefferson field that was only being used exclusively by Thomas Jefferson that now when they're not using it is also being allowed to be used by Spring Creek. It's a school that's right across but was not allowed to use the field. So we're looking at all the resources we have and how we can maximize those resources. I think in terms of depression, this is something actually that I am concerned about because I'm hearing about it younger and younger. And we're also hearing about it as one of the reasons why um, attendance is low in some places. If kids don't have the, the wherewithal to want to get up in the morning, that adds to a lot of other issues. I have the First Lady uh, come speak to us this week. I do something once a month called Carmen's Classroom. I ask visitors to come and talk about things, uh, relevance to them, so my team kind of hears why we're going in certain directions. And she talked about the programs on mental health that we're going to bring to our schools, but particularly with depression, because also for too long in this country, probably everywhere, but I would say in this country, this has been something people don't talk about. Um, it's embarrassing. In certain cultures, I mean, I've talked to parents in my life as a principal and said, don't ever, I'll, I'll talk to, with you about this. I remember having a conversation with, but don't, when my husband comes, don't tell him we we'll discuss this. And I think we need to, and I think her initiative on making this discussion more public, more open, and more honest, I think is very, very important. So we have to start with putting it out there. I would not be a proponent of making this a debate issue because debates have very clear um, techniques they have to follow, they have to be evidence-based, they have to have certain, they get certain points for certain things. But I think how we train guidance counselors to have these conversations in our schools, starting in elementary school. You know, uh, even when I just took on this job, I thought this was something that we'd be doing in high schools. Um, I have a four-year-old grandson, a nine-year-old, 11-year-old. I am learning more about what's relevant today than I ever imagined, because they talk to me more than my daughters ever did. And, and I hear from them what's going on among their peers. So I do think the whole issue of mental health and depression and bullying has to be almost like a, a strategy that we use in our classrooms where kids feel that it's okay to talk about it. And then having conversations with parents. In terms of developers, I think one of the things we need to do is make developers more community-minded and what could they put in their buildings that would help us. We're looking certainly for some of them to do pre-K centers for us because those are not zoned and that they could do it, several of them are doing it already, but how do we make this more of a citywide effort so that uh, we can alleviate space in our schools? I think I, did you want to talk about cameras? Uh, in terms of cameras, I would say it's a cap, oh, I apologize. Uh, it's a capital budget um, allocation. Uh, we don't have outdoor cameras in some of our schools we have indoors. Um, as, as you might know, some of them need to be upgraded because um, not all of them are functional. So we are working that in our, and that's in our capital budget. Indoor. Okay. Thank you very much, Council Member Levin, followed by Rosenthal and then Miller. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, First, I want to start off by thanking you and, uh, and the administration on supporting Breakfast in the Classroom and that rollout. I know that uh, there have been some hiccups. Uh, that's not unusual in terms of uh, what has happened in other big cities, Los Angeles, Chicago, in the last five years. They've both had uh, large-scale rollouts and have had hiccups in the first several months. So I'm not necessarily surprised. I went to one of my CECs, that's one of the more vocal uh, uh, CECs um, around this issue. And one thing that I think is important to note is uh, in one of the schools that expressed concerns about it, um, according to school food staff, 
the number of children eating breakfast in the school has doubled. And that's a success. Um, and so um, just want to thank you for that. And any resource that, uh, that, that we could bring to the table, we're happy to, to work with you guys on. And uh, I'm just thrilled that you guys are doing this. And I think, Steve, one of the things that's important, because I know what district you're talking about, <coughs> is getting the parents from that school to go talk to parents in other schools. Because I mm -hmm. do think it's the parent-to-parent -parent communication, the principal-to-principal -principal yep. communication that will make other people think twice about saying no. And I, I honestly, I talked to a, a superintendent from another district in, in my council district, and uh, they said they haven't had any problems. Yeah. Um, one issue I wanted to bring up that's a totally different issue, and it's actually not even really a DOE budget issue, but I chair the General Welfare Committee. We had our hearing yesterday. Um, this issue around pay parity for, for, the, um, for the early learn teachers in our CBOs, it's, it's, not, it's not really something that is relevant to you guys except that um, they are paid on average $10,000 less than UPK teachers in the DOE setting. So they're paid less than UPK teachers in the CBO setting and less than the UPK teachers in the DOE setting. And what's happening is we're losing zero to three-year-old teachers to the pre-K system, and it's, it's, it's uh, having a, um, a very destabilizing impact on that system. And so I know it's not your agency, but um, it's certainly something to look out for because it's, it's actually at this point a pretty significant problem uh, that needs to be addressed, and it needs to be addressed with, with funds that only OMB can really decide to do. So. Um, would love, love to just uh, uh, have, have your support on that. Um, uh, one thing that uh, is actually an ancillary issue to that is um, when students are moving from a CBO setting in, for pre-K into a DOE setting, the CBOs are they're open till 6 o'clock at night. And uh, when, so when the kids are moving over to um, uh, elementary schools, one thing that it's, it's raised an issue about is after school for elementary schools. And actually, I went out and visited a couple of high need schools, uh, Title I schools in my district, and I asked the principals, hey, you know, what do you guys need? And they said, after school programming. It's, it's so important, um, especially in Title I schools where parents are working late. Um, so I know that's also actually not your, your agency's budget, but certainly something uh, that I would love to continue to look at. And then um, lastly, um, I know this is uh, not the necessarily driven by uh, the, 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 this administration, but in looking at our budget this year and the increases in certain budget lines, what, what jumps out at me is that um, the second greatest increase after general instruction uh, is uh, is charter schools. Charter, the charter school increase this year, just for folks to understand this, is $200 million increase this year to a total of, it's, that's $1.6 billion, $1.67 billion, and that's going to have to go up in the executive budget because that doesn't include newly cited charter schools. And I know that's not this administration, that's due to state law and the state charter cap and, and, uh, and the state citing of uh, or granting of, of charters, but it, this, is, this has a significant impact on our budget. If we're looking at, just in comparison, general instruction, that increase is going up, uh, is $369 million. Charter school increase, this, so that's for all of the rest of the school system. Charter school increase, $200 million increase. That's, that's a greater increase than we're seeing in fringe benefits. It's a greater increase than we're seeing in special education. Um, in fact, the, this year, it was last year was the first year, this year as well, the charter budget is higher than the special ed budget for the rest of the entire system. And I think that we need to kind of have this conversation. It's not so much about how you feel about charters versus you know, whether you're pro-charter, anti-charter. It's the rate of increase is such that uh, it's going to it's going to take on uh, a greater and greater percentage of our education budget, and so it's just something that I it's not a it's not a policy driven by this administration necessarily, but but it's something to to really point out. There's a budgetary impact. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, and um, very good points that you brought up there. Thank you. Council Member um, Rosenthal, followed by Miller. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, and Chancellor, I just want to give you a special shout out. Thank you so much for joining us yesterday at the kickoff for Student Voter Registration Day. I know how passionate you are about getting people to vote, and it's wonderful partnering with you. So thank you for that. I'm going to ask two questions having to do with the DOE's uh, uh, um, contracts budget, uh, with my contracts chair hat on. First, uh, last year the DOE pulled a one point, what was proposed to be a $1.1 billion contract with custom computer specialists and reissued the RFP for far less at $472 million. That's a $627 million uh, value less than the original contract. Please explain what happened to the money from the contract savings. In other words, when you published the adopted budget in FY15, was the contract in there? Was it updated in the November modification? Was it in the February plan, uh, the preliminary budget, and what was in the executive budget? And then separate for expense and capital. Uh, sure. Um, so the, uh, at the time that the $1.2 billion uh, contract estimate was published, uh, the, those funds were not in the capital plan at that level. Um, what were they in for? Uh, they were in for less. I can get you the details. You don't know the number? I, I don't have the number okay. at this time. No. Um, so at that time, uh, subsequent to the posting of the $1.2 billion figure, uh, the department negotiated uh, with the uh, proposed uh, vendor uh, to uh, reduce the uh, amount uh, to the uh, lower 600 odd million dollar number that the panel subsequently uh, voted on. Um, following that, uh, the department decided not to go forward with that contract uh, and did a new RFP uh, which broke the work into smaller pieces uh, and was more closely defined and uh, also uh, Use Mr. Orlando, department I'm really staff. familiar with what the new contract was, and unfortunately, I'm on a clock. I'm sorry. Um, so what is the, I, I guess what I'm surprised about is the, that you don't know what the original number was because it was either, is it in the ballpark of a billion dollars? Is it in the ballpark of 800 million? 600 million, 200 million. Can you give me a ballpark number? I won't hold you to it. I'm on record. It's a draft. Sure. I believe that the baseline uh, capital funding for uh, technology projects like this at that time was in the neighborhood of uh, four to five hundred million dollars. But as I said, I can get you the figure. So it was in the neighborhood of four to five hundred million. And uh, I just want to really be clear. I understand the facts. And then, uh, I forget the date, February 12th, which is probably right after, right before the preliminary budget was um, sent over to the council, you proposed to the PEP, uh, um, at that time, 600 and whatever the number was, 75 million. So when you proposed that, did you accommodate that $200 million increase in the preliminary budget that you sent over to the council, or no? So that funding uh, at that time, uh, we were between the preliminary budget and the mayor's executive budget. So the but expectation, you had to have the known expectation, on February 12th, when you knew it was 675 million that Chancellor Farina and the PEP signed off on, you didn't put those numbers into your uh, projections to OMB for the preliminary budget, which was published a week prior. If that, I don't remember. I mean, it could have been a week after it's published in February. You can uh, just say no, and if that's the answer, that's the answer. But um, at the time, the expectation was that the city's capital plan, uh, subsequently published in the executive budget, uh, subsequent to the vote, would uh, would be increased to accommodate the work that was being contemplated over that uh, period of time. And on the expense side. Uh, Similarly, but as I said, I'd be happy to get you the details. I would like you to please send over to the council 
the exact pages from the preliminary plan and the executive plan, sure. having where the line item or Absolutely. technology is in there sure. for fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 16. Sure. Um, and the year-end adopted budget, I guess, for fiscal 15 sure. that was published in June 2014. I want to track, and I'll explain my question so you don't think I'm just asking for random information. I, of course, want to track that line that I'm going to assume that there's a line in the capital and in the expense budgets that say technology. And I want to see if there's no more detail than that. If there's more detail, great. But if there's not, just what the total is when in the snapshot in June, November, February, and June over a two-year period, so eight numbers. Sure. I'd be happy to. Okay. But actually, no, no it will be 16 numbers because one for expense and one for capital. I just want to be very specific. I understand completely, and we'd be delighted and to get how long do you think it will take to get this information? I don't think it will take long at all. So do you think I can have it tomorrow? Uh, I, I, I will. That was a short turnaround. I, I will try to get to, to you as soon as possible. It may not be tomorrow. Today's Thursday. Student voter registration day is tomorrow, so I'll give you next Wednesday. That sounds good. Second question. Super. In December 2015, the DOE and the FCC settled on the E-rate investigation. This investigation was looking into whether the NYC DOE violated, and of course this was all under the previous administration and had nothing to do with you, and I fully respect that, and re before I even ask the question, respect how you have turned around this picture, Chancellor. Um, anywho. Training. Yes, yes, thank Many you. Many hours of training. Thank you. Um, whether or not the prior DOE violated the competitive bidding rules of the E-rate program. As a result of the settlement, the DOE will pay a $3 million fine and withdraw E-rate funding requests from 2003 to 2013, again, obviously, before this administration. The DOE must also submit a detailed compliance plan with a quarterly reporting, appoint an independent compliance monitor, commission independent annual audits, review policies and procedures to ensure compliance with fair and open competitive bidding processes, and undertake E-rate compliance training, as you mentioned, for DOE uh, employees. My two questions are, what are the budget implications for the fine for complying with the settlement and for not being able to collect the E-rate funding? Press reports put the total cost to the city at $123 million. Do you agree with this figure? And second, how would this affect the schools? Um, are the schools not able currently to get the technology upgrades they need due to the lack of the E-rate uh, reimbursement funds? Thank you. Before I have Ray answer this, I just want to say that we took this very seriously, and honestly, it took hours and hours and weeks and weeks of work, to the point that we had a specific team that did nothing but this and came in on weekends to work on it, and now that we also now have designated people who watch this almost on a daily basis. But in terms of the other specifics, I'll let... Uh, thanks, Carmen. Um, yes, uh, the way th so the way the program works is uh, we pay the vendors, uh, and the vendors uh, receive direct reimbursement from the federal government. So we paid we paid the yes. So I in this case, we paid the vendors in full for that period of time. So the work so the work was done, and the vendors were paid. And so reimbursement that would have gone to them would have come to us, but it didn't for those years under the agreement that we agreed not to pursue is, is how it worked. I'm sorry, in the dollar amount? Uh, in the press, it's reported $123 million. And the schools get their services. Uh, yes, the schools. And the schools continue to get the services. I just want to make that very clear. Yes. 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 Yes, Helen. <laughs> Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, thank you uh, for you and your team being here, uh, Ms. Farina, uh, this afternoon. I want to ask about your um, 
the DOE's contracts, outside contracts, and, and the uh, percentage of the budget that, that, of your budget that it makes up, and talk about some of those individual contracts and how, um, is that, is $13 billion the accurate number? What is that, what is the actual number? Uh, one moment. Ben, you want to help me out here? Sorry about that. Apologize for the delay. So the FY17 contract budget is $5.6 billion, uh, which is $200 million more than in FY16. About half of that is for uh, payments, that about $3.1 billion of that is for payments that we make to non-public schools and to charter schools. So my, my, my next question was, was that an increase from the previous fiscal year? Yes. Obviously the answer is yes. Yes, a $200 um, million dollar increase. In addition, another billion dollars of those contracts are for pupil transportation and busing. Okay. So um, it would not necessarily be specific to the increase in charters, but m more uh, the uh, uh, pupil transportation? Uh, the contract budget, uh, a bunch of things go up in the contract budget, including and, and, charters. And, and has the DOE done anything or is preparing to address that issue to wrap his, kind of wrap his hands around the course of uh, transportation? I know there was some talk last year about doing so, maybe bringing it in to the city and the kind of averting those outside contracts. I mean, on busing specifically, obviously we're always looking for ways to find cost-effective services, but I think one of the things we've increased our bus services, one, for students in temporary housing, um, and so we have seen some increased costs there, but I think it's to the benefit of students. Yeah, yeah, but not that, that so, so significant. I, I think it is something that we're going to wrap up. So, um, and I want to be uh, kind of brief and quick with this. Uh, uh, DOE is not subject to Local Law 63, and in terms of uh, doing internal course analysis to see whether or not it could be done in-house. Um, of these six billion dollars in contracts, how much of this work did, have, have we looked to see if any of this work could be done internally? Or um, is it cost effective to have the work done outsourced? Okay. In terms of the I, I, and I would say we're actually looking at insourcing in a, in a host of areas, including some of it in our division of information and technology. Um, we're looking at insourcing. To the best of our ability, we also we obviously want to build internal capacity where we can do work. Um, sometimes we have to contract out because um, we have to be honest with ourselves that some folks are doing a, a, you know, better work than we are, especially with some of our community-based organizations um, and some of our professional development. So is there actual document on this analysis as to whether or not it was cost effective and the best thing to do in the interest of um, the city of New York to contract the work out or is just we got to take it, Are you looking at something specific or I just want to make sure that I No, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that it, it has been the culture in the past that that um, things got jobs got contracted out that some of these uh, services were contracted out and I think that um, what we strive to do is, is be more efficient mm -hmm. and where possible that we can do the work here, that we at least take a look at it and, and ensure that as in Local Law 63, that we look and make sure that it cannot be done more cost effectively in here before we outsource the work. Is such a policy in place in the DOE? So, so Chancellor, let me just also say, some of the contract, uh, contracting out is for special ed services, am I right? Yes. Uh, how much of the, how much of, how much are we spending on that? On the, if we, if so, in, I only have the number for the, the charters and the publics, the non-publics together, which is uh, 3.1. Uh, but it's about, about half and half um, for special ed services. And those are special ed but services that those are, are not, those, are those not are available directly to schools. Yeah, that special, are not available that we can't provide. We can't our provide own, it. Yes, and we contract them yeah. out. And uh, I mean, I guess what I'd say is of the 5.6 billion dollars that our contract budget includes, really only 1.2 billion is for stuff that we haven't talked about, which is non-public school charter, pupil transportation, and UPK for NYSEEKs. 
So I know the number looks really big, 5.6. We look like a huge amount of the contract budget. But if you lay aside those four things, uh, you're left with more like a billion two. And ultimately, <coughs> as uh, the chief operating officer just pointed out, we are looking to insource some IT consultants um, into permanent employees. Um, what we what we are uh, a lot of the contracts that we have that are very small are done by principals at schools, um, and we, uh, we need to be careful as we think about uh, contracting, procurement, and reporting um, that we don't overly burden principals. Um, so uh, we'd be happy to continue to have this conversation with you, uh, but we need to be careful. We're a little protective on our end of our principles. So um, of the 5,600 contracts, how many uh, of the contracts were issued to MWBEs? Jeez. Uh, One second. Uh, I w uh, Okay, 14.4% uh, last year in aggregate value. So, and who oversees the MWBE program? Uh, the the chief operating officer and I do. I apologize. Yes. Okay. We are. This is actually a huge priority for us um, yeah. in increasing the number of MWBE contracts that we have yeah. um, and expanding our outreach and also expanding, well, having communications across all divisions about the importance of MWBEs, especially when seeking contracting. So this is a huge priority for, for our administration. So we can look forward to a correspondence about what you're doing and how we can collaborate and partner? Yes, we just actually had a meeting yesterday with our diversity council to talk about our uh, improvements in MWBE, so happy to chat with you about that. Okay, thank you. And, and Chancellor, I'd like to double back on our, uh, some, some conversation about the community renewals and, and, and specifically the one in my district and, and how we could further partner, but we can along the line. Thank you so much for coming. So for Mr. Thank Orlando, you. let me just follow up. The 14 percent that you're quoting for uh, MW dollars, not a, not number of con dollars in, in right. dollars, not not in right, and contracts. and that's an expense, or does that also include school construction authority? It does it does not include the it's expense. separate it's separate. So there's a separate number for school construction authority as yep. well, and um, we may have gotten to that in the in the capital budget hearing, but we'll follow up with you on that as well. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a couple of uh, lightning round questions, and uh, hopefully move on. Uh, I bring up it every year, and, uh, but it's junior ROTC. So uh, can you tell us how much you spend on junior ROTC? Not very much. I have no idea. I have no idea. I actually, I'm not sure if we have this right now, um, and we can get back to you Absolutely. as soon as this ends. Oh, my, I think it's about 1.5 million, somewhere in that area. Yeah. But my concern really, um, my immediate concern is that the DOE does have a policy against using facsimile guns in the school system, and they continue to carry those guns. I'm asking again if there's anything we can do to minimally get the guns out and we can have a discussion about the other issues moving forward. It, um, it just seems to violate that policy and sends a mixed message, Chancellor. Happy to have that discussion. Okay, good. We will have that discussion. Summer in the city. Um, what is anticipated cost of summer in the city program for fiscal 2017? Mm -hmm. And actually, I haven't heard too much about it. Can you just give me a description about what, what that looks like? Well, I think the major difference for summer in the city is that it will be a combination of mandated and non-mandated students. I mean, I just got thanks for parents yesterday that it will not be a stim stigma. Um, it's also going to be running four days longer than it's run in the past. It's going to have an additional three days for teacher professional development. It's also going to include second graders in greater numbers than we have in the past. If our goal is to have all second graders reading on grade level, it's important to embed them in our summer in the city. The second grade is going to be very heavily STEM focused, so they won't be doing the same things they do during the school year. And also, there's going to be a planned units of curriculum study. So it's not about ditto sheets and workbooks and more of what they do during the school year, 
but there's going to be a curriculum tied into social studies and science, which will be much more engaging. And we're working with also um, cultural institutions to provide some free services to families to go together during the summer to the institutions who are giving us free admission. So there's a combination of many things that are happening um, during summer in the city. In the high schools, and this is a K to eight, I mean second grade to eighth grade initiative, uh, we're also in the high schools doing a lot of very focused um, credit recovery that's done in a very systemic way so that it, the rules apply to everybody and also making sure that it helps move our graduation rate, but in a way that also makes them successful when they get to college. So it's different in the sense of the curriculum, the teachers who will be trained, and the amount of hours they will be served kids. And how will those schools be selected, and how many schools do you estimate it to be? Well, we're, op we're not opening every school, obviously, because of, you know, cost factors. So we anticipate that most sites and the schools already know if they've been selected will house anywhere from two to three schools in a, in a single building. We're also encouraging elementary and middle schools to share a building so we can do more mentoring between the middle school kids and the elementary school kids. We feel if they work together, it'll make summer in the city a lot more exciting. We're also looking for our renewal schools to continue to work to some degree with their CBO partners over the summer. So there's a lot of emphasis, a lot of professional development taking place. Um, like I said, the, the week that we're off, a lot of teachers are coming to um, make sure that they have the skills they need for this. So, so I'm very excited because I do think having a set curriculum that's different than what we've done in the past will make this much more consistent citywide. And when will those students be notified that they're eligible for the program? Well, I would think to a large degree, most parents should know already because it's been ongoing conversation. Parent-teacher conferences are actually this week and next week. Uh, and this is a good time to bring that information to the students so they have plenty of time. We also want all principals already received. There's summer in the city guidelines. They know which schools are going to be open, which schools they're partnering with. And our hope is to have given everyone enough lead time so that parents whose students are invited will accept the invitation and not decide to go on vacation somewhere. Okay. Uh, parental engagement. Can you explain to us a little bit further the DOE's vision for parental engagement and um, how parental engagement fits, fits into the structure of superintendents? Well, I have to say that superintendents working both independently and with us, there are two family or parent liaisons in every superintendency, and their role is to work with PTAs. I'm, I meet with CPAC once a month. I do the CEC town hall meetings. All superintendents attend these meetings. The uh, CECs, the superintendent always sits at the meeting town hall. Uh, last night, for example, I was in District 21, and the four major takeaways for me are follow-ups with the superintendent to have another meeting with the CECs. I'm, going, I'm doing a CEC on Monday, a town hall meeting on a specific issue, where I'll meet with the parents one hour before the other meeting. So there's a lot of family engagement. Um, Yolanda Torres has been going around the city and meeting with different um, parents groups to see what they want more of. It's been much more customized than in the past. Uh, like I said, she just started a grandparents advisory group because we found that was the need. We had our first meeting at Bank Street Bookstore several months ago. The, 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 atten the, the increase in parent engagement in the city has been documented by an outside agency, and it's up, I believe, at 58 percent compared to 30-something in the past. We also are hearing from principals that parents coming to either PTA meetings or workshops, we've asked principals to document with their superintendents the amount of workshops they're doing per month on specific issues. And certainly, you know, how to read your IEP, how to help your child learn English at home. Whatever the school needs, it's really done more, much more specifically that way. And through our community partners, we're also asking them to provide workshops. I mean, one of the things that parents, we've increased the number of parents Workshops, the largest single request from parents has been cooking classes, and uh, we've always done GED. I just had a request from a principal. She has 20 parents. Can we do GED for Haitian Creole parents? Um, so it really comes as a you know, request from the community, and then we try to fill the request. What, what, what funding, how much funding is being invested in parental engagement? I don't have that. 
I can get that information. I don't have the trouble. Sure. Uh, there's a significant amount of money that 1% uh, uh, of Title I funds need to be directed to parental engagement uh, itself. That it alone is one? about $6 million. There's uh, almost all of How much? Uh, $6 million. And that's in schools itself, independent of anything else that's going on. There's parental engagement activities. In addition, FACE. Uh, FACE's budget has uh, over a million and a half dollars in it for parental engagement activities, which involve all kinds of central planning. Uh, there are the budgets for the CECs and the CPACs. It's probably tens of millions of dollars being spent. And the other thing is, you know, we are working with learning leaders. We're doing a lot of, like I said, specific workshops in different places. I meet with the CEC presidents. We changed the rules in last year. I meet with them on Saturdays so they have more time, and also with the CEC presidents. Um, I've been bringing with me the times that we meet once a month, month on a Saturday, different members of my staff. So they just had Josh Wallach speak to them, they had, you know, Corinne Re and Selmy Rello speak to them. So we're trying to be open, but to the degree that they want specific topics, because not all parents are the same citywide. Okay. Uh, in the fiscal year 2016, adopt the budget. Uh, 30 additional IEP screening teams were included. We had thought we would be hiring 50 with that money. Um, was there a reason why we only have 30 rather than 50 uh, teams? I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. I don't know the answer. I know that we have been working to increase um, that support, but we'll get back to you on the specifics as to. If, I'm sorry. We'll get back to you on the specifics whether what happened between the 30 to the 50, but we'll get okay. back to you today. And that was the 12.5 million that was put into the budget, right? That, that for that last year. Okay. Um, universal Pre-K. Um, can you provide us with a list of the number of students enrolled in UPK in DOE buildings, early childhood centers, standalone UPK centers administered that. by the DOE and charter schools? Do you have rough numbers in terms of the yes. number of students enrolled? Because yes. one of the things in the, um, the reports that we've been getting, there was a little bit of a discrepancy. I think that um, in your report, you, in your testimony today, you said 68,500. Total. But we right. have, we have 71,300. That was last year. This is this year. These okay. are the registered ones for September. Go ahead. I'm going to actually ask my, my, my colleague, Jessica Pabone, who's in our early childhood team, to, to help us on these answers. So that's a little bit of a decrease in the number of students. Well, there are just so many four-year-olds every given year. It changes. I think, thank you, Chancellor. Um, I think the number that uh, the council member is referencing. I'm sorry, can you just state who you are? I'm sorry. I'm Jessica Pavone. I'm the Deputy Chief of Operations for Early Childhood Division in DOE. And I think the number that you're referencing, council member, includes both half day students as well as full day students. I see. Okay. All right. And um, I think we'll make this the last one. And uh, how many uh, teachers uh, need to be added in order to reduce class size? levels to, uh, to those specified in the city's state approved contract for excellence class size reduction plan, uh, which is 20 in grades K to 3, 23 and 4 to 8, and 25 and 9 to 12. And what would be the cost for adding those teachers? We, we can calculate this right now, but if you want to have a separate discussion on this, I'll be happy to discuss it with you. This is more complicated than just numbers. Uh, it has to do with space and any number of other things. So let's take this one and then we'll come back and share with everyone. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Madam Chancellor. We really appreciate you coming in and spending so much time with us. Also to your assistants, Sir Ursula and Ray, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to now move into the public. Uh, and our first uh, witness will be Michael Mulgrew and Cassie Prue from the United Federation of Teachers.
Thank you very much, and uh, as is the policy of uh, this committee, I do swear everybody in, so I'm going to ask if you'd raise your right hand, and uh, Cassie as well. Uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Thank you. And uh, would you identify yourselves for the record? Uh, Michael Mulgrew, President of the United Federation of Teachers. Cassie Pru. Put the mic on, Cassie. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Councilman. Cassie Pru, Assistant to the President, United Federation of Teachers. Okay, thank you. And uh, President Mulgrew. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Drum. I have submitted my testimony, and I will not read it. I will just testify as I always do. Uh, first, I want to thank. Um, I want to thank you as the chair of the Education Council. I would also like to thank uh, Chair of Finance, Councilmember Ferreres, as well as Speaker Viverito for your partnership and your, um, your care at all times on behalf of the school children and the schools of New York City. Um, it is a, a nice moment in terms of the fact that we have finally, after years of very, very difficult work, we are seeing um, that New York City is being recognized for having really great teachers in the work that we're doing in the largest, most diverse, most challenging school district in the United States. And it is very nice that when we look at all, all of the different data that is produced statewide, that New York City schools are growing at a faster rate than any other schools. And that is clearly part of a lot of people's hard work, but also the partnership that we've had here with you, the Council of New York City. So in Albany right now, we are once again spearheading a major lobbying effort to first and foremost about the funding. We have made it very clear uh, as there is a debate in Albany about a gap elimination program versus CFE. As we know, as the largest, most diverse, most challenging school district in the United States, uh, it is time for Albany to pay up its CFE commitment. We are very hopeful at this point and the in the process at this point in time that there seems to be a recognition that this money needs to be paid and we do not need it paid in dribs and drabs anymore. The intention of the money from the beginning was that, so that we could have systematic change inside of our school system by large, large amounts of funding being brought to us at, at, in certain periods of time and to cement that into place. I heard you speak before about something that is continually very troubling to us, the issue of class size. So we would like and we, to have your continued support and your lobbying efforts also in Albany as we move forward with this process. In terms of class size itself, this is something that we need to get done. We always hear how it is a complicated process about the need for space, but when you hear this for 15 years, you start to say, well, where, the, where is the plan? What is going on? Why do we continue to have a plan on space utilization and the creation of school seats? We applaud this administration's uh, work this year in terms of a much more rigorous plan, but I think it's time for us as a city to come up with a whole new process of how we forecast and make sure that we are giving each and every community the ability to have the class sizes they deserve. So as we move forward, we know that an asset we always have here is the Teacher's Choice program that City Council has funded. Teachers in New York City in our latest surveys are now spending between $500 and $1,000 each out of their own pockets on behalf of the children of New York City. I know no other profession that has to do this, but I also know the teachers will always do this. And it is a wonderful thing that the City Council of New York City recognizes this and helps uh, them on their behalf. And we are asking for a $20 million uh, funding allocation for the Teacher's Choice Program. Community learning schools are a wonderful topic right now. New York City has embraced it. The state has embraced it. The President of the United States has embraced it. The thing is, we embraced it five years ago, way before anybody else. And the only reason we were able to start that program here in New York City was because of our partnership with City Council. It was your funding and the, the dues money of the teachers and educators of New York City that was paying for the initial community learning schools of New York City. And we did that on purpose, and we did it because we wanted to sh find out exactly what the proper, in the proper process as well as 
it can't just be about flying in with a bunch of services. There has to be engagement of the parents and the community to actually get the efficiencies that we want if we're going to give these schools the services they so badly need. We are now up to 26 schools. We are, can, can report that they are all doing very well, much better than they have in the past. But we think it's important for us to continue this program because we use what we find to guide us in the work, in our influence, in advocacy, in all levels of government as we move this forward. So we now hear a lot about student discipline. It is a hot topic at this moment, and I'm very happy that it is. The zero tolerance program that was adopted years ago is something we never supported. It should not have been supported. Anyone who's in a classroom knows if you try to stop every time a child is doing something they should be corrected upon, you would never be able to teach. And it was going to have disastrous results. But we also know that there has to be a team approach in every school level. A positive Learning Collaborative, which is another program which now we have started two years ago. We are funding 15 schools. It is being completely funded by the dues money of the United Federation of Teachers. What we have found is there has to be a training on all the different approaches and let a school decide what approach will work best for it. We are very happy that we are training staffs in restorative justice, on positive behavior intervention strategies, on crisis management of students. But it is that team approach that we have seen the great results come from. When you go and visit these schools, and I will put an offer before you to go and visit any of these schools, you, what you will hear from them is it isn't any individual program that has helped us. It is the fact that we now are in discussions and working as a team from the security guard at the front door to the to people serving food inside of the cafeteria to the administration to everyone in the school understands that this is a team approach about forming a positive uh, culture inside of a building and a respectful culture inside of the building. So now as we want to move this program out, because we now have direct evidence. These schools have dropped suspensions dramatically in independent surveys of both teachers, parents, and students. They have all said the schools are in a much better place than they were before these programs were brought forth. So we want to move forward with these programs. We are asking for a $1.5 million allocation from City Council. This is hard work, but it's the work that's going to make a difference. And it's but we also know that we need to add an additional piece. Our program was designed around trying to in, um, enhance the behavior of the largest number of students in the building. Uh, but we knew there would be problems in the end, in which these schools have now told us there are. There are students who need much more of an in-depth clinical intervention. And we need to start supplying schools with the funding to do that work. Because as they have said, over 90% of the schools, 90% of the student population is much better, but there are certain students that this is more about a clinical intervention. We, they don't want to suspend that child, but right now a teacher's hands are tied, a school's hands are tied. The only way to get that intervention is through a suspension process, and that's just wrong. It should not be happening. The schools should have the ability to have that much deeper clinical intervention, should be part of a school, if it is identified as a need. And it shouldn't be that a teacher and a family has to go through this legal process in order to get that uh, child the support and the services that they need. And that's why we're asking to expand the number of schools doing this as well as add this new component into it. We are also asking City Council to partner with us in support of different initiatives that we currently have in Albany and as well as helping us expand them by doing their own research in terms of the schools, which I know so many of you have great relationships with. Teacher Centers has basically, through what I call uh, the bad times or the lack of no professional development of support, were the only things that were being done to help teachers across this city. It is a statewide program. Uh, but the problem and the issue that we're having is that the statewide funding will only co uh, cover a certain portion of the teacher center's work. 
We want to expand this work in New York City. We would like you to partner if you want to partner with individual schools so you can help them with their funding so they can have a teacher center. Almost every school I visit that doesn't have a teacher center, the principal always asks me, can you help me get a teacher center? And I will direct them to city council at this point. So this is a wonderful piece. We would also like you to um, survey your schools in terms of needs for any what we call applied learning, career and technical education settings. That goes from basic ro uh, robotics to Lego uh, leagues to career and tech ed at the high school level. These programs are growing in New York City. As they grow, they're going to need more uh, support. And we're hoping that the work we're doing in Washington, D.C. right now, we are actually close to uh, trying to get, and we believe we can get, what is called the Perkins Act reauthorized in D.C. It will probably be the last act done before D.C. stops functioning, if you can believe it's functioning. Um, and then at the state level, this is the first time we have additional funding in the state budget for career and technical education specifically. But as we can get those things done, it really comes down to an individual school if it wants to move forward with help of their local council member. And last but not least, we would like your support in the enrollment gap legislation that we have right now in Albany so that all schools, and I'm specifically talking about charter schools, serve all children in our uh, school system. It is very clear that we believe that every school in New York City that receives public tax dollars should serve all of the children in New York City. And that is the end of my testimony. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for not reading it, but delivering it um, uh, yourself there. I, I want to point out to you um, in the opening, um, I also applauded uh, the gains that the city schools have made uh, over the last few years and um, actually saw it myself even before the IBO report where our students are essentially doing just as good as the students around the rest of the state and may in fact be doing better when you add in the considerations for poverty and discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that's a point that we really need to highlight in terms of our public schools and to congratulate them and to continue to build on them. And I think too often that does not happen. And people look at our public school system with a negative eye. And so that's why I was really glad to see that IBO report come yeah. out. It really just highlighted to me, I think, uh, the positive gains that our school system is making. As well as so many of our schools, a much larger percentage of our schools moved up in their categories in terms of state designations than anywhere else in the state. We have absolutely been doing fantastic work. Uh, thank you. And um, I know how important that is also to teach them morale, mm -hmm. to say to our teachers that they're doing a good job and that their work is appreciated, having been a teacher for 25 years. Much work remains to be done, however, yep. and I'm glad to hear your emphasis on CFE and, it's, and the commitment to CFE. Um, I believe that uh, the governor is talking in his budget about putting in $1, uh, $1 billion, if I'm not mistaken, and I think the two houses came up with um, uh, allocations of 1.4 yep. and 1.7, if I'm not mistaken. It still doesn't meet the need that the chancellor is talking about, which I think she said was $2 billion for our city school system. How do you feel about that, and uh, where are we going with that? Well, for, when you hear numbers like that out of Albany, first you have to see what is in foundation aid, because foundation aid is basically uh, the money that we're talking about. Uh, when it's not in foundation aid, it actually disproportionately hurts New York City. So right now the fight is over the, uh, the, the percentage of money that's going to be in foundation aid. CFE specifically talked about things that the school system needed to do. If we are able to ascertain a, a large chunk of CFE, my question to the Department of Ed would be, what are you going to use it for? Mm -hmm. Because there is a plan that's supposed to be followed. And that is the plan we want followed. The major portion of that plan is the reduction of class size. Now, we always hear, well, that's much more complicated. Where are the classes? There are class sizes that can be reduced in New York City right now. We know we also need to hire, we have a huge shortage in English language learner teacher, ESL teachers. Uh, we need to be able to hire them, recruit them, and if we cannot do that, we have to train our current teachers on how to do that. That is the work that CFE was supposed to be uh, funding. 
So when they say they need more from Albany, even though we work very well with this administration, it's, the question to me always is, what are you using it for? Mm -hmm. We don't need any more. As far as I'm concerned, any dollar we fight for in Albany is supposed to go to a school. We want the money in the school. And that's always going to be a, a, a point of uh, friction. Because as far as I'm concerned, we get the money for the children and the teachers who work inside of the schools. We know we need an administration of above to run the school system, but I would like that. It's never going to be lean enough for me. Because I always believe that in the end, the best decision and the best use of financing is at the school level. So uh, having been a former teacher as well, I know that there were times that UFT delegate assemblies, for example, where teachers were willing to even sometimes although, of course, we want well-paid teachers. But I would say that um, reduction in class size was right up there yep. with provision of good wages. That's how important it is to the educational process. And I think that um, one of the last questions I did ask the chancellor today was about uh, the class sizes and, and how funding would impact that. And, and you're right. They did say it's confusing and we don't know. Um, that how seems do we to go from every administration. But how do we make sure that that money goes directly to reduction of class size? Look, it has to be the priority and that would, I would look to city council to help to make sure that money is actually going towards class size. Um, setting targets and hoping it happens is not the way this is going to happen. I applaud that they're creating more school seats that we need. But the whole process of where to allocate school seats and how, we're con and, and how we develop uh, the funding for the capital plan, as we know, mm -hmm. needs to be revamped. And this is not this administration or the previous administration. This has never worked in New York City. Mm -hmm. Mo you know, a lot of the times we can be put it on the table. Why was the school built there? It was political. It had nothing to do with whether they need the seats half the time. So we need to come up with a process that ensures every community that they're getting their seats. And population shifts inside of our school inside of our city all the time. There are certain areas where we have school-aged children, the population is going down. In other areas where it's going up dramatically and where they're completely uh, woefully unprepared to deal with that shift in the population. So it can't, the answer can't always be it's complicated. We get that already. What's the plan? And I know that city council, us, and a lot of other folks are willing to roll up our sleeves and say this is the plan, okay? instead of it's complicated. So I think in the last capital report, I know there's not a capital hearing, but we had one last week, uh, the DOE or the SCA was reporting that they uh, now, which is by, way, by the way an increase in the number of seats needed. It's, a, it's the first real increase we've had in a very long time. We're still going to be about 44,000 seats short. Mm -hmm. And when I asked the uh, SCA how much that would cost, they said it would cost about $4 billion. Now, I want to give the mayor some, some you know, um, recognition that he did put an extra $868 million in for additional seats, but we still have a great need ahead of us in order to really reduce that. We that have number. to catch up because for years what we were doing, we were leasing space and not actually creating permanent seats. That was a decision by a previous administration that it was much easier just to lease space instead of actually creating seats on behalf uh, that the community itself would always have. So we're in a catch-up mode. What they did this year is the first time since I've been president where you see an actual real significant increase, but we are way behind. But that does not mean we should not be lowering class size. Mm -hmm. There's other ways. There are places in this city where there is space to lower class size. Um, mandating the use of funds to specifically mandate class size, it should not, you know, this, this uh, they get the, the, the principal decides. We know there's a difference between 20 and 25 children in a class. I don't have to explain it to you. When I had 28 or 30 kids in my class versus I had 22, I was a better teacher for the 22 than I was with the 28. It's just common sense. Absolutely. You can get more done. Uh, just in the terms of the question about teacher's choice, um, what do you estimate teachers spend per year out of their own pocket for supplies? It, 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 it's solid now that it's a minimum of five, but most, it, but the average is somewhere between 500 and 1,000, but you know there's some that skew it way off, uh, way above 1,000. But it's a minimum of $500 per teacher at this point from all the surveys that we have done. Um, 
it's always been a struggle. Um, but the teachers uh, versus I didn't get the supplies I need to teach the unit I'm starting on Monday doesn't mean I'm not going to start teaching the unit on Monday. It means I'm going to go out this weekend and buy all the supplies to teach the unit. And that's literally the choice they're faced with. And they go out and they do it. And they've always done it. And I just think it's a, a, a great partnership and recognition on behalf of City Council that they recognize what the teachers do above and beyond. What we're asking for does not, will never compensate them for everything that they do, but it is a recognition that people understand that they do go above and beyond. So the historic high in that was about 20 million, and you're requesting that again this year? Yes. Yes. And that, well, last year we gave them about 10. Uh, and that we gave them about $125 each in, in their pocket, which really doesn't really put much of a dent, a little bit of a dent in, in terms of what their expenditures are. Correct. So we need, to, we need to work on that together. Community learning schools. I believe the governor put in $100 million. Advocates have spoken to me about needing $500 million. Are we going to see any other commitment from the state in terms of community uh, learning schools? Uh, it's, it would be my opinion at this point that you will see the state um, uh, funding, what that final level will be, I am not sure. It should be significant. The issue that I am talking about are the community learning schools that we run at the United Federation of Teachers. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that we need, Council Member Drum, is for someone to say, here's, everybody likes this community learning school concept and here's all the money. We need to make sure that there's a, there's a process that engages the community. It's not about, here's a check, go get services. It's supposed to be about an engagement process with the teachers, with the administration, and truly with not just the parents, with the community. We literally do a five-month process, starting with the teachers and the parents, working with administration, then going out and identifying all the stakeholders in the community, finding out what resources are currently existing that they've never connected together, do a needs analysis after that, and then start bringing uh, services into the school building. That's a five-month process of a true engagement and needs assessment, not here we are with a check, go buy a service. It's not just, it's not just medical and mental health. It goes much further than that. We have hundreds of families now who are coming in for all sorts of financial need services that has nothing to do with the school. It's not about, quote, education, but it's a service to the community. We do believe that the more you have the community inside of the school building, the stronger it is and the stronger their relationship is with it. So at first it was about making sure we had a health clinic. Then it was uh, bringing in food services. Then it became financial services. Then it became setting up a tutoring program, using retired teachers to come in and set up tutoring time. And the amount of services, I was at a school where the American uh, Ballet uh, Theater is doing a complete program. You would think that you would see, go there and see them doing ballet. They're not. They do ballet sometime. Half the time they're doing uh, English language arts through the ballet service. That is the smart way to do it. So I am very optimistic about everyone talking about it, but I want to ensure that there will be a correct process and that tr a, a true partnership of the community is involved at that school. So in your model, I believe one of the things that I saw at this uh, visit that I made to PS1 last, uh, last week mm -hmm. is that a coordinator is hired for the school to coordinate the services yeah. And we, then bring them in, and that's part of that six-month process? Well, what we do is we have a team that goes in for the process, and as we're learning the school community, we start looking for a resource coordinator who will be a good match with that community. Sometimes we find them in the community. Sometimes we bring them from outside if they have the right background in terms of what the school needs. Some schools need a lot of mental health services. So that means we want a coordinator who has a very deep knowledge of the mental health service providers of New York City and how do you get them into the building. That coordinator we think is the key to the entire process. Um, you can't leave it up to the school and the principal or a teacher to deal with coordinating all these services and finding them. That coordinator run, 
conveys all information that the school needs back to us at the UFT, to our community learning school um, program, and then we go out and find the services for them. If they don't have them available, we literally go out, find the services, and bring them in. That's why so many schools apply to us, because we have a whole cadre of service providers. Uh, you know, like Food Bank of New York is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, should be given awards all the time because no matter how many schools we ask them to serve, I always think they're going to run out of food. They keep finding it, you know, besides running cook shop. And when we said, when we just by chance they heard in a meeting we needed a program because we had so many families in financial distress and we didn't need, you know, the standard before was, oh, we'll help parents with financial literacy. We found that that wasn't helpful in a lot of schools. They needed a program to get families in financial distress to financial stability. And they actually went out, engaged in uh, people who did this work, and Food Bank of New York City is running that program for families. So we've been able to do so much of that, but the resource coordinator is key. About a month ago, we did a hearing here on homelessness, and your vice president, Karen Alford, came, mm -hmm. gave testimony along with a principal from one of the schools that's involved in the community learning project. And they talked about buying a washer, washing machine, and a dryer yeah. for the school. I mean, that to me was just incredible to hear that that's the type of need some of these schools have because she had a very high population of yeah. homeless students that came to school who didn't have the ability to wash their own clothing, and that's what they would do in that school. Yep. And that's, you, you can't get that by people parachuting in from above saying, we're here to help or we're here to save you. There's people at the schools and in the communities who can do this work. They've just never given the, been given the proper support or opportunity, and they know what's best. As long as you, it's my belief, and I've seen it over and over again, if you give people the support and opportunity, they will take care of the children of their community. So last year we put $475,000 into the UFT uh, community learning schools. Mm -hmm. This year you're asking for $1.5 million. Correct. What would that increase get, the, uh, get us? Well, now what we're, we're trying to do is we need to ramp up the ability to get more resource coordinators because what we're seeing is as community learning schools, the mayor, and we applaud him for saying he wants community, uh, 200 community learning schools. A lot of them are talking to us about the need for a resource coordinator. We need to get uh, ramp up the, our ability to find uh, and train resource coordinators as well as continue now um, as I said before, because community learning schools and positive learning collaborative are tied together in one thing, there is a, a need and there is a shortfall of mental health services on behalf of New York City schools. And we need to be able to figure out how to help those people, the, the people who are doing it now, expand their capacity so that we can get them into the schools. So in your request for funding also, you put down, you wanted to... Um was it 1.5 million for the uh, Positive Learning Collaborative? Mm -hmm. That is a restorative justice program? One of the pieces of that program is restorative justice. Uh, the, we started this, as I said in my testimony, two years ago. The 15 schools we did this in all had high suspension rates. Their suspension rates. And they're were, elementary schools? Um, I think, well, some K 8s, so it's not just specifically elementary. Uh, their suspension rates have dropped dramatically. The parents say the buildings are much better places to go to. The students like going to the schools much more, and the teachers like working there. It's heavy-duty training. We train them in a bunch of. We, we sent uh, staff of the UFT and from schools to Cornell for this uh, intensive training three years ago in the summer. We brought them back. They're all certified. They now go, and if a school wants to do this, we bring a team from the school. They get completely trained in all sorts of practices, restorative justice, P positive behavior intervention strategies. I'm trying not to use the acronyms, but I'm talking to Danny, so it just comes out sometimes. Sorry. Um, Ed speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, crisis intervention strategies. We do all sorts of different things. And then they bring it back, and everybody at the school has to be trained. We then have coordinators who go to the schools and start working with them. The issue we're having now is we – those. Every, all the training we do, there is nothing uh, that we can supply at this moment about um, a much needed clinical intervention. Um, there are students who have all sorts of 
different challenges and they need a clinical intervention and it is wrong for them to be continued to be suspended and we need to get the service that they need and we shouldn't have to suspend them and go through this legal process in order to get them the service. If everybody is agreeing there's a problem, why don't we just deal with it? Why do we have to go through all these hoops? So that's, we're looking now to expand that. We have a lot of schools who want to do it. And, but once again, this is a program by and large has been paid for by unions, the UFT members dues money. See, one of the things I wanted to, to highlight here is that um, I think most of your programs are in elementary schools and I think most of the DOE are in the high schools. I think one of the advantages to doing it in the elementary schools is if we can get to kids at a younger age as well, it prevents future problems, I think, when they're older. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an initiative I'm very interested in. All right. You, 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 we all know that the earlier we get the intervention, the, more it, uh, the much more effective it is for the rest of the child's life, whether that's in academics or behavior or anything else. The earlier the intervention, the the ability for real success for that child is much higher the earlier we get to them. So um, uh, let's go to the charter enrollment gap um, and I ask if you could explain that a little bit further. Council Member Levin in uh, his questioning before highlighted that the growth of uh, money into the charter school system has been absolutely incredible and mm -hmm. it may in fact take up almost, how much did you say, a quarter of the Can we put your mic on? Five to seven uh, years, about a quarter of the budget. Five to ten years, about a quarter of the DOE budget, potentially, on the current rate of growth. Um, in terms of how much funding they get and how it's used, that's a whole different other issue. But if you're going to get funding, then you need to serve all the children. You have to serve the neediest children. You cannot say you're serving special ed children when they might be receiving one service per week versus a special ed child who is in a self-contained classroom all week. That is, we all know there's a major difference. And when a child has uh, issues in terms of uh, discipline and how they are acting in school, the, re the school is supposed to help them through that, not send them to another school that, so they don't have to serve them. So what we're saying, very simply, and this is the first time it's been put in a one-house bill in Albany, is do that. And we'll deal with how much you're getting per student in the end, especially here in New York City. As we know, in New York City, especially with the facilities funding that the state now requires us to do, receive, a child in a charter school is receiving more uh, funding than a child in a public school. So we'll deal with that issue. Uh, at a different time, but right now all we're asking for is support from City Council just to say re take all students, the same needy students that everyone else needs to serve and we do it and we, we're happy to do it. We think it's part of education. Uh, they should be doing the same thing. So just one last question before I have my, turn it over to my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Reynoso and then Traeger have a couple of questions as well. Uh, and this was not in your testimony, but it concerns me. That's the education tax credit in Albany. Yep. What's going on with that? Um, I, for me, it seems like they're asking for $150 million to be taken away from our public school budget that we could desperately use here in the city if we were to give this money uh, for that education tax credit purpose. Yeah, the edu uh, we're lobbying strongly against this. Um, as I met with some of these people, they have told me, you know, oh, look, we know what the game is. It's a backdoor voucher bill. I'm not, I've been in this job too long. I don't mince words anymore. It's a backdoor voucher bill. It's a piece of legislation that was designed for a, uh, a national group that is main a goal is to defund public education and privatize public education. And this is just a way to do it. And that is what is going on. And I've tried to explain that to folks. Uh, that is, you know, some folks that we work with are trying to, uh, who are pushing this bill, and I've been very clear with them, you're not on the right side on this one because the people who have given you all this information and want you to push this legislation, in the end, they want to do one thing, which is do, to privatize public education, which we know will be bad for the students of America. Very, very concerning to us here in the council as well. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Reynoso to... Uh...
Thank question. you, Chair. I have to. I'm supposed to be heading out 15 minutes ago to a sanitation hearing across the hall. Uh-oh. Uh, to chair that, yeah. Um, but I'll be fine. I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. I'm going to ask you all three so that we can just hopefully knock it out the park. Um, community learning schools, love the model, works great in my district. I'm going to be asking every school in my district to get it, hopefully, that doesn't have it yet. Just know it'll come. Uh, well, if you're going to ask... You got to need some it. funding. There you go. I know the money. The money is important. So we, we will do our part. But I do want to say you were talking about the process regarding community learning schools and how important that is. I just feel that given that you're at the at, at the leadership level of that of that process, um, what concerns you really have there because you're driving that process. And so long as that you stay in place and you're the lead on that the CLS model, I feel comfortable that what you're doing now will continue to happen. Well, the, my fear is that if Albany, it, it, and it, it, it's, it's, a, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag here. My fear is Albany's really going to fund this and everybody's going to run with the money and not do the process the correct way. Uh, my conversations in Albany are more about, I'm glad you all understand the need for community learning schools. We don't want to waste this funding. You need to also put into place that this a certain process has to be put in place at the same time they receive this money. It is not because when we first started this our first year with you guys, we showed up at the school and they were like, where's our check? Because that's the way it always happened. Where's the check? We're like, no, we, we want to talk to you. So they, we, we talked to them for a while, and these are good folks. We interviewed, and then after a month, they were like, well, where's the check? And we're like, we're still going with this process. And then they understood it, and it's funny because that first cohort now talks to other schools about how important this process is. And, and it does come out with a better result for the school. I am talking to Albany about that. Anyone here, I know, and I thank you for your support of community learning schools, and I know you have been there with us when we visited at different times, that we have to make sure that every school community understands they are better off doing this the right way and do not do that knee jerk oh we know exactly what we need because every school who has gone through this process has landed up doing things they had never thought they were going to do at the beginning well i'm very supportive and i just want to say that a group of us um, young men of color within the city council all are extremely supportive of this uh, program i want to make sure that this type of model continues to happen especially in the schools that are in our district i'm speaking selfishly there chairman um also want to speak to professional development and what you think it's meant, um, it, the new model of professional development for teachers, and what you think it's meant, um, and has, has it been a model that you, you appreciate, uh, and whether or not it's making progress in the teacher's ability to keep expanding on their ability to learn, I guess. It, it's really more about the time. There's no one set model. We had no time. Uh, so we know you're only going to move education, especially now as we move forward in, in more of a a collaborative approach at the school level. We would hope a school actually develops completely as a team. I'm never going to be satisfied that every school is doing good, solid PD every week, and we'll always push at that. We should never stop pushing at that. But I do believe that the results we're seeing in New York City schools is as a direct uh, correlation to the, uh, for the first time in a long time, we have this ability to do training on a weekly basis inside of our schools. And I don't think we would have been making this progress without it. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And the last thing is uh, ESL. I'm a former ESL student, uh, extremely important to me. Uh, at this point, uh, a young child comes from a foreign country uh, mid-year, or let's say in the third or fourth grade, uh, within that year, they have to take the statewide exam, mm -hmm. uh, especially the ELA one, which I'm extremely concerned of, uh, about. Is uh, I would I would challenge anyone, including you, Mr. Moger, to tell me if you could learn a language proficiently in one year. Oh, no, uh, you don't have to challenge me. I can tell you, no. <laughs> exactly. I would challenge anybody in the Department of Education, both in the federal, state, and city governments. Um, right now, I've pushed a a resolution to the state, and the state has pushed it to the federal government, yep. um, asking that we see we can buy, get waivers to the federal government, uh, or ask the federal government to give us a waiver for those students that just can't be proficient. And what we end up getting are teachers that are failures, 
students that are failures and schools that are failures for an unreasonable request um, of learning a language in one year, proficiently in one year. And, and it, it goes a little bit deeper. I'm hoping that that waiver gets approved, especially when you consider that the person who signed the waiver on behalf of New York State is now the Secretary of Education. So I, if he doesn't approve his own waiver, that would be a little weird. But I've seen crazier things in government. But the piece that we're missing here is something's wrong when we're using that exam as the criteria for proficiency when we have hundreds of students who are passing regents in English but cannot pass their nicest lat. Something's wrong. And we need to, and with that as a discussion, we are pushing at the state level because how are, our, how are students passing the English regents, their you know, living environment regions in English, yet your nicest lat there. What is wrong with your nicest lat? And, and, but, over, but, but the Department of Ed, I applaud the, the dual language schools are opening. Part 154 that was put down upon us, another unfunded mandate from the state has not been helpful. New York City, two big crises, number of school seats, and the growing uh, English language population because we don't even have the basic workforce to help. So I agree, and I uh, look forward to partnering with you and supporting you as we move forward on this. Thank you for that. I appreciate your time, Chairman. And also, make sure you find me for any advocacy that needs to happen on any ELL students. I'm always going to be there for you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Traeger. Thank you, Chair Drum, and welcome, uh, President Mulgrew. Uh, I just uh, want to give a, a personal plug. Uh, in, in your testimony, uh, there is strong support for Teacher Center. To me, I think it's really a learning center. Uh, as someone who, like the chair, taught in the public school system, what the public really needs to understand is that we have seen the mandates from Danielson Framework, <laughs> from Common Core, to Mosul, to MOTEP, to a new evaluation system that they just mandated from Albany yet again. And educators are not robots. We're humans. We need time to process information. We need time to make sure that all these changes are not going to negatively impact the students that we serve and teach every day. And so I was a member of the teacher center in the school which, where I taught at we developed a teacher-led professional development team to process these changes to make sure it did not negatively impact student outcomes for the most vulnerable student populations. So in reality, Teacher Center, which is really a learning center, is a direct result of all of the mandated changes and regulations that come from Washington, Albany, and beyond. For us to be able to incorporate what we know work best to meet the needs of all of our kids. So Chair Drum, and I thank you for your advocacy and your support of this, but these are critical centers in our schools that cannot be played with. We need time to process things to make sure that outcomes remain strong in our schools. So I just want, do want to begin by saying that. Thank you thank very you. much for your comments. 100%. Now, uh, President Mulgrew, in, in, when the Chancellor uh, earlier testified, um, I, I, I raised something with her that I know that you've also been very, and you, the UFT, been very supportive and strong on. I, I chair a new committee called Recovery and Resiliency that deals with the mayor's uh, resiliency plans, how to make the city more resilient. He has a plan called One NYC, uh, where there will be mandates by decades beyond us here that will have solar panels installed in public uh, buildings and all, very nice things. That resiliency mandate and plan should not be a jobs plan for China or Germany. That should be a jobs plan for here in New York City. So what are we doing, I, I asked, that to retrofit our public schools, to invest in them, and to invest in CTE capacity so our schools, like a Grady, instead of working on car parts that might be obsolete 20 years from now, to teach them the skills to build solar panels and to build mm -hmm. resiliency products and items, for the, that meet the needs of the 21st century. Students in my community who live in Coney Island who witnessed the worst natural disaster in their history should be 
taught the skills and given the training and the opportunities to be a part of the answer to the 21st century challenges. So what can we do to work with the, with the UFT, work with teachers, work with stakeholders to really improve our, our CTE plan that we're, our, our schools are aligned to 21st century skill building and what type of resources do we need from the city and state level to make this happen? And I thank you for your advocacy and your support as always. Thank you. Uh, in terms of career and technical education, I, I am happy that we have increased the enrollment in students inside of career and technical education programs in New York City, but every meeting I go to with parents, this is a subject I hear all the time. Where I want my child to be trained. Uh, and then when I tell them that when we do career and technical education, everyone thinks it's the vocational, which it is, it's, it's a much different program. It's more real world at this, part, at this point. And then the data has shown us over the last 10 years that students who go to career and tech ed, who graduate from career and tech ed programs, of course we can't say schools anymore. There's more students inside of programs in what's called traditional schools than there are in CTE schools. The students who graduate from those programs graduate at a higher rate than the academic students, go to college at a higher rate, and finish college in four years at a much higher rate than students who are in what is considered quote, academic programs. So it's really not, and, and because parents are always telling me that the cost of college tuition and all this, I want my son to get a vocational skill. I'm like, you need them in a career and tech ed program. So what can city council do at this point is work with us to help schools understand because what had happened is while we were trying to grow them, schools were given no credit for it. Remember school report cards? It was all based on academic subjects. So why would a school go out of its way to then start a whole CTE program if they were going to be given no credit for it, if they would have to wait years to see the results in their graduation rates? And their, they wouldn't do that. Right. So luckily we were able to convince enough people to do it, but now it's time to grow them. If you see a partner, you all work with different businesses. I agree with you. We have one solar school in New York City. Hmm. Okay, one. The need of that industry is off the chart. We have the largest, the largest harbor in terms of utilization rate is a small utilization rate. Our harbor needs a lot more work inside of it. They, they literally are recruiting thousands of people a year to come work inside of our harbor system. We have one school hmm. that deals with that, wow. the harbor school. And so there are so many opportunities that should be given to the children of New York City. It's not just about transportation technology in terms of automobiles and airplanes. We, we do that, but we still, actually, I could tell you the Greater New York Automobile Dealers Association would like us to start more programs because they need the technicians. And a lot of those uh, dealerships would actually pay the kids the child's college tuition if they will guarantee that they're going to come work for them. So the opportunities are there. As we move forward with a plan for Albany, which we are doing this year, we would welcome your support. Uh, and, and, and I would like to maybe perhaps say we should have a hearing on career and tech ed. Yes. And really show what's going on and what needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you very much. You know, it was uh, said earlier that uh, how grateful council members were to have a chancellor who was a former educator and I want to say how lucky we are to have a union leader who spent so many years in the classroom. But what an extra special privilege it is to have so many educators on this committee. We have six former uh, educators on this committee, and we can really get to the heart of education questions. And I, it's been a privilege. I, I'm assuming a lot of people here are like, what are they talking about? Because we almost dropped right into teacher speak. <laughs> but it is, uh, and I can't thank the support, and it does make a difference. Teaching is a really hard job. We can't let it go without letting it be said that it, how good it is to have a chair. Chair. Oh, spent so many God. years in the <laughs> Thank classroom you. as well. So. Don't get me started because it's a very, um, <laughs> it's the reason I ran for office. But thank you, uh, President Mulgrew. Thank you thank all thank you very, much. very much. Thank you. Our next panel. And by the way, I have a lot of people, so I'm going to have to limit. Oh, yes, and let me do a, a shout out, but let me call the students. Randy Herman, the Vice President of the Council of School Supervisors and Administrators, and Jackie Ferbelay from Local 372. And let me give a shout out, too, 
the uh, class of seniors from the High School for Fashion Industries is here, a class on economics and government. Where are you? Let's see. Stand. If you don't mind, everybody, thank you very, very much for coming and for listening to, the, to this testimony today. I know we have other students here as well, so we're going to get around. I think some of them are going to be giving testimony. Okay, I have to ask if you'll raise your right hand, please. I can swear you in. We do that with everybody that comes before us. Um, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Thank you very much. And uh, Randy, would you like to start? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be back. Today I'm up here testifying yesterday. I was in the audience listening to uh, testimony that focused on uh, the homeless, which was very disturbing. What's even more disturbing is that many of those homeless are our children. But I digress. Um, I'm Randy Herman, the first Vice President of the Council of School Supervisors and Administrators. We represent the principals, assistant principals, supervisors of education administrators, and uh, the directors of early childhood education that work for the Department of Education as well as those working in city-funded early childhood programs. You've heard all about the challenges that the Department of Education faces as a very large system that comes with the territory. Our members, particularly the CSA members, the school leaders, uh, really have their work cut out for them and they have to really think outside the box. Uh, you heard Michael talk about children with special needs, English language learners. I, the, the differentiation is endless. As any educator knows, trying to design instruction that meets the needs of all children is a challenge. One of the things that can help level the playing field is technology. This we know. This has been documented. We've tried it. We know it works. It works with autistic children in giving them the ability to communicate. It works with English language learners and helps them develop and become proficient in English. What they need is the hardware. And up to now, uh, Rezo A money has not been able to purchase tablets because the basic rule of eligibility was that it had to have a five-year lifespan. And until now, tablets did not have that. So what we'd like to ask is that the council work with the Department of Education to try and get tablets approved for Rezo A. That would enable many of our schools to purchase older models that aren't so expensive but are perfectly suited to the apps that the children need to learn English, to practice problem-solving skills, and even to become proficient in skills that they're lacking. So we really welcome your help with that. So, um, uh, Vice President Herman, uh, that has been a priority for this committee, and uh, we're working with the controller to see how we can make that happen, because we recognize also that um, tablets, iPads, etc are assistive learning devices, especially for many of our um, special ed mm -hmm. students. And uh, we also recognize, and I believe this is true, that um, when the Smart Schools Bond Act was passed, part of the money, or the, you could use part of that money for technology. And it's my belief that districts in the surrounding area are using some of that money to purchase tablets and iPads. And I believe that students in New York sh City should also be able to do that. So we, are, we, we want to move forward on that, and we will work together with you on that. Any help we can give you, just ask. Um, another wonderful thing that we've been doing, you've heard a little bit about uh, universal pre-K from the chancellor. We know that the earlier students get to an educational environment, the better prepared they are, the more progress they make, and also developmental delays are able to be remediated when they're very young and it does 
save on the budget. In the long run, it saves the child frustration. It saves the family a lot of frustration. We're doing universal pre-K. Finally, we've, we've recognized it and we're willing to invest. And there's living proof. Um, this council doesn't intimidate her. She'll take us all on. What we'd like to see is a thoughtful expansion of early childhood education. One that makes sure that the universal pre-K classrooms have, oh, already she's got her next job, uh, have the, uh, the equipment, supplies, and supervision that they need. You heard a little bit about the teacher shortage on one side of the table. Um, we, we, we have to do something to make sure there's no shortage anywhere. So it's a much larger problem than for this time and place. It's a bigger conversation, but it's one that we've had with you for quite a while, and I think the discussions are productive and will continue. We have faith in the research that early childhood education is going to make a considerable difference. The ripple effect will be felt for years to come, but again, just not to grow too fast, too quickly and it's a temptation I know because once you see something is having a positive impact you want it to continue and you want it to grow. Now we recognize as to you that our members the school leaders of the city have to continue to be on the top of their game and we also know that even though as my great grandma used to say I have ten children and ten fingers no two fingers are alike. So we have to really make sure that our members get the cutting edge of professional development. We have a vehicle that we use to do that. That's the Executive Leadership Institute, which in years past has been funded generously through the City Council. And we ask that you continue your support of the Executive Leadership Institute and its programs that include um, the advanced leadership program for assistant principals. Um, just a point of fact, since its inception, uh, the APs who have gone through that program, 155 have become principals. Just this year alone, 275 assistant principals participated in the school-based intermediate supervisors program, and the year isn't over yet. So. Again, we're doing good things. You've heard a lot about the initiatives that the Department of Education would like to put in place. Our members are going to need cutting edge professional development to make sure that we roll it out just as the Department of Education has envisioned. So any support you could give with, for that this year, we'd welcome that. Now, I mentioned earlier the students who are in temporary housing are homeless. In the last six years, just since 2010, there's been a 25% increase in the numbers of homeless students. Um, every day our school leaders address the extraordinary social, emotional, and instructional needs of more than 83,000 students who live in the city's homeless shelters. They need more than just meals. They need more than just mental health, and they need more than just having their physical needs seen too. That's one of the reasons we continue to advocate for more assistant principals, social workers, guidance counselors, and other education professionals. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, many students are hungry when they come to school. Well, the Department of Education, along with the City Council support, has organized breakfast in the classroom. And what that has done is enabled students who come late to school to just grab breakfast, and go to class. They won't miss any instruction. But the department has been wonderfully responsive to the diverse needs of our school communities and has begun to develop flexible breakfast in the classroom so that students will also be able to eat in the cafeteria when they arrive at school. So we thank the council for their support with that and the partnership with the Department of Education has been nothing short of wonderful. And finally, the community schools model. You heard Michael talk about it. I was with you on Friday when we went to PS1. 
there's nothing you can say about this model that does it justice. The key piece, as Michael also explained, is the resource coordinator. Um, we've talked about this at length, Karen Alford and I, that is the linchpin that makes or breaks the success of this program. So as it moves forward, the funding that the model gets needs to continue to support that resource coordinator. Um, it's an expensive model, nobody's denying that, but the cost of not investing in a community schools model is much greater down the line. So as always, there's a lot more to talk about and I look forward to continuing our conversations and I thank you again for the opportunity to come here today. Just before we go to our next speaker, your request for Eli is 770000 Yes. That's what we gave last year? Same, so it's the same amount? Yeah, the same you want amount. A of that? If the Department of Education would like to partner with us in the other initiatives that we were talking about earlier, that of course would come at an additional cost, but you know, that depends what we're asked to do. But the 770 will fund exactly what we had. So just, uh, I've been at your rallies obviously, and I know, kind of know the answer to this, but for the record, just maybe a little bit more in depth, can you explain what's happening with the three-year-old classroom teachers versus the UPK teachers and its relationship to the DOE? Ah, loaded question. Okay. Um, if Jackie and I were both working in an early childhood center, a city-funded early learn center, uh, we both have the same credentials, same licenses, same certification from New York State, but I got to teach the universal pre-K program this year. City Hall said I was getting $50,000, a 2.5 COLA, a signing bonus, and a retention bonus. But my colleague who's teaching next door, well, she's out of luck. In the three-year-old room. In the three-year-old classroom. So what does she do? She says, well, I can't afford to stay here. I think I will go to the Department of Education and teach universal pre-K over there, and then I'll get that pay. Plus at another site, perhaps. At a U-Pre-K site run by the Department of Education. So what that does is creates a teacher shortage for the CBOs that are working with the city to expand universal pre-K. So there's, there's a, 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 dis a disconnect there. We, we can't keep stealing from mm -hmm. the other side. Um, plus, universal pre-K teachers might also decide, well, if I went to work at a Department of Education universal pre-K, my salary would be even higher, and you know what? My benefits would be better, too. It's just an imbalance that we need to correct. So it's about pay equity. It's about pay parity, it's about equity in benefits, wages, working conditions. I mean, they work till six o'clock. Mm -hmm. If you work in a universal pre-K at the DOE, you work till three o'clock. You work 181 to 183 days a year. Early childhood centers are open a lot more than that. Okay, Jackie, why don't you um, proceed? And then I know Councilmember Traeger has some questions. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Drum, Councilman Traeger. My name is Jackie Sabrulet. I'm the political director. Is that mic on? Ooh. The red light? It's on. Okay. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> good afternoon. My name is Jackie Sabrulet. I'm the political director for Local 372. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. Uh, Local 372 represents over 23,000 DOE employees. We represent school aides paraprofessionals, school crossing guards, parent coordinators, substance abuse uh, specialists, and lunchroom workers. Essentially represent the uh, backbone of the DOE. We are those workers that um, allow teachers to teach and administrators to do their job. Oh, let's not forget also the school crossing guards. Um, before I start, I want to give thanks to the administration for uh, not reducing the education budget that really is essential in preventing services from being cut. 
because when cuts need to be made, usually administrators have to make the tough decision of keeping a program or cutting staff, and usually support staff is the first people that have to go, and that means Local 372 members. Um, local 372 members are struggling. On a very meager salary, they are scrambling to pay basic necessities such as housing, food, and transportation to get to work. If this isn't bad enough, we have local 372 members who are also homeless or living in shelters without a place to call their own. Yet every day, these same, member, these same members go to work every day to perform the duties that they're tasked to do, which is take care of 1.1 million school children. And they love every single minute of the work they do. I also want to thank the administration and the, member, and the mayor for his vision with the $15 an hour initiative. Local 372 members will have a better chance now to pay for their homes and put, foods on their table, put food on their table. Um, one issue I'm going to discuss is the SAPAs. SAPAs are substance abuse prevention and intervention specialists. SAPAs provide anti-bullying, provide um, substance abuse prevention and intervention for the students and for the families. The administration was gracious, gracious enough to provide us with $2 million last year for the SAPAs. However, let's be clear, this was a one-time funding. We're asking the administration to please again, once again, fund the SAPAs for, um, we're asking for $3 million, $2 million to maintain the current number of SAPAs plus an additional, additional million for additional uh, positions. The jobs that uh, SAPAs do are very important. They just don't do substance abuse prevention and intervention. They uh, provide anti-bullying, and even during a situation that there's uh, violence in the schools, and kids need uh, counseling. It's the SAPAs that get called to provide those kind of intermediate counselings when there's a tragedy at the schools. We've asked the state for funding, and uh, we're hoping that the State Assembly and the State Senate do provide additional funding for the SAPAs, but we're also asking for the City Council to provide funding for the SAPAs. Without this $2 million uh, injection into the SAPAs program, we will be losing 25 positions. And those 25 SAPAs were placed throughout the district. They were, most of them were placed in Staten Island, which has a really high incidence of substance abuse and alcohol abuse in middle schools and high schools, because that's where it begins. It begins in middle school. The rest of the SAPAs were distributed along the other four boroughs. Again, we're asking you for $3 million to continue the 25 positions that were funded through the money the city gave last year for the SAPAs, plus an additional million for additional position. We're also asking um, for $3 million for the severance-related fund. Now, this is kind of like a strange situation. Um, Local 372 is the only organization, the only union that provides full-time benefits for part-time workers even when they retire. Now, because of many things such as uh, increase in prescription drug costs and layoffs many years ago, the fund is being depleted. Currently, we've had to make the difficult decision of not covering a lot of the retirees and their spouses for supplemental services such as drug, um, paying for their drugs and for the dental because the fund is depleted. We've asked the legislature and we're asking you for assistance. We're also asking the mayor's office for assistance in funding this fund. We're asking for $3 million. The problem is that as of July 2016, those that are in COBRA that are within the fund will have to pay, go from paying 20, I'm sorry, $55 a month in COBRA to close to $200 a month. Now, what really hurts is the fact that these are people that they cross our children in the streets, they feed our kids in the, in the cafeterias, they keep our kids safe in, in, in the hallways in the playgrounds. And the least we can do is make sure that when they retire, they don't have to worry about whether they're going to put food on the table or pay the rent or pay for the medication that's trying to save their lives. That is why we're asking the City Council to please assist us in giving us $3 million to put a gap in this fund. And uh, I want to piggyback on something that Randy said. Um, Jackie, the, just also sure, on, sure. on the... Mm -hmm. um, that was the school crossing guards, right? No, for the school crossing guards, uh, we're testifying on Monday for the school crossing guards. Uh, but they face a similar issue with the severance? The uh, severance is the part-time workers, which is the school aides and the school crossing guards, and the cafeteria workers, which are all part-time positions. Mm -hmm. So over 9,000 retirees and, mem and future retirees are, are going to be affected by this issue. 
So on, on the school crossing guard issue, yes. I had a friend actually whose mm -hmm. husband, she's a retiree. Yes. So her husband lost the benefits, right? Absolutely, yes. And this money, this $3 million would enable... Would allow us to bring everyone back. Right. And from what I understand, part of the issue was because of the decrease in the number of people who pay into the fund? Absolutely. And, and also, because the city has decreased the number of school crossing guards, and because we're not the, able to meet that number anymore. And the city has also not increased the contribution since 1987. Okay. They're basically so, contributing the same amount regardless of how many uh, cost of inflation. So it's With, a combination of those two issues. Those two issues. So we also have a, a plan in place that our members are willing to contribute additional funding into the fund to keep it solvent. Also, we're working with the city for them to raise their contribution. So it's kind of like a three-prong approach. But in order to get to resolve this issue before July, when the COBRA is going to go up to $200, we're asking for assistance. Just and to what's COBRA now? COBRA, they're paying $55 okay. a month. And the difference between 55 and 200 is a big difference for someone who's on a fixed income. And then look, school crossing guards got an increase thanks to the efforts of your union mm -hmm. to 1150, but I don't know if they're even up to $15 an hour yet. Not yet, not till 2018. So if you're talking $200 out of uh, people who had made in their career less than $15 an hour, you're talking a large sum of money. For them. Large, large sum of money. It's an right. unusual uh, circumstance where we're asking uh, for your assistance in that. Okay. Now, the final thing I want to discuss is um, what uh, Randy was discussing, uh, breakfast in the classroom. Local 372 members, the cafeteria workers, prepare the meals and they serve the meals in the cafeteria. They deliver the meals to the classrooms. They are more than willing to do this job because you know what? It is their kids, their grandkids that are in those schools benefiting from the breakfast in the classroom and breakfast in the cafeteria. They provide lunch. They do all this work with minimal staff. And when we take into consideration expanding the program, we also have to take into consideration expanding the staff. Our members are tired. They come in early in the morning before they can clock in so that they can have the breakfast ready for the cafeteria and for bag lunches or bag breakfast or whatever has to go to the classrooms. They have to bring it back down and still prepare lunch. And the schools are so overcrowded that lunch can start at 10 o'clock in the morning. We're asking for additional staffing in order to make sure that our kids are fed and they're fed properly and appropriately. That is a big thing. We're asking for an additional 500 uh, school lunch employees. Because currently, the only thing the DOE and the Office of School Food wants to do is, is give you extra hours. If you've been there since 7 in the morning, 6 in the morning preparing meals, and they want to give you an extra hour, you're already beat. You're burnt out. It, may, it does nothing for you to have an extra hour when actually what you need is an extra body. So we're basically asking, um, we're hoping that the city council can assist us with $3 million for SAPIS, $3 million for the Severance Related Fund, and this money for additional um, school lunch employees. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you, and I'm available to answer any questions. Uh, just one more question. Sure. I'm going to actually turn it over to Councilmember Traeger sure. while I eat a sandwich over here. <laughs> uh, but I will be listening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with regard to the, um, the, the lunchroom workers, mm -hmm. um, are they currently bringing the food to the classroom? In the, oh, for the absolutely. breakfast program. And taking it away. And, and, and they have to do this all within an hour because then they have to go get ready for lunch. And if there's not a heavy duty person in the school, meaning that they're allowed to lift and take these things to the cafeteria, you have an elderly person having to do this. So who's preparing, with no elevator. Who's preparing the breakfast? In other words, going in my school, we had warmers. Mm -hmm. And the warmers, the food would come in, I think. Um, you know, in a package, and you yeah. put it in the warmer, and they'd warm it. Mm -hmm. So it was just a matter of putting it in and pulling it out. Whenever we ordered like a school lunch for a trip or something, the staff had to make the sandwiches, mm -hmm. etc. That takes an awful lot of time. Is that similar to now what's happening with the breakfast program? Yes, that's similar. It's, that's what's going on. They have to prepare the meals. They have to prepare the whether it's bag lunches or bag breakfast. Um, if they have to heat anything up, some schools do cook. Some cafeterias, some, some kitchens do right. cook. So they have to do all this while at the same time making sure that they get the food to the students. Okay. And Randy, you want to talk maybe about the, the issue with warm food versus cold? There was a, a major uh, um, discussion, shall we say, about the temperature that the food was served at because Department of Health regulations are very, very specific. So these folks have to work very quickly. Yes. 
they could do it if there are enough of them, but keeping the cafeteria open, serving breakfast to the kids who come in, getting all these bag breakfasts up, mm -hmm. the trash back into the bags, getting those bags cleared out of the hallways within an hour, back downstairs, then sorting through the organic versus the non-organic, because don't forget we recycle, zero waste initiative. Um, that, that's a major undertaking. And my members expect lunch is ready when lunch is ready. And it better be at the right temperature, and it better be ready for children when the children come down. It's an impossible task without the right resources. Do we want children fed? You bet. Should they have a hot breakfast a couple of times a week? You bet. Should lunch be ready and served in a wonderful environment in the cafeteria? Yes. And all of that takes resources. How do they deal with liquids in the classroom? Because like in the cafeteria in the morning, I'd walk in and I'd see kids pouring, you know, the leftover milk into big buckets. I'll let you. So how are they doing that in the classroom? <laughs> well, not well. Um, remember, it, there's liquid, there's yogurt, there's a lot of spillage. Um, and accidents do happen. And a custodian, of course, is uh, as far away as the phone. But remember, a building generally has one custodian. And if 10 classrooms are calling that they have spillage to clean up, oh well, where does he go first? Somebody could slip. And have I heard about that? Yes. Uh, more often than not, it's a staff member who isn't paying attention to the yogurt on the floor. Um, but that's problematic too. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I want to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Traeger, who's going to take over chairing for a little bit. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum. Listen, he, he works very hard. He's entitled to, to have his lunch, too. <laughs> it's a part of the teacher contract, and it's a part of uh, here as well. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to say, um, uh, I have a question uh, for, uh, welcome, Vice President Herman, by the way. Welcome to you. Thank you so much. You. Just a quick question about um, something that, that used to irk me as a teacher, and I still hear uh, that it still occurs, but I'm not sure at, at the scale that it occurs. The October register, and I would really like to get clarity on this because I remember when I was a teacher in a high school, October was a big important month. Attendance, 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 mm -hmm. because that is the month that the DOE would use to determine the number of kids actually showing up to the building. But I taught in a in a school that was uh, in a community that uh, welcomes and has a lot of immigrants that move in from other countries and we welcome them around the world. But if you show up to the school after October, November, December, January, does the school get funded for these kids? And that is something that has to end. And so I'm just, I'm, as far as giving, they need to give us support to meet You're the You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Plus, add to that, if a child comes to you after October 31st from a charter school, do you think that money follows the child anytime soon? Mm. Budgets for schools are funded at approximately 80% of where they should be right now. Fair student funding is anything but fair, and we all see it. We know how much money we're short. We know how much money we need to get the job done the right way. When I go to a school um, and I see a wonderful, wonderful program, I sometimes will ask the principal, what did you have to give up to get that? That's a question I should never have to ask, nor should a principal have to make that decision. 
And I, I appreciate that, that type of candidness because we hear mixed answers, but I, I, I believe you are correct. I don't believe the schools are being funded after October. Um, and mind you, some of the children that come into the school, and again, we, the public school system, welcomes all children, period. But some of the children that walk in might have needs uh, beyond, you know, uh, an ordinary child where they might need help with uh, reading, they might, need, they might need an IEP, they, they might, uh, it might be English language learner that might need additional resources, a, a power professional, for example, that has to be assigned based, based on the language. And the schools are not being funded for it. And there was a report recently where the DOE is not meeting all of the mandates uh, governed by IEPs. And IEPs, just so we're clear, as, as I'm sure you are, these are not suggestions, these are not recommendations, these are not just, oh, by the way, you should do this. This is law, federal, state law that we're not complying with. And the, and the, the consequence of this is the learning outcomes of the most vulnerable student populations. So, and, and, that, and that is an issue that still bothers me to this day, that we need to be much more flexible with these register months. And if children, as the DOE and the mayor, everyone says, we welcome all children, which is great, but they need to, the Albany and everyone, Washington needs to fund uh, our schools better to meet the needs of all these kids. And the Department of Education will tell you that it has a core document for every school to fill out when a special needs youngster is identified that um, documents the coordination of resources that were available at the school and how they could possibly be cobbled together to meet the child's needs. It's a process that although it's not supposed to take a very long time, it takes way too long. It, the turnaround time is not 48 hours or 72 hours. Um, so if a child has an identified need, um, the principal is told, look within your budget and your resources to see how you can best meet that. And if you can document for us on this report that you have used every possible permutation of resources at your disposal, we'll take a look at how we can help you. And I believe that that is, I'll be very blunt, that's disrespectful to principals because principals and assistant principals, don't, they don't just plan a day before school starts about the school year ahead. Administrators plan months and months and months ahead to make sure they have educators placed uh, in the right class, classroom size, making sure power professionals are hired, making sure that the school is functioning and working, meeting the needs of all kids. And then for them to come last second, and, and, and he, he, the school population is growing, and they say, well, just find, find it in your budget. That is disrespectful to the supervisors who spend months responsibly planning out their budgets. And so we need, you know, I, 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 I hear you, and this is something that I continuously hear at the ground level, but we need to make sure that the, that the DOE, and, and of course even Albany, because of course this becomes a situation where the city will say, well, Albany needs, yes, and that's true, Albany still owes us quite a bit of, a lot of money, but we need to be working with our school administrators, working with our school communities on being as flexible as possible and providing additional resources to meet the needs of these kids. It, well, it's also the viewpoint that um, they look at a child from a budgetary standpoint. Correct. Um, that it's fair student funding and every child gets the same amount of money for support to begin and every service is worth X number of dollars. I've always looked at it in exactly the reverse. Here's the child, the child is a zero-based budget. What is it going to take to educate this child? That's correct, and so I, I, I appreciate that. And just a quick question with regards to the, the outreach of hiring school crossing guards, and what are still some of the challenges <laughs> uh, we face in retainment and hiring? because you know, we've seen an expansion of UPK. There's more sites where uh, 
children will be crossing with their parents to get yes. to school. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're hearing, you know, conversations about additional hiring, but the, what, what, I'm he what I'm hearing on the ground is that, number one, uh, there are challenges in outreach. There are still barriers that, in, of, of communication. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is the job attractive enough that to is, yes. keep and retain people who, quite frankly, keep our kids and families safe? I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, um, the biggest issue is um, we are trying to make the job more attractive. We've been working with the city. The biggest issue right now is that school crossing guards are only allowed to work a maximum of five hours a day. And also the schedule is staggered. So you're talking about a, a school crossing guard working two and a half hours in the morning and then two and a half hours in the afternoon. So they have all this, this huge gap in between where they're doing absolutely nothing. Yet they have to stay close to their post. If you need a full-time position, it makes no sense for you. You can go work at McDonald's, you can go work somewhere else when they will be paying you the same amount of money, basically, but you get more hours of work. What we've been asking the city, we've been asking the city council to assist us in, and what we'll be testifying on um, next week is annualization. Basically, is increasing the hours for school crossing guards. The needs of the school crossing guards have changed. The NYPD has, is the one that has put a cap on the hours for the school crossing guard. Back in the 70s and the 80s, the needs were different, but now the, the needs are completely, are really different. We have after school programs, we have evening programs, uh, we have middle schoolers going out for lunch. There needs to be a school crossing guard there all day, every day. They, this needs to happen. Because it's not just kids that they're crossing, they're crossing the parents, they're crossing the grandparents. Our school crossing guards get sped at, cursed at, just because they have to protect the kids from traffic. Traffic death, tra people getting hurt outside of schools. The schools are overcrowded. The lunches are staggered. So a high schooler could be having lunch at 10 o'clock, another one at 2.30. They can go outside for lunch. Traffic is bad, boom, you get hit. There needs to be a school crossing guard, regardless whether it's a public school, a charter school, or, uh, or, or a private school. There needs to be a school crossing guard in every corner for every school. All our kids deserve to be safe. That is the biggest problem, the cap in the hours, and it's the NYPD that needs to lift the cap. Second, the uh, pay recently increased for the school crossing guards. They're making close to $12 an hour. We're working on increasing that. With the um, $15 an hour, that's not going to kick into 2018. So we still, we're still fighting for that. So there's a couple of things that may make it hard for the position to be filled. Also, according to the NYPD, which I don't believe, believe they're saying that uh, people don't want the positions because they'd rather be working close to where they are. A school crossing guard has to be on their spot by no later than 8 o'clock in the morning. And it's more convenient if you live in the neighborhood, but if you need to work, you need to work. We have people saying they will go anywhere as long as they're working, because even though the position is part-time, you're getting full-time benefits. The only problem with the school crossing guard position is that during the summer, if you don't have um, a site for the summer work, then you're basically going on unemployment. However, at this point in time, because there's so many Schools open during the summer, almost every single school crossing guard has a, has a position during the summer. So if you guys were to assist us in just lifting the cap, talking to the NYPD, we've been fighting with them for years, take the cap off. The school crossing guards are needed in those schools for more than just the four or five hours. They need it every day. You know, I, I find it interesting you say this because we, we hear a lot about this term Vision Zero. Yes. And you would imagine that uh -huh. the administration would wrap this into Vision Zero. Absolutely. Because if we're in a if we're if we're on a mission to make, uh, you know, pedestrian traffic fatalities reach zero, mm -hmm. you would think that we let's start getting very serious about our children, mm -hmm. and, and our parents cr crossing the, uh, the, the the streets. I would also argue uh, that, in addition to the crossings where the schools directly are, mm -hmm. um, and as someone who used to teach, I, I, I know this because, and chair drum as well, that the access points where kids come from are also important. If, if they're getting off the train, if they're mm -hmm. getting off that stop, that first crossing is also a, a critical access point where I think we, we definitely could use some crossing guards. During dismissal, during uh, when kids also come, come in the morning, there's a lot of issues and challenges we, we face where the NYPD it, themselves will say they need help yeah. getting kids dismissed from the... I used to come from a, a school where the principal would say, and I appreciated this, those kids are our responsibility from, from the school until they get home. 
Sochi. And the staff would be dispersed to make sure that we get kids, you know, out, dismissed in, in a meaningful, in a responsible way. But that's where crossing guards can help as well. Not just directly by the school, but even to the access points of how they get home and how they arrive to school in the morning. Because oftentimes those uh, access points are more dangerous than the block by the school because the one at the school is, might be being monitored by school aid or the principal might be outside, like in the case of my, my kid's school. Because it's not just as a union member, I'm talking also as a perspective of a parent right. whose six-year-old is now walking to school because he thinks, he thinks he's a man now. So <laughs> he's walking to school. So um, there's this fear that thanks to the school crossing guard, I know that he's okay, but then there's also those intersections before he gets to the school. There's a lot to worry about a lot to worry about and school crossing guards do their job willingly and happily whether it's raining it's snowing or it's hot they do their job I, I agree and I yeah. just have to add very often that's the first face they see if they're not on a school bus the school crossing guard is the first school person they see when they get to school and I have to put in a pitch for the principals um, we're opening a lot of U pre-k centers right uh, right now, we've barely got enough crossing guards and safety agents to cover. Um, the council needs to help us in making sure that every UPRI-K site has security, every UPRI-K site has a crossing guard. All kids deserve to be safe getting to school, leaving school, and while they're in school. I could not, could not agree, agree more, and um, I, I think I could definitely speak for myself and the chair that we would like to be, work with you as much as we can on a, a advancing and supporting these very, very critical needs, uh, both to retain quality, quality workers, and, and you're absolutely correct about the role of, of, of all of your membership. That is what makes the building run, and uh, it takes a family in the school to make, make a building run. And so we, we appreciate you, appreciate your membership, and we thank you, Vice President Herman, as well, uh, because it, it, it really begins with leadership as well, and, and we, we thank you and your membership for, for all your support and help. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. And with that, I return it to our Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Okay, our next panel, Aaron George from the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, Randy Levine from Advocates for Children, Ariel Savaransky, Citizens Committee for Children, and Sarah Mullery from Children's Defense Fund. Can you, um, where's the sergeant? Okay, so I have to swear you all in, so would you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, would you like to start? Yep. All right. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Sarah Mullery, and I work on health and education issues with the Children's Defense Fund of New York. The Children's Defense Fund is a national nonprofit child advocacy organization that champions policies and programs that lift children out of poverty, protect them from abuse and neglect, and ensure their access to health care, quality education, and a moral and spiritual foundation. Our testimony discusses three areas relating to the Department of Education budget that greatly impact a child well child's well-being. First, school health, students experiencing homelessness, and school climate. 
CDF of New York is committed to using school-based health care services to maximize a child's future health and opportunity for learning. We believe that schools should play a fundamental role in the fostering of healthy children and promote the expanded use of school-based health care services. We thank the Mayor for including investments in the fiscal year 2017 preliminary budget focused on mental health services, staff training, and additional health care staff. We call on the Council and the Executive to work together to further expand access to school-based health services by first further investing in school health. CDF of New York believes that the city should work to develop a citywide school health roadmap that would be outcomes driven and would seek to assess which school-based health care delivery models best resolve health disparities. This would ensure that students have access to universal baseline of health care services. The city should also consider exploring increased reimbursement under the free care policy. To enable an increased investment in school health services, the city would likely need to draw upon more federal and state dollars. The free care policy opens up the potential for schools to receive reimbursements for screenings and assessments. The influx of state and federal Medicaid dollars would then better enable Office of School Health to invest more in school-based health services. Students experiencing homelessness is the second area for investment. Housing instability negatively impacts a child's opportunity for learning, and with nearly 84,000 New York City students defined as homeless, it is cr critically important for New, York's, for New York City to ensure that these children have access to support services. We thank the mayor for including funding for transportation coordinator for students in temporary housing. Additionally, CDF of New York calls on the city to further support these students by first preserving and expanding the Safe in My Brother's Arms program, or SIMBA. The SIMBA program has been a critical lifeline for New York students experiencing homelessness, and New York City, city should preserve and expand support for the program. The city can also support these students by expanding access to fee waivers for City University of New York applications. CDF suggests that the application fee be waived for any student applying to CUNY who has experienced homelessness. By doing so, the city, with a small investment, can significantly improve the educational and employment opportunities for some of our most vulnerable youth. School safety and climate supports is the third area for investment. CDF of New York works to replace punitive school discipline and safety policies in New York City schools with social and emotional supports that encourage a positive school climate and improve educational and social outcomes for youth. We urge the city to increase its investment in whole school restorative justice models by expanding investments in school-based restorative justice. Today, each school participating in the City Council Restorative Justice Initiative has a full-time school-based restorative justice coordinator. CDF of New York, as members of the Dignity in Schools Campaign of New York, respectfully ask that the Council allocate $2.4 million to ensure that the sustainability of to ensure the sustainability of schools already involved and an additional $2.6 million to expand the program to additional schools. It is our hope that the Council will continue dialogue with the Department of Education on the value of sustainable investments in school-based health care delivery, supports for students experiencing homelessness, and restorative justice in schools. I would like to thank Chair Drum and all of the members of the Education Committee for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. Randy? <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the fiscal year 2017 preliminary budget. My name is Randy Levine and I'm policy coordinator at Advocates for Children of New York. Advocates for Children's mission is to promote access to the best education New York can provide for all students, especially for students from low income backgrounds and students of color. We're pleased that the preliminary budget has a number of initiatives that would support students with disabilities, students who are homeless, immigrant students, we're also pleased that the preliminary budget includes an investment of $16.4 million for literacy coaches for students in kindergarten through second grade. Last week, we released a report documenting the need for urgent and sustained action to address the particularly low literacy levels for low-income students with disabilities and prepare schools to teach reading effectively for all students. And we know that, Chair Drum, you had an op-ed today about the need to provide specialized reading instruction for students with dyslexia in particular. Providing literacy coaches to students in the early elementary grades is an important step toward moving schools closer to achieving their fundamental responsibility of teaching all students, including students with disabilities, to read. While the preliminary budget includes a number of other encouraging initiatives, we want to use our limited time to highlight a few areas in which more funding is needed. First, the budget should include increased resources to address school climate. 
We have some statistics here about school discipline in New York City. We are pleased that there are several initiatives in the preliminary budget to address school climate and have listed them here. We're grateful to the City Council for funding the restorative justice pilot program in the fiscal year 2016 budget. For 2017, we're requesting $5 million for this initiative. $2.4 million would support the continuation of the pilot program for the schools selected to participate this year to sustain these efforts for a second year. And an additional $2.6 million would allow for additional schools to receive funding to participate in school-based restorative justice. Second, increased resources are needed for students in temporary housing. You held a hearing recently on students in temporary housing, and we have a lot of statistics here about the dismal outcomes that students living in shelter um, that we're producing for these students. We're recommending that the budget include funding to hire at least 100 social workers dedicated to meeting the educational needs of students living in shelter. We've outlined here the inadequacies in the current staffing for students in temporary housing and the various ways in which social workers can use the clinical training and strengths-based approaches to really help students who are living in shelters. Third, the budget should include funding for a reliable data system to track information regarding students with disabilities. We're grateful to you and the City Council for enacting Local Law 27 and recently received the first set of data around special education. The data showed that 40% of students with disabilities are not receiving their full services and also showed that we don't have any reliable data about which students and whether or not students or when students are receiving their services. And we think that a reliable and accurate data system is the first step so that the city can identify where it's falling short and make sure that all students with disabilities are receiving the services to which they're entitled. And finally, the last area I'll highlight is the need for more funding for translation and interpretation. We were glad that the city took several positive steps this year, including expanding direct phone interpretation to schools. However, pre-K programs at community-based organizations, New York City Early Education Centers or NYSEEKs, do not have access to interpretation by phone right now. And we know that the city is working on this issue and encourage the city to include increased resources so that pre-K for all programs can really communicate with all families. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Erin George. I'm a community organizer at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Um, we're a nonprofit advocacy organization working to advance equality and civil rights. Um, over the past several years, NOPI has become increasingly involved in education advocacy through our membership in the Phys Ed for All Coalition and the Sexuality Education Alliance of New York City. Um, as the council considers the city's education budget, we hope you will push to ensure that the DOE does more to help schools meet physical education and sexuality education standards. Research shows that quality physical, <clears throat> pardon me, quality physical education enhances students' academic achievement, improves concentration, and instills good habits for healthy living. PE is particularly critical for students with obesity and related health problems. <clears throat> Approximately one in five New York City public school students in grades K through eight are obese, and obesity rates are higher in low-income communities of color. Last year, the council made the important decision to prioritize PE through the passage of Local Law 102 and through a $6.6 .6 million allocation to the DOE, and we thank you for doing so. Uh, this allocation allowed for the development of the PE Works Initiative, which bolstered PE programs in eight school districts through the hiring of licensed PE teachers as well as physical education managers. Uh, preliminary feedback about this program has been positive. Uh, as such, we're requesting that the council dedicate an additional $18 million to expand the PE Works initiative to all 32 school districts. Furthermore, given that the 2016 budget funded a system-wide analysis of PE barriers and needs, we urge the administration to include capital funding in the 2017 budget to begin addressing the capital needs identified in the analysis. Um, in terms of sexuality education, this is an integral piece of students' overall health, well-being, decision-making, and academic achievement. According to a recent New York City Youth Risk Behavior Survey, about half of public high school students are having sex. Every year in the U.S., nearly one million teenage girls faces an unintended pregnancy. A quarter of new STIs occurs in adolescence, and every hour, two teens contract HIV. 
Despite these realities, we don't yet have comprehensive sexuality education in grades K through 12 here in New York City as is nationally recommended. Um, furthermore, a third of high school students either have never received sex ed or they don't know if they have or not. Um, <clears throat> the council displayed recognition on the importance of this issue with the recent passage of the group of bills focused on tracking and reporting of data related to health education, and we thank the council for this critical step. Um, we request in further support of sex ed uh, that the council provide funding to expand the provision of health education and to ensure that adequate sexuality education training is completed by all educators who are providing health education instruction. Uh, thank you for the time, and we look forward to working with you further on these issues. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon. My name is Arielle Savransky, and I'm the Policy Associate for Food and Economic Security at the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Um, I would like to thank Chair Drum and the members of the Education Committee for holding today's hearing. We were pleased to see that the preliminary budget proposed to begin funding the Mayor's Equity and Excellence Agenda, which aims to help children succeed in school through initiatives such as Literacy for All, Algebra for All, and AP for All. Unfortunately, the plan will not be fully implemented until 2026, and we continue to hope these initiatives can be expedited. In addition, there was no funding in the preliminary budget to begin funding the computer science for all, but we hope to see this in the executive budget. There are also still critical issues that we hope to see funded by the administration in the executive budget. I'm just going to go through a few of those. We are strongly urging the administration to finally complete Mayor de Blasio's campaign promise to implement universal free lunch for all public school students. This would help destigmatize school meals, resulting in more kids eating, cost savings for parents, and increased federal and state reimbursement. Um, next, I'm going to just highlight physical education and just echo what Erin said instead of going into all the details. We agree with everything that she mentioned. Um, summer programs. CCC is very disappointed that the preliminary budget failed to include funds to enable nearly 31,000 middle school students to attend summer programs this year. Our testimony includes a map by council district of these cuts. We urge the administration to restore these slots as soon as possible. Um, next, given the changes in federal law that strengthen requirements for educational stability for foster children, we urge the administration to require DOE and ACS to make a joint plan, fund transportation costs, and fund any additional administrative or social work costs to finally implementing educational stability requirements. We also urge the restoration of 2.4 million and add 2.6 million for restorative justice programs. Um, we echo what Randy said about MSWs to help homeless children. Um, and then lastly, we urge the administration to restore and baseline the initiative supported by the City Council in fiscal year 2016, and we hope the City Council will do so as well. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Well, thank you very much. It's good to hear everybody's on target with the 5 million for the restorative justice. Uh, so I assume you all got together and uh, came up with a good number there. Uh, we are going to fight for that moving forward, and uh, we'll see what we can come up with. You know, I can't guarantee anything now. Of course, we're just entering in to the beginning of the budget negotiations, and many of the issues that are raised by every member of the panel here now are issues of concern to this committee. So I do have one question, though. Um, one of the things I noticed in um, the Citizens Committee for Children is um, the call for the baselining of some of the council or all of those council initiatives. I worry a little bit about that because when we baseline it, we don't have as much control over it uh, and it becomes an administrative um, issue, particularly as regard to, with regard to the LGBT liaison because um, it's so new and I really want to continue to ensure that um, that is done right and since it's council money, we can direct it more forcefully than we can if it's in the baseline budget. So pretty much we're, we're on board with that. Some of that stuff I would like to see baseline. I'd like to see the DOE contribute to the um, teacher's choice money as well. I think that that would be very helpful. And I think they actually should be supplying those teachers with, with a minimal number of um, you know, pencils, markers, uh, paper and stuff already. But some of them I just have a little concern because I want to ensure that the programs are done the way that we would like them as the council to be done. And we would love to discuss those more with you. Sure, absolutely. So, all right. Um, I guess thank you very much, and uh, we'll call the next panel. Okay, Diana Feldman from Enact. Is she still here? I don't think so. I think she left. 
So give me another one there. Okay. Melissa Reiser or Risser from Urban Justice. An act? No? Okay. Lisa Levy from Hunger Free New York City. She's here? Yep. All right. Lily Wu, Teachers College Con Fellows Program. Is Lisa here? Okay. And um, Velatina Jones from the Lower East Side Power Partnership. Okay. So we've got to call a couple more. Alicia Arrington, Alliance for Quality Education. Is Alicia here? Okay, good. We got you. Okay. And one more, maybe. And Felicia Alexander from the Bedford uh, from the Coalition for Educational Justice. Okay, I'd just like to um, swear you all in, so if you'd raise your right hand, you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly. Okay, would you like to start? Yep. Hello, can you hear me? Is, that, is it close enough? Is, is that... Is the red light on? It's, the okay. red light is on, but I don't know if you... Can you, can you hear me? It's, hard, it's a little hard, but... I don't know, this might be the bad one. No, it's... Hello? Testing one, two. Yeah. Let me switch. I think this is a bad one. Hello? Can you hear me now? Better? Okay. Sorry. I, I didn't eat lunch. Sorry. Yes, hung, hunger is bad. Um, my name is Lisa Levy, and I'm, I'm the Director of Policy, Advocacy, and Organizing of Hunger Free New York City. I want to first thank Chair Drum for his work on behalf of people in need, as well as to the committee for inviting me to testify. As many of you already know, and, and as you can read in my submitted testimony, about one in five children in New York City struggles with hunger here in one of the richest cities in the world. During 2014-2015 school year, out of 73 large school districts, New York City ranked last in effectiveness in reaching low-income students with breakfast. Only 35.3% of students who received free or reduced price lunch also participated in the school breakfast program. We know that serving breakfast as part of the school day is the most effective way to ensure that children do not struggle to learn on an empty stomach. And thanks to the council and Mayor de Blasio, last year New York City began serving breakfast in the classroom to students in standalone elementary schools. While change can be difficult, we know this is a path worth following. As parents, teachers, and principals have attested to successes. With PS18 in the South Bronx seeing increases of more than double from 200 to 500 out of 600 kids total, eating a healthy breakfast in the classroom, this school will assuredly see hunger decrease this year. Similar increases have been seen citywide in schools where breakfast in the classroom has been implemented. Expansion to middle and high school for this effective program can only continue the momentum. Additionally, expanding the service of universal lunch, which was introduced by the City Council in 2014 to all standalone middle schools, should be on the agenda. Last summer, I distributed summer meals with the Council's own Vanessa Gibson at Cretona Pool in the, in the Bronx, along with Council Members Levine and Rosenthal in Manhattan, and visited Sunset Park Rec Center with Council Member Menchaca, Assembly Member Ortiz, and Senator Gillibrand, where eager kids enjoy, I'm gonna just finish up really quickly? Yes, just. Thank you. Where eager kids enjoyed healthy sandwiches and fruit. In 2015, this valuable program served 8.1 million meals, virtually the same number as it did in 2014, reaching only a quarter of the kids who eat free and reduced price lunch during the school year. Research shows that, that half the families don't, who don't participate don't know where sites are located or that the program even exists. We can improve this program 
and we appreciate the efforts of those who, who helped last year. Currently in our nation's capital, the bill to pay for these programs is being debated, the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Bill. I not only ask each of you to support the programs locally to assist children in New York City who struggle against hunger, but to let your members of Congress know that these programs are valuable to, eat to those in your districts. After all, it should be a, a priority that in a nation as wealthy as ours, no child should go hungry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. There you go. Good afternoon, Chair Drome and honorable members of the committee. My name is Lily Wu, and I'm the director of the Khan Fellows Program for Distinguished Public School Principals at Teachers College, Columbia University. I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, Chairman Drome for your previous support for Teachers College. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak before you today about a very important and transformational program that promotes educational excellence in our city schools. In listening to this morning's uh, testimonies uh, from Chancellor Farina and uh, Michael Milgrew, there has they express a very serious concern about not celebrating the good work of those in the schools as well as trying to um, reduce the amount of tr attrition of people leaving the system. The Khan Fellows Program for Distinguished Public School Principals, founded in 2002, emerged from the vision and generosity of Charles and Jane Khan. The Khan Fellows Program is a 13-month program that strengthens public schools by recognizing and celebrating its outstanding principles and aspiring principles and developing the capacities at least. The program en engages participants in a collaborative network of peers and develops their ability to improve school climate and culture, teacher effectiveness, and ultimately student learning and achievement. The program is housed at Teachers College, the nation's first and largest school of education that is affiliated with but financially independent from Columbia University. I can attest to the Khan Fellows' transformational power and believe in the, uh, that the program merits your support because I am the former principal of PS 130, the DeSoto School, a Title I school located in Chinatown, Little Italy area with approximately 1,100 children when I served as principal. Um, and I served there as principal for 25 years. So I know exactly what uh, Chancellor Farina and Michael Melgrew was, uh, was talking about. Um, at the time I took over in 1990, uh, the school was struggling with only 38% of the schools passing uh, standardized exams. Today it's become one of the uh, highest performing schools in New York City, ranking in the top 5% in New York uh, City and 10% in New York State. The program, the Khan Fellows Program is modeled um, on an evidence-based practice of, of the importance of school leaders. Research has shown that the most significant resource that schools contribute to academic success. Principals have a decisive impact on the school enrollment, achievement, and graduation rates. However, far too often the opportunities for exceptional principals to receive support, recognition, and the ability to network with other exceptional principals are very limited. And we try to um, address all of the uh, issues in terms of reducing the number of, uh, 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 of people who are leaving the system by providing that support. Our city educational system needs to provide critical support and leadership development to its most exceptional leaders. The Khan Fellow Program does this in the following manner. Each year, they solicit nominations from the Committee of Exemplary Principals and have, uh, who have completed at least three years in their position and who have shown outstanding leadership in their school communities and districts. They go through a rigorous vetting process and 20 to 25 candidates are selected each year. Once selected, the fellows are asked to select a mentee from their school building to work alongside them on an inquiry project that will benefit the school and maybe benefit other schools as well. Um, the program's focus is to increase leadership capacity in the school system, identify and cultivate new leaders, improve school performance. Through the use of uh, various pedagogical approaches designed to encourage critical reflection and perspective transformation, principals work to improve their schools and establish a pathway for leadership development of their mentees. Once principals have completed a rigorous program, they are awarded a certificate of completion. Since 2003, over 270 principals and 270 mentees have completed the program. And uh, research has shown that those who have gone through the program have uh, have achieved
better reading scores and math scores as well as improved student attendance than similar schools led by non-con fellow uh, principals. I first refer to my, my own experience as a principal. Um, had it not been for the Con Fellows program back in 2003, when I was in the first cohort, I might not have lasted the 25 years as principal, for exactly the reasons that Chancellor Farinha, Michael Melgrew had uh, attested to. At a time when I felt isolated and alone in my work, the program gave me renewed energy, really smart colleagues to call upon, and new strategies on how to take my school to the next level. I attribute much of my success as a school leader to the valuable insights that I gained through the program. After more than 40 years in the education and public education, I, rec I retired from the position and had the privilege of taking on the leadership role of this tremendously valuable organization. The uh, Con Fellows program is currently totally supported through corporate foundations and individual donations that are increasingly difficult to secure. The program strictly serves public schools, and in order to continue the program at no cost to participants in schools, we are respectfully asking for the Council's support so that these leaders can continue to benefit the children and community they serve. The, the Con Fellows Program for Distinguished Principals play an important and unique role in the landscape professional development for outstanding principals in New York City by supporting excellence and ensuring mentorship for tomorrow leaders and is fostering a better environment for educators and the thousands of children that they serve. Thank you for your support and consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Well, thank you very much, and I think it's really important what you had to say, because after 12 years of being beaten down by uh, previous administration uh, and being blamed, and teachers and administrators being blamed for everything that was wrong in the school system, uh, it's really time that we turn that situation around and show our teachers and principals how much they really appreciate it for what they do and offer them support for the things that they need, you know. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay, next please. Hello. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alicia Arrington. I'm the Communications Coordinator with the Alliance for Quality Education in New York City. Um, last year, the City Council decided to pass the controversial Intro 65 amidst, amidst pushback, uh, police testimony, and other, giving nearly $20 million to private institutions. When asked why, the response constituents received was that New York City was flush with cash, uh, making it no issue to hand out millions of public dollars to private institutions. So now, since New York City is so flush with cash, it should be no issue to fund educational initiatives that would benefit our youth, many from areas that unfortunately cannot say that there is an overwhelming influx of funds. Um, the Parent Engagement Innovation Fund calls for only $2.5 million, not nearly the $20 million that the city was able to give away last year, and the Restorative Justice Initiative calls for only $5 million for a whopping total of $7.5 million to go towards positive initiatives to benefit those that are not flush with cash. The difference that parent-teacher engagement makes and the impact that it has on a child's education has been widely acknowledged for so quite some time now. However, though building school communities and raising student achievement has been at the forefront of many of the city's educational initiatives, the parent engagement piece that is so integral to the success of these programs has not. Um, the Parent Engagement Innovation Fund calls for transformative parent engagement that will acknowledge and support the child holistically by not only considering but also engaging their family. This step to more effectively strengthen the ties between families and school staff as well as including parents as partners in their child's education has the power to boost student achievement and parent power. It has been proven through research and example that an actively engaged parent can make all the difference in the world and that the programs that the Parent Engagement Innovation Fund calls for, like parent-teacher home visits, academic parent-teacher teams, parent education empowerment partners, and parent university will only set the standard for what it means to have transformative parent engagement. New York City should take the opportunity to become a model for this movement. A city so flush with cash should have no issue spending the measly $2.5 million to fund this initiative that can implement innovative programs for the betterment of our students. Another initiative that would no doubt go towards the betterment and uplifting of our students is an investment in restorative justice practices. As many learned minds, including President Barack Obama, have recognized, the school-to-prison pipeline has very much, is very much real and an endangerment to our black and Latino youth. It would be a travesty for New York City, which prides itself on being a forward-thinking city, to undermine these claims. 
Last year, there were over 44,000 suspensions and nearly 800 arrests and summonses issued to students whom were disproportionately black, Latino, LGBTQ, or students with disabilities. Again, while educating, it would be a travesty to, to disregard the student holistically as a person with outside experiences and emotions impacting their being and more specifically their behavior. What restorative justice aims to do is retain the dignity of our students while providing a safe and respectful learning environment for all students. It is important to consider that a large portion of punitive measures taken in New York City for small, are for small or arbitrary violations like insubordination or disruption, both of which have been proven to be normal adolescent behavior. We have to work to take a step back and really examine our practices and whether or not they are supporting our youth, especially our black and Latino youth who face institutionalized racism outside of the classroom to ensure that this does not continue inside our schools. Restorative justice calls for the training of our teachers as well as full-time school-based coordinators in order to combat these, um, these issues. Again, as a city that should be forward thinking and especially as a city that is flush with cash, it should not take a second thought to support these initiatives that would drive us forward and create better learning environments for all of our public schools. Thank you. Again, thank you for reminding me so much of uh, what one of my colleagues on the city council said about being flush with cash. So if we had that $20 million that we gave away to the private schools, uh, we wouldn't have to be begging for an extra $2.6 million for restorative justice. We probably wouldn't have to be begging for money for additional food programs. I mean, just think of all the things that we could have done with that $20 million instead of giving it away to private schools. And, 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 and I have to tell you, it infuriated me that that was done. And probably nothing more has happened in the council. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're not supposed to clap, but thank you for that, because there's nothing that upset me more as chair of this committee than to see that $20 million be given away to private schools when we have so many needs here. It made me wonder how many people, how many of my colleagues have been into a public school to see what's really going on. But thank you for reminding us of that. Don't even get me started because I'll go crazy with that. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak before you. My name is Felicia Alexander, and I am a mother of four beautiful and smart young children that attend public school in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. I am a parent leader at CEJ, the Coalition for Educational Justice, and I'm here requesting that the Parent Engagement Innovation Fund be supported by the council in conjunction with DOE. The fund would support parent-teacher home visits where two teachers will make 30-minute visits to families at their homes to build relationships which will allow for mutual trust and respect to be established. Academic parent-teacher teams are an innovative approach to parent-teacher conferences where there will be three 75-minute classroom meetings a year where parents will learn about what their children need to accomplish to be promoted and are trained in how to help their children reach these goals at home. This links home and school learning and makes the most of parent-teacher conferences. PEEPS, the Parent Education and Empowerment Partners, develops parent skills from trainings on school curriculum and strategies for aiding struggling students and then placing them in the overcrowded classrooms. Parents would then, after completing 100 hours, have the opportunity to become certified and gain some college credits. Finally, Parent University would be a series of workshops, workshops and trainings that would train parents, school staff, and teachers together and would funnel parents into a pipeline of different leadership roles. I personally have witnessed the positive experiences from parents and students regarding these educational initiatives that are currently being jointly funded by the DOE and the City Council. One of them, the Middle School Quality Initiative, has benefited and flourished from the City Council's involvement and support over the last 10 years. And we want the Parent Engagement Innovation Fund to follow this model. The mayor and the chancellor have both repeatedly addressed and acknowledged that parent engagement is a crucial component for a school and for its students to succeed. CEJ recognizes and appreciates the shift of this administration from the previous one and the efforts being done to restructure faith. CEJ is now requesting that the DOE and the city reinforce these sentiments by funding these four proven research-based models. 
These models would have an impact on the 95% of parents that are otherwise not engaged or involved with any school governance structures such as the SLT or CEC. Everyday parents would be able to be active participants in their children's education. When parents are engaged, it has positive effects in that grades improve, standardized test scores are raised, attendance is increased, and behavior is improved. There has been no administration in New York City that has ever really invested in research proven models of parent engagement. This current administration has the opportunity to set a precedent for future administrations by not only recognizing the relevance of parents being meaningfully engaged, but by stepping up and establishing funding for these models to expand them and sustain them. New York City can be at the forefront of innovative educational programming and be a model for the country to follow. As I said at the beginning, I have four young children, one who is autistic. I have served on the PTA and I have been a CEC president. I sit on Community Board 3 and co-chair the board's Youth and Education Committee. I am an involved and active parent. My school district is District 16, which is struggling and looking at a lot of consolidations and school closings. The children in my district deserve a chance to reach their full potential. There are many brilliant, intelligent children who are not being given the chance. The parents are disenfranchised and apathetic because of being shut out repeatedly from their schools. They have been viewed as problems and liabilities instead of as assets. These programs could help turn my district around. Please provide the supports needed for our children to get what they deserve, which is a quality education in a supportive environment that nurtures not only the child, but their families and communities as well. I thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you very much. And uh, the one thing I learned as a New York City public school teacher for 25 years is that any time a parent got involved in their child's education in any way, shape, or form, that child always improved. So it's really, really crucial to seeing that student improvement occur. So thank you. We're going to really look at this more closely, and then hopefully during the budget, back and forth, we can do something for our parents. Thank you. Thank you to this panel. Thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate it. I'm going to call our next panel. Barbara Harris from, Granny, from the Granny Peace Brigade. Aminata Abdurrahman Bushwick Campus Youth Food Policy Council. Dion Hao Zeng from Tina Genic. Francis Lewis High School, is she here? Or he here? Uh -huh. tell, tell him, yeah. Okay, so when he comes in, we'll, we'll, we'll do it, okay? okay. Liz Ackless from the Community Food Advocates. Liz is not here yet? Okay, we'll do that in a minute. You have the other one, Rosie. Oh, Rosie Espadas from the Coalition for Educational Justice. Rosio here? There she is. Okay. Yep. All right. Here's Liz. Okay, if you'd all raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. 
You solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly. Okay, Liz, do you want to start? Good afternoon. I'm Liz Ackles, the Executive Director of Community Food Advocates. Thank you, Councilman Drum, for uh, giving me an opportunity to testify today. Um, as usual, I'm here to talk about universal free school lunch and want to make a few points um, of particular importance, um, both in our work and in response to um, the Chancellor's testimony. I want to bring to your attention um, I, I want to first thank you and the City Council for being a ch the champions along with the public advocate on the issue of universal free school lunch and we are really counting on you all this year to make sure that this happens um, expansion to all students in the budget process. Uh, I want to bring to your attention the, um, the parent caucus letter that was sent uh, by parent, New York City public school parent leaders to Mayor de Blasio on February 18th. As you will see, it is signed by a huge representation of the parent leadership body within the New York City Department of Education system. There is incredible um, interest and momentum on this issue. Some of my colleagues are here in the audience. Um, and um, there's additional testimony attached. I want to just make a few points. Um, the letter asks for the mayor to keep his, his campaign promise and to fulfill that promise in the executive budget. Um, parent leaders know firsthand in every neighborhood throughout the city, even those neighborhoods that people don't expect, that there are families and children who are struggling to make ends meet and children who go without food or limited food if they aren't able to eat adequately in school. This is a big issue and we don't think that the administration is registering the level of parent interest and support on this. And given the big focus of the administration and the Department of Education on parent um, engagement, not paying attention to this letter we think is very significant. Um, I, I want to just say three very quick points. One is we don't think there's anything left standing in the way of expansion to all students. There's over a 7% increase in participation in middle schools. There's been no negative impact on Title I allocations. And, and the city estimated a cost of $6 million in middle schools and that the cost last year was below $1 million. We also think that the the, the response of the mayor and the chancellor on the, the numbers not being enough is disingenuous. Um, this is a Department of Education program. It's in their hands to, to help maximize the impact and participation. And so it's not in the council, it's not in the advocates' hands, it's in the, the hands of the, the agency running the program. I have more to say, but my time has run out. You know, I just want to ask you though, the chancellor said it's up 6%, right? Yes. Is that, you heard that, right? When you were here? Yes. So um, she seems to think that wasn't that significant of a number, but to me, if you can get it up 6% last year, it's only going to go up further as years go along. And that's what's proven true in schools with Universal across the city and across the country, and that's why I use the word, and I don't say it lightly, disingenuous, because we think that's kind of a throwaway discard line, and that for any other program in the first year, if it went up 6%, that would be seen as successful, and I'm sure you could go through any transcripts of the mayor's speeches to find that. And um, so we don't buy it. The parents don't buy it. Our coalition of over 200 organizations don't, don't buy that. That's the reason, and we really think, given the other pieces of information, a small amount of additional city money could reach every student in, in every neighborhood throughout the city. So you don't buy it, and I don't understand it, but uh, we'll work together on, on trying to figure it out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Thanks. Next, please. Hello. Hello. Thank you for um, allowing me today to um, testify. Um, my name is Rocio Espadas. Um, I am a parent of two children at CS123 in Bushwick, Brooklyn. I am also a member of Make the Road New York and the Coalition for Educational Justice. 
I am testifying to Access City Council and Department of Education to support the Parent Engagement Innovation Fund this year um, of the city's budget. Every, everyone says they want more parent engagement in schools, but then they don't provide support that the schools need to do that. This year, the principal at my children's school is very open and welcoming to parents. Anytime that you want to come and talk to her about anything, she will invite you to come sit down and talk. She is always there talking to parents outside, um, outside the school, saying goodbye to children. When you have a principal like that, you want to come and know what's going on in the schools. It makes a big difference. The principal we had last year was very different. Parents couldn't talk to her directly. She wouldn't give you attitude. I wasn't really happy about that. So I didn't get involved, to be honest. Um, and I know that that's the case in many schools. Parents get attitude when they call or go in. There aren't translators to help them or school staff. They take forever to call them back. My experience has shown me that schools need more enthusiastic and positive staff so parents will free, feel welcome to come. And many school staff do not know how to interact with parents. Thus, that's why CEJ is asking the council and the DOE to create a parent university to provide leadership development to parents, but also to principals and school staff and how to interact with parents if they don't have the knowledge. Many parents have passions and interest in getting involved with their children in school, but the school is very limited in being able to help, to help to do that. And some principals and school staff want more parents' involvement in their schools, but they do not know how to make that happen. Parents University, University can help train both of them to work together. One of the other models that CEJ is advocating for is called Academic Parent-Teacher Teams, APTT, and it's a type of parent-teaching conferences where parents meet as a group and learn how to teach their kids at home. There are a lot of parents who don't know math, for example, they don't know how to go about to help their kids. With APTT, they go in the classrooms and learn what the teachers do with their kids and take home the games that they can do at home to help support that learning. This model benefits the parents and kids because they are both learning together. If you believe that parents' engagement is important, then please back that up with funds for programs like this that have shown to really increase parents' engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Amina Abdurrahman and I am currently a 12th grader in the Academy of Urban Planning at Bushwick Campus in Brooklyn. Thank you, Council Member Drum and the ed Educational Committee for your continued support on, on universal free school lunch. And as a student who has been fighting for this issue for three years now, I am also here to urge the mayor to expand this program. Imagine someone who has been trying to stay on scene for the longest time in a hide and seek game. You may be asking, who is this person and why exactly are they hiding? This scenario I am talking about is not just a hypothetical one. It is a reality that plays out in school cafeterias throughout New York City. This person in this scenario tries their best to not show any evidence at all of their hiding area. And why exactly are they hiding? Because they don't want to be seen by any other members of the game. Why not? Because if that does happen, they lose. In the case of school lunch, many students play this exact game, hiding and not wanting to be seen. The only difference is that hide and seek is fun, but applying this game to school lunch is really not. Why do students not want to be seen on the lunch line? Because of the fear of getting caught. And why? Because many there are many reasons to answer that. Let's go through some of the main points. One, it is a social class system which is reinforced by the school lunch process. And two, this is where stigma and bullying occurs. All over the world, the model is treat people the way you want to be treated. However, this model does not at all exist in our school cafeterias. Instead, name calling, put downs, bullying, labeling students, and etc. exists. 
Can you believe that this actually happens in school? People, students are ashamed to get late to get up and get lunch. What if they're hungry? What if that lunch is the only one they have for the entire day? What if their parents don't have to give them money to buy lunch? Then what? The obvious the answer is obvious. They stay hungry for that whole day until hopefully they get home and eat something. The actual reason why students don't get online for lunch in school is because they are afraid to get caught eating what our world knows now as free free. Getting labeled or being bullied for being a free free eater is like getting labeled as an outcast. And being an outcast in school without universal free school lunch means that everybody knows who you are in a very negative way. It has the same stigma as a person who is homeless and is also on public assistance. You can believe what I'm saying to be credible because I was a victim and I still am a witness of this. I know that this is not what the Department of Education was aiming for, but this is what actually happens in school cafeterias. Students should have all the resources and nourishment they need in order to reach their potential. And as a graduating senior of 2016, I want to make sure that, that my years of fighting for universal free school lunch will banish the free free stigma once and for all. As our city's leader, Mayor de, Bir Mayor, Mayor de Blasio has the power to do this, and I urge him to take a stand for all New York City public school students. Thank you very much. And thank you also, and thank you for coming in and sharing your viewpoint as a 12th grader. It's pretty amazing. But isn't it unbelievable that we have this country is so rich and so much food in this country that we have to fight for free lunches? It just doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Barbara. Uh, thank you for having me testify. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. Barbara, just pull I... that mic a little closer okay. so we can get you. And have, have the opportunity to address the funding allocation for the Mayor's Expense Budget 2016 for Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps and urge the Council members to vote to reallocate the approximately $1.4 million tax levy allocated for the program in 18 public high schools. And sitting here today, I heard of so many important projects and programs that need $1.5 million to continue and excel. And here we are supporting a military uh, program in our school. And for many reasons, we should not be, as taxpayers, supporting it. The cost of the program is $1.5 million to the city and to us as taxpayers. Instructors are not employees of the New York City Department of Education, but rather employees of the federal government. And this sets a troubling precedent of having individuals who do not possess the requisite qualifications to be a teacher in the New York City system, yet are engaged in teaching high school students. And each school with a JROTC program hires at least two military instructors for their unit which means that unlike any other subjects in the class, two are teaching a program. These instructors are not required to have the same training or credentials as mandated for most New York City teachers, but pay the same salaries and benefits. The question on instructors has not been answered by Chancellor Farina yet. Is there a teacher examination for the test or is it bypassed? Are JROTC instructors observed during class hours? Are they supervised? And do they receive a review from the high school administration? And we know the answer is no. The program is con 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 contradicts uh, educational theory because it's ascribed as developing leadership, but the curriculum has no data that it is a discipline program. It focuses on military values and hierarchy, the idea of soldiering, following commands, fitness and drills, and curriculum is developed by the military. The Department of Education does not control or oversee what is taught and appears to be out of the loop. Teaching is contra the teaching process is uh, contradictory to educational theory as it promulgates a highly authoritarian approach to information that discourages criticism and glorifies the unbroken, unbroken chain of command. The program's heavy emphasis on drills signifies this approach. The curriculum is not consistent with teachings of democratic values, conflict resolution, and collaboration. It conflicts with the educational goal of encouraging students to learn through developmental thinking, examining and questioning historical and current events. 
Do you as members of the Education Committee prefer students responding to lessons with yes sir, no sir? Or do you prefer students to ask why? Should students be encouraged to find their individual voices, not group think through regimentation? And Chancellor Farina this morning referred to debate teams and speaking in class and wanting our children to have this, in, this kind of experience to speak out about, uh, with their own thoughts. But the most troubling for me is that weapons are used in the program contradicting educational directives. The JROT students are given uniforms and facsimile rifles which are used for drills, parades, and assembly programs. Each member of the JROTC marches into assemblies in uniform carrying rifles. Is this not hypocritical of the current school regulation of zero tolerance of guns or weapons of any sort in the school? JROTC sends the wrong message about weapons. Students cannot bring weapons into school, but they can read and learn about and handle them in JROTC programs. Currently, uh, there's an anti-gun violence campaign and project, and Mayor de Blasio and the City Council have invested $19.9 million in comprehensive strategies to reduce gun violence and collaborated in a citywide anti-gun violence initiative throughout the five boroughs. In the 2016 City Council Allocation Funding Document, more than $550,000 has been allocated to school-based conflict mediation and anti-violence programs, including in the SAGA project to teach anti-gun violence and conflict resolution strategies in classrooms. How confused can a student be? JROTC students carry and display rifles, guns are for drills and competitions, war becomes a game. What's going on in the public school high schools? How do you balance these two models? Chancellor Farina has not answered to this question also about the permission to use JROTC rifles in schools. And we know that homework, uh, teamwork, camaraderie, and new challenges are a strong part of alternative programs to add to students' learning, both education and social. Do we want this? I don't know this is small, but this is JROTC at a Veterans Day parade, carrying their rifles in the streets. This is a group of students that are in a robotics project. Some are from Morris High School and other high schools. They're from the Bronx, where I come from. <laughs> and they, are up, they, are, they learn technology, they learn teamwork, they learn camaraderie, and they have uh, gone to Javits Center to be part of the uh, final challenge. Uh, a very exciting program. We should have one of these in every school or at least in every borough uh, for $1.5 million. Here's the girls basketball team from South, South Sound High School in Brooklyn who won, this is from 1950, a picture of them. They won the championship. They were awarded and given an award right here in this room, and each one stood up and named the college she was going to. They had learned teamwork, they had gotten self-esteem, they were en energized, and they, their studies and academics were raised. And here's a, from the anti-gun violence program, which is in each community, uh, a coach an advocate working with students in the community, in the boroughs, in the five boroughs, to end gun violence, to stop what's going on. And they're being successful. The program in the schools as well is very successful. Now, Barbara, I'm going to have to cut you I off. I know. Right here. So you can cut me off, but. Okay. Um, I, I want to say, um, you know, I do support your efforts. I, know. I appreciate you coming out every <laughs> year that I've been here to continue the struggle. I believe in your struggle. Right. I have serious questions about students carrying facsimile guns in the schools when it violates the zero tolerance policy right. for guns. I did ask the chancellor that question as well. Right. Um, the chancellor said she would be willing to discuss it. I'm going to take her up on that right. and talk with her and maybe start from that angle as well. And what but, is the um, curriculum as well? But we really do love the uh, Granny Peace Brigade and Thanks. we appreciate the fact that um, you've come out again and and stuck with us and, and continue to fight for this. Thank you. I also represent the 22 organizations who have signed on. 
and, and you've been doing wonderful work. And, um, and it's, you ask very valid and true questions that really need to be answered. And if we believe in restorative practices, if we believe in peace and justice, if we believe in the things that we say we're teaching our students, why do we continue to allow this situation to go on in certain high schools? I deeply appreciate it. And the other concern. question is this, Barbara, yeah. is um, if they were adults over the age of 18, yeah, right. it might even be a different story. But many of these people are younger than that. Absolutely. And I think that's a question to be asked as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, our next panel. Okay. Isaiah Paolino, Sisters and Brothers United. Uh, Brendan Potter, Sisters and Brothers United, I'm sorry. Uh, Potter, I'm sorry. Jose Angeles, Sisters and Brothers United. And Robina Talia Ferroco. Ferro, sorry about that. Talia Ferro, Billion Oyster Project. Okay, I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, very good. Would you like to start? Yes. Good afternoon, my name is Rabina Taliaferro. I'm the Billion Oyster Project, Project Schools Liaison for the New York Harbor Foundation, a marine restoration ed education organization that supports the New York Harbor School on Governors Island and runs the Billion Oyster Project. I would like to thank the chair of the, of the Education Committee Council Member, Daniel Jones, and the entire committee for giving me this opportunity. I would also like to thank the Department of Education for their continued partnership and support and would like to express my support for the Council's efforts to further collaboration with the DOE to bring more STEM programs like the Billion Oyster Project to public schools citywide. The Harbor Foundation has requested $100,000 from the Speaker for Fiscal 17 and would like the support of the Education Committee to help bring the Billion Oyster Project to 40 more middle schools citywide. We live and work in a city of islands that surround the third most active port in the country. Yet many New Yorkers do not identify as living on the water. The Port of New York employs 300,000 people, yet fewer than 12% of them went to public schools in New York City. SUNY Maritime in the Bronx has a near 100% job placement for graduates who earn an average starting salary of almost $70,000. 85% of SUNY Maritime students are white, and 85% come from outside of the five boroughs. Meanwhile, our natural ecosystem is massively degraded. New York Harbor was once one of the most biologically productive places on Earth. The engines of that productivity were the oysteries, now gone as a result of overharvesting and pollution. Oysters filter the water. They provide food and habitat for thousands of species. They stabilize the harbor floor and protect our shorelines during extreme weather. We have a generation of young people who have been denied knowledge about and access to real, well-paying careers in the marine industry. Our school system is on the hunt for exciting inquiry-led STEM learning opportunities, and our massively deteriorated natural ecosystem is in the need of their help. In the Billion Oyster Project, the New York Harbor Foundation has developed a system for addressing these needs by engaging students directly in the challenging work of restoring New York Harbor. Our primary educational partner is the New York Harbor School on Governor's Island, where students are integral to the work of oyster restoration through their career and technical education programs and are engaged with city and state agencies, dozens of nonprofits and commercial firms on a number of large-scale restoration and research projects. They are also joined by over 50 other schools, 30 of which are public schools, throughout the five boroughs that represent 25 city council districts. Each year, over 6,000 new middle school and high school students are engaged through a robust educational program that is scalable and inexpensive, funded in large part by the National Science Foundation. At each school, students participate in hands-on inquiry-led science and math lessons through a curriculum that aligns with the New York City scope and sequence and leverages the performance expectations of the next generation science standards. In addition, students and teachers work with live oysters at restoration stations near waterfront sites where they collect research data that is shared through a cloud-based digital platform that connects all 50 schools. 
This committee support in prioritizing $100,000 from the speaker for the citywide expansion of the Billion Oyster Project during the year's budget will help make harbor literacy a reality for thousands of middle school students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jose Angeles. I am a senior and analyst. Jose, director. could you pull that a little closer? Yeah, of course. All right. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jose Angeles, a Bellis Repository Academy. I, came, I am a young leader and sister of Brothers United from the Bronx. In 2015, only 36% of students entering my college were college ready. I came, to the, I came to this country two years ago because I wanted to get a college education. My bigger obstacle has been learning English. Why the English? I don't have a base of English from my country that helped me out here to defend myself and to be able to go to college. My first year at Ellis, I met a Malone who was, um, who was a college um, student. He motivated me to know if I, um, he, um, I started to learn English that I could enter to college like him. I learned a lot because he was a Dominican guy like myself. Um, I went through similar um, he went through similar struggles as me. I've been my honor to attend to a school that has met some of my similar academy needs. However, like any school, we want the Department of Education to invest more in more schools. We need more support learning English to be able to attend a four-year college. We want to be able to take classes levels before we graduate high school. We need more support in passing the, the state exam of um, SAT. We want people to stop dropping out of school because, because they are discouraged that they can learn the language. We are asking that the DOE invest in the summer bridge programs that will train college students to return to their high school. To support, we, to support, we need graduates complete financial aid documents, restructuring for classes, filling out paperwork, I'm staying on track to start college in the fall. The DOE should provide funding and support high school to implement summer reach to college programs at the all NYC high school. As a students, we want to get ready for college. We just need your support to get ready. Thank you so much. Jose, did you uh, provide uh, any copies of your written testimony? If I provide many copies? Uh, any copies? You no, no, I didn't provide. Yeah, okay, I would really appreciate that, so All we right. can uh, hold on to it and look at it a little bit later. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for, and for sticking around. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brandon Parker. I attend Validus Preparatory Academy. I am a member of the Urban Youth Collaborative, Youth Advocates, Youth Allies, and a member of and a le Youth Leader at Sisters and Brothers United. I want City Council and the DOE to increase support for student success centers and college bridge programs because student-based programs or initiatives have been proven to increase the college going rates for blacks, Latinos, and students on track of becoming first-generation college students in their family. Student success, student, student success centers and college bridge programs help train high school students to act as college advisors while providing them with a stipend. Student success centers also help our high school students lacking the resources the knowledge and the support they need to make informed co to make to apply to college and make informed decisions. Yeah. Even with graduation rates going up in the city, too many black and Latino students are being left behind. We are asking that additional funding is allocated towards creating four new student success centers while keeping the current eight the current eight success centers serving eighteen high schools and two middle schools. We need to expand the College Bridge Program to include 20 more high schools. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And the uh, same thing, if we can get some written testimony, that would be great. Next, please. All right, good afternoon. Hello. My name is Isaiah Polino. I attend Valley's Preparatory Academy, located on the Bathgate campus in the Bronx. I am a member of the Urban Youth Collaborative, Youth Advocates, Youth Allies, a youth leader at Sisters and Brothers United. Sisters and Brothers United is a youth-led social justice organization consisting of middle school and high school students in the Northwest Bronx. I'm here today to speak up because the Department of Education has been unfairly suspending and pushing kids headfirst into the school-to-prison pipeline. The Department of Education is partaking in racial unjust practices that push youth into the criminal justice system instead of higher education. 
why is it that black and Hispanic students make up 89% of all students that are suspended, but only 67% of all students, and almost 100% of all students that are arrested? I know the answer, institutional and structural racism. I'm lucky that in my school, we have a well, wellness success center where students have a place to seek guidance from adults regarding school and personal problems. City Council needs to also allocate funding towards providing students with a service and resources that we deserve. We need solutions that address institutional and structural racism and investment in restorative justice and investment for teachers in anti-racism, gender, LGBTQ training is one of the solutions. Currently, New York City employs 5,400 school safety agents and only employs 3,800 social workers and guidance counselors combined. We have 1,600 more school safety agents than social workers and guidance counselors combined. The DOE spends $4 million. It's not about having the money, it's about what we spend the money on. The Department of Education's new investment in restorative justice is a good start, but the DOE is still not taking on racism and bias. With help from the City Council to expand last year's restorative adjustment investment, we can finally begin to address racism and bias. Investing in policing instead of restorative justice is an investment towards com uh, criminalizing of black and brown youth. Research has shown that police and schools do not create a safe environment, but leads to a higher number of students being arrested and receiving criminal summonses. We are asking that support for restorative adjustment practices in our schools is expanded with an investment of $5 million in the next faculty year, including funding to hire restorative justice coordinators with additional funding towards trainings for teachers in restorative justice practices. The training should also be expanded to include racism, justice, gender justice, and of culture awareness trainings. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> do any of the uh, students here, do you, uh, the schools that you go to, do you have any restorative justice programs in your school? Inside of my school, Valdez Preparatory Academy, we used to have a well-trained restorative justice team for peer mediation, but since we have a new principal now, the restorative justice that we once had has been starting to def deflate and starting to leave. So now more students have been getting suspended and expelled for minor infractions within my school for countless reasons. Uh, you get the school. Yeah. Can you just say the school again? That is Preparatory Academy. Okay. What about the other students? No restorative justice programs in your school? No. Do you have any um, gay straight alliances in your school? In um, Valdez Preparatory Academy, we actually do. We hold um, a GSA meeting every week on Fridays after school. If it's not on Fridays, it's usually some other time throughout the week. It's held by the students for the students so then we can all feel safe and secure within our own student body. And that continues in your school? Yes, it does. Uh -huh. And what about the other guys? I you know? happen to be an active member of the student government body, which works with GSA. Oh, great. Yeah. And your school? Um, no, we don't have any programs. And what school are you? I'm Ellis Preparatory Academy. What? Ellis Preparatory Academy. Yeah. Um, that's the Kennedy campus. Okay, good. All right, I mean, I just think those are, those are important components to have in school, so that's why I'm asking that question. But I really thank you for your testimony, and if you guys could provide me with some written testimony, I would really appreciate it. All right. Thank you for coming in. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to have to ask, move people along more quickly. I'm sorry, folks, because we're going to get booted here at about 5, 5 p.m., so uh, I need to move this along. Lisa Robb from the Center for Arts Education. William Crow from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Jennifer Becker from Wave Hill. And Sammy Chamez from Flushing Town Hall. I have a feeling that these arts organizations 
may have a better way to spend $20 million than uh, on some private schools, but I won't get you involved in that argument. <laughs> All right, I have to swear you in, so can you raise your right hand, please? And you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly. I do. I do. Okay, very good. Would you like to start over here? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. It is so great to be here today. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, I, don't, I see there aren't other members of the council. I thank the staff that are here. It's nice to uh, visit with you today. I'm Lisa Robb. I'm the executive director at the Center for Arts Education. I'm new at my job. I'm so excited. This is my first hearing. I'm just leaving uh, four years of state service at the Council on the Arts for New York State. And in that job, along with all the other work in arts, culture, heritage I've done, I see that arts ed in pre-K classrooms are a powerful curriculum area. They deliver results. They deliver the promises they should to students, teachers, and school leaders. I'm so glad to hear already today ballet has been mentioned, architecture, music, and dance. And it's so great to be in a room like this to talk about the value of artistic training for citizens in New York City because we're just surrounded by it in this room. It is so beautiful to look up and see that painting. I want to talk about good news. Um, the investment in 2014 in a variety of measures around arts learning and arts education and professional training and sort of a comprehensive approach to how to think about arts learning is uh, bearing a great result. We're very pleased about that and we're so pleased it was baselined, although it was real interesting to hear your comments about the danger in baselining, but nonetheless, it's wonderful. Get it out early, five million is a great number today. We hope that that funding can be increased by five million, why? We got good news in December of 15. Department of Education released the annual Arts in the Schools report for 1450. And the most important thing to mention is significant progress to uh, addressing inequity in the delivery of arts learning participation and opportunities in schools. Hundreds of schools are benefiting, tens of thousands of students. Why? 175 new arts teachers. Also speaking to one of your earlier points, these teachers are working in school in uh, buildings that may have multiple schools and they may be working with multiple schools. They may be working in multiple locations. It's a really shrewd way to make that investment. That's a 7% increase. That's a 7% increase, uh, which is uh, significant and demonstrable in terms of how important that funding was. We already hear this year from Paul King, who is the great manager of that arts ed unit at DOE. We have 125 new teachers, so that's 300 new art specialists, and that's helping to deal with some of these historic inequities. Another important finding in that study was principals and school leaders allocated nine million more precious dollars to arts learning. This shows that the investment in professional learning for school leaders is also paying off for the 1.1 million children. Cultural partnerships I know can be talked about by my colleagues that are up here. Eighty-seven percent of the schools have some kind of a cultural partnership. That is wonderful news. We want that to be a hundred percent. That's an easy hundred percent. Some of the others are more difficult. I want to echo uh, your comments, Chair uh, Drum, on increasing participation, not just access. I want to echo the comments of the Chancellor about supporting what works and what delivers results that we can measure and see are bearing um, down to pay back on the investments that we're making with these public dollars. And I want to echo Mr. Mulgrew's comments to say this kind of funding strengthens communities and we want to make sure that our communities are strong along with our schools. Um, I'm also pleased today to be here with our colleagues because we know that interagency work is important for every agency and every city council committee. And we, uh, we hope that uh, funding increases to DCLA because of all the work that they do uh, in classrooms serving families and children. In closing, I want to again talk about our mission, which is serving 1.1 million students, uh, advocating for that. We want them all to be participating several times every week in arts learning, integrated arts learning, chorus programs, instrumental music, dance, theater, 
visual arts, all of those things deserve our support and those resources will help us achieve better results. Uh, we'll continue to do our work advocating um, and to collect data, to educate, to collect stories and to support this goal. Thank you for uh, having, oh wait, one thing. There was one, there was one aspect of the uh, report that came out in June of 15 which is of concern and we're trying to figure out where the data collection might be part of this confusing information. The information in December did show a drop from 55% to 38% for a percentage of schools requiring elementary level arts education, which we know early, early access can bear fruit over a longer period of time. We hope that that's part of the new reporting system um, and we're going to look at that and we'll make sure that if it really is a decline um, that, we continue, we'll, that we advocate to make sure we move that needle. And again, in closing, we do hope that five million more dollars can be allocated to this broad, comprehensive approach to arts ed because it will deliver results for you, results that will make us all proud of the achievements that these kids are having every day in their schools and Thank their classrooms. You. Yep. Hi. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Drum and the members of the Committee on Education. My name is William Crow. I'm the Managing Museum Educator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, where I oversee our work with pre-K through 12 students and educators and I'm really honored to present testimony today um, really on behalf of all New York City school children and communities. Um, as you may know, the Metropolitan Museum receives over six million visitors every year and of those, we offer about 28,000 programs to an audience of about 700,000 people. Um, in fact, last year we welcomed over 136,000 students from New York City. Um, through our programs, including professional learning programs uh, for thousands of educators. Um, even though these are large numbers, of course, impressive numbers, I really am here today to speak about the impact that we see among educators, among students and school communities when they're working in partnership with cultural institutions and with the Department of Education. Um, I'm sure as many people know, um, in the past, schools may have thought of cultural institutions and museums as really being a type of field trip, you know, especially as we're now in the spring, schools thought of that as a reward for students or um, a way of just getting out of the classroom. And of course now we know that museums and cultural institutions are not just sites for field trips but really are essential partners in supporting the work that we all have, um, our shared goal of student achievement and our shared goal of having these young people grow into engaged, critical, participatory citizens in New York City. Um, I would also cite that recent empirical studies really support that even a single visit to a museum or cultural institution can support students' um, confidence in taking advantage of those institutions, their critical thinking skills, of course their content knowledge, um, but even their uh, perspective taking or tolerance of others. And so I also would make sure that the council is aware of those other benefits that museums offer in terms of um, seeing young people's well-rounded experiences and having museums as part of that. Um, I know that I also speak for many other museums and culturals in the city when I say that we really celebrate and support the vision of Schools Chancellor Carmen Farina to tap cultural institutions. As a museum educator, I know I speak for many of my colleagues by saying we are here um, to support the work of the city and the youth of the city, whether that is through visits to schools or to our museums or family and community engagement activities, teen drop-in programs or professional learning um, and was delighted to hear about professional learning still being at the center of this city's administration. Um, we see that when we have opportunities to have in-depth experiences with educators such as guided practice or modeling or working with educators over an extended period of time aligned with the goals of the city, uh, we see progress uh, in our work and the impact that we have. Um, we're really fortunate at the Met to work very closely with the Chancellor but also um, the Office of the Arts and Special Projects of course, 
social studies, District 75, family and community engagement, and others. Um, so just in closing, I would say that as you consider the financial resources that are available to museums, cultural institutions, but the Department of Education, um, in the case of this budget, um, to really keep all of us front of mind as essential partners in this work, and we greatly value your support um, in this endeavor. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Sammy. Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. And uh, I have to say it's great to be up here with a couple of our partners. We've long been a partner with the Center for Arts Ed uh, in advocacy, and we've participated in Teens Take the Met since its beginning. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to skip around a little bit with my testimony. Um, Flushing Town Hall is a member of New York's CIG, one of many cultural, cultural institutions that have stepped in to fill the gap created by the significant losses of arts education programs in New York City schools over recent decades. So we applaud the recent increases to DOE's budget specific to arts ed, and we hope both the council administration will go farther. For more than 20 years, Flushing Town Hall has captivated imaginations and broadened students' arts education experience, providing meaningful connections between classroom subject areas and the arts. Over the past year, we offered 58 educational programs and events to over 8,700 students. Remember, we're a small institution with a $1.6 million budget. Uh, these programs include matinees for school students, in-school residencies, CASAs, workshops, professional development for teachers, and workshops for seniors. Uh, and we support our school partners with a number of resources, including online listings of workshops and residency descriptions, uh, study guides, um, and an e-newsletter that informs our schools uh, about it. Um, I have a quote here and I put in your packet. We recently had a, a retired uh, teacher uh, from the UFT came to our program who said, during the many years I was a teacher, I took my classes to some great school performances for school groups, but never did any come close to the scope and genius of the one I saw yesterday morning at Flushing Town Hall. And she was talking about a program called the Cultural Crossroads of Ireland and Africa. And I, I want to use that to depart from my testimony from a, for a bit just to say that one of the things that cultural partners can do that schools themselves cannot do is offer a wide range of diversity in terms of both cultural representation as well as discipline. The degree to which uh, that could be offered, even if we were to see very strong arts ed dollars put directly into the schools, it would be difficult to match what cultural institutions can bring to schools. Because the cultural institutions in New York City represent an incredible diversity collectively of disciplines, cultures, traditions, etc. And it would be impossible to put all of those teachers into one school. So while in general, uh, I think having things in the schools is great, the cultural partnerships offer something special that you can't get through the schools directly. So I think that that's an important reason why the CIG and the other cultural institutions in the city are really important in partnership with the DOE. So with that, you know, you see our, our statistics on what we've done. Um, I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, we applaud uh, in, any increase to the DOE's budget specific to arts ed, and we also very strongly advocate for the needs of the Department of Cultural Affairs, and we're asking for $40 million to be added to the Cultural Affairs budget, so we hope you'll support that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, Wave Hill is a public garden and cultural center located in the northwest section of the Bronx. Uh, we offer programs in horticulture, the arts, and of course education. Currently, we serve 155,000 annual visitors. Um, and I'd also like to point out that we've extended IDNYC free memberships to 5,000 individuals from all five boroughs. This now represents over 60% of our membership base. Um, our education programs are committed to providing engaging, hands-on educational experiences that connect students with the natural environment. Currently, our department serves 25,000 individuals every year through family programs, teen empowerment internship programs, and school programs. Today, I'm here to talk to you about Wave Hill School Programs specifically. 
are cross-curricular academic year programs, summer programs, and professional development opportunities serve 10,000 New York City school children and teachers every year. Um, our school programs are unique. They provide a safe, clean, pitch, uh, picturesque environment that's a nice break from the classroom for NYC students. They support the Common Core Learning Standards, the Next Generation Science Standards, and are modeled around critical thinking, thoughtful observation, and inquiry-based exploration. Our academic year school programs are offered in nature studies, creative arts, and historical studies. And in the most recently completed fiscal year, we served 8,500 students and teachers. That's almost 400 classes through those programs. Our summer programs are offered in July and August and help offset the summer slide. Um, and again, in the most recently completed fiscal year, served nearly 1,700 New York City school uh, children and teachers. And our professional professional development opportunities for pre-K through middle school educators include full day sessions hosted at Wave, Wave Hill, off-site conference presentations, and in-school workshops. Um, we serve approximately 400 educators uh, from the New York City, oh, sorry, um, every year. Um, so in the most recently completed fiscal year, the school group served by our education department uh, were from all five boroughs with the highest representation from the Bronx and Upper Manhattan. Um, of the Bronx-based school groups, 89% represented some of the most underserved communities, including Mott Haven, Tremont, Belmont, and Fordham Manor. So on behalf of Wave Hill, the CIGs, and the program groups, uh, we appreciate your support in this budget cycle, and thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, when I was a teacher, I had the opportunity to take my students to three of the institutions here as well, so I um, can fully appreciate what you do. I've seen it firsthand. Just a, one, one thing I, I have a question about. So the $23 million that the mayor put into the budget, how much of that exactly went to arts organizations versus to arts teachers? You know, you, do, you, do you get money directly from the DOE on that? I, I believe that the money... Can you just put your mic on? Oh, yes. oh by the way, I do need Sammy and w Wave, Crest, Wave Hill. Wave Hill, the, Jen. Yeah, yeah, just identify yourselves on the mic. So, Sammy, why don't you say that first? Sure. Sammy Abouchemez, Flushing Town Hall. Uh, and Jennifer Becker from Wave Hill. Wave Hill, okay. Uh, my understanding, and Doug is here to correct me if I'm wrong, is the, the funding actually did not drive back to the cultural partners. It was professional, 5.2 million for teachers, 2.8 for partnerships. I was wrong. So, 5.2 million for teachers, art specialist teachers. 2.5 to increase uh, available funding for partnerships. What about professional learning? About two million, about two million for um, professional development, or like six million for facilities, and then another two or so for art supplies and instruments and materials. Uh, thank you very much, Doug Israel, Center for Arts Education. This is the problem of six weeks on the job, so I really do appreciate you, Doug. It's great to have those facts and figures at your fingertips. That's great. So um, I was in these community schools, you might have heard me talk about it before, and I was very impressed by the partnerships that they have with, with a number of the arts organizations. Are any of you involved with the community schools? I don't think we're at a community school. I do not believe we are running a residency at a community school. I'll ask our education department and get back to you. Yeah, I mean, I just was wondering how um, these community schools hooked up with the arts organizations and who pays for them, and out of whose budget is it coming? We will make sure that you receive that information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very good question. What I'll say about, in general, our partnerships with schools is that uh, the funding comes from a variety of sources. So some of it is DOE funds. Some of it is schools pay themselves. Some of it, we've had a few council members support us giving free tickets to, to students. Um, private philanthropy. Private philanthropy. Our, one of our board members has done that. So it's really um, coming from a variety of sources. But if the DOE's budget were significantly increased specifically for school partnerships, it would definitely have an impact. And it is this comfort. What was so unique about that funding was it was a comprehensive approach, dealt with facility, dealt with professional learning, dealt with the partnerships, dealt with arts teacher specialists in the buildings. It is that comprehensive, you know, inch by inch, it's a cinch. So when you just take that bit by bit and build, it's only going to deliver good results. And, and the programs that you're involved with in schools, that's, that's during school time? Uh, and do you also get CASA grants? 
Yes, we have CASA grants. We're in about 140 schools serving maybe 10,000 kids and 600 educators. At the Metropolitan, we also have the CASA grant at uh, PSIS 78 in Queens. Um, we have a number of school partnerships across the city, and then, of course, school visits and professional learning at the museum. I would say for us, and I'll be quick, all of the above. So we have CASAs for after school. We have residencies that we put teaching artists in schools, and we have field trip programs during the school day where groups come to our, our programs. Okay, and we have, Ella grant, we have a DOE ELLA grants. Also, we, we are scrappy. We, we uh, charities and find sniffing out that funding to deliver the services. And our academic year programming is during the school day. Our summer programming is obviously over the summer. Yeah. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tian Hao Zhang from Tina Genic. Solomon uh, Animeka from East Farms, New York, Janice Thomas from East Farms, New York, and Christina Erskine from Community Food Advocates and The Point. Good. All right. So can you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Okay. Let's start over here. Just make sure that little red light is on. Yes. Good. Okay. Hello. I'm Christina Erskine. I'm a youth organizer for Community Food Advocates. And I'm also the co-founder of the Bushwick Campus Youth Food Policy Council, which is a youth group that was formed in order to start working on universal free school lunch. I've been working on this issue since I was a senior in high school, and I'm currently a sophomore in college. I'm here today to testify on behalf of youth from The Point CDC, so I'm going to read their testimony. Hello, our names are Stephanie Almodovar, Chenley Carrasco, Kimberly Fuentes, and Brandon Valdivieso. We are high school students in the Hunts Point area who form a part of a, team act, of a teen activist group called Action in a local community organization known as The Point CDC. We would like to first thank the City Council Education Committee for their continuous support through the Lunch for Learning campaign. Through this testimony, we would like to express why we need universal free school lunch to be implemented in all New York City public schools. As youth who work for and advocate for positive change in our community, it is important to us that we share with you the importance of creating a universal free school lunch system throughout all New York City public schools. Most school age youth in this community depend on the nutrition we receive from our schools. Students in school need breakfast and lunch to help them operate their day. Most students eat lunch in school because we all know how important it is for our health and education. As you may be well aware of, Hunts Point is home to the largest food distribution center in the United States. However, we are also a food desert with few healthy food options available in our community. Once youth transition out of middle schools into high school, the security of a school-wide free school lunch is gone. That is why supporting the creation of universal free school lunch from pre-K through high school is important. Implementing universal free school lunch, along with improving the quality of school food, will help ensure better school environments for young people in our public school system. School lunches are unappetizing. Access to more varied foods, along with better refrigerated dairy products, served in schools will benefit us in the classroom. We are asking you, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, and City Council members to institute universal free school lunch. We need better food options in all our schools. Thank you again for your support, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, my name is Janice Johnson, and I am a student at George West Downs High School. I'd like to take the time out to t today to deliver my support for the Lunch for Learning campaign for Universal Free School Lunch for LMIC public school students. Cyberbullying, embarrassment, pressure, and fear are all factors under the school lunch system and the ones who have opportunity to obtain it. A while back, I was unaware of the originator of the term call for school lunch to be renamed Free Free. The word has more meaning than it seems, better yet more impact. Last year when we were all allowed to have our phones in school, so 
students would go out of their way just to take pictures of people eating school lunch. I happened to be a victim of the situation. And I must admit, it got me highly upset to know later on that night I would be clowned on social media. This caused mental frustration to my well-being. It made me not want to show my face in school. I was one with a high popularity level, as well as one who was more fortunate. And this was happening to almost everyone. So I can only imagine what it did to those who knew free lunch would be their only meal. Did they make the pain unbearable and overwhelming enough to sacrifice health and cause star starvation? Excuse me. <clears throat> Bullying isn't the only issue with school lunch. There were times where there wasn't enough food, it was undercooked, or just a bad taste. Nevertheless, I think the first approach would be to make all school lunches universally free, and soon enough, the factors behind students not eating school lunch will become obsolete. I'm asking you, Mr. Mayor, and council members to make universal free lunch a priority. We need to stop the stigma and get better access to food in our schools. Thank you for your time and support for this meaningful, momentous, necessary issue. Thank you very much. Next, please. <clears throat> Hello. My name is Solomon Eniamaker. I stand in front of you today to discuss a troubling issue currently existing within our schools. In order for me to receive lunch um, as a student, um, I'm required to pay $1.75 every day due to my father's income. To you, $1.75 may be a small amount, but why I request is for you all is to consider the fact that many parents today, like my father, are being suffocated by responsibilities. My father's income makes me ineligible for free school lunch. But his responsibilities, such as taxes, educational expenses, rent, as well as placing food on the table at home, tend to reduce his yearly income, leaving him with insufficient funds, doubts, lim limiting payment distribution for lunch. Uh, um, for many students, um, other um, the situation similar to mine, this can lead um, to health issues, lack of focus in class, and as well as low grades, and much more. Um, in my school, the appeal of lunch, of school lunch, is an issue. But how can we improve lunch in a public school if not everyone can eat it? Um, in addition. Um, I had to apply for a youth program known as East New York Farms to obtain money in order to limit my, the issues my father was facing on a daily basis. Um, moreover, on weekdays, I have to work until 6.30 p.m. Um, after my school hours. So when I arrive home, I have to begin my homework, which will last up to late in the evening, giving me less time to sleep. F furthermore, when I have to prepare for school, I'm exhausted which decreases my ability to focus in class and further having a negative impact on, my, um, on me academically. What I ask for you council mayor, members and mayor is to establish free, council, uh, free school lunch for all New York um, public schools. You have the power to make sure that, all, that the youth of our current generation um, can obtain a proper diet to help strengthen our ability to focus in class. It's your choice to proceed towards the right path in supporting today's youth Thank you to the city council for your support this year and as well as your full attention. And have a good day. Thank you very much. Next, please. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member Drum and the fellow members of New York City Council Education Committee. My name is Tian Hao Zhang, and I'm a senior at Francis Lewis High School in Fresh Meadow, Queens. I'm here today to represent a student advocacy group, Teenergetic. Inspired by a student protest at my school about lunch quality, I founded Teenergetic with my classmates and set as our mission to launch universal free lunch, improve the appeal of school food, and enhance the overall learning experience in New York City schools. With, um, with your support, Teenergetic and other community-based organizations aim to make more progress this year toward universal free school lunch. At Francis Lewis High School, we have a significant population of immigrant students. Having immigrated to this country with my family four years ago, I witnessed firsthand some of my friends who are hesitant about filling out school lunch forms. They will say it's because their parents are unwilling to review certain information out of concern of their immigration status. Additionally, in my school, many students' family barely miss the eligibility threshold to qualify for free or reduced price lunch and therefore struggle to pay for their children's meals. What this means for many students is choosing between food or a review book. Unfortunately, most students will choose to pay for the latter, 
a decision that affects their health and academic progress in the long run. This situation is not limited to my school. In fact, the lack of universal free lunch, a school lunch, leads to problems throughout New York City in different forms depending on the school. By implementing universal free lunch, a school lunch, the two aforementioned problems can be immediately and effectively addressed. While the city tried to remedy the crisis in our school system with initiatives in elementary and middle schools, high school students continue to be left out of this critical conversation. That's why I'm here today. I'm here to ask the mayor to make universal free lunch a top priority. To Council Member Drum and the fellow members of the Education Committee, I thank you for your support and hope you will continue to be a strong champion on the issue. All students should be guaranteed full access to school lunch, regardless of their individual family situations, so that every student can become more productive in their educational endeavors. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, let me tell you, each of you get a four for timeliness and for fitting your message into the time frame allotted. I congratulate you on that, number one, because actually, it makes us listen even more to hear what it is that you're saying. And uh, we always like to hear the voices of students uh, here at this hearing, and that's why we're really glad that you were able to come down. And we hear your, your call for universal free lunch, and we understand the reasons why, and we're going to fight with you to see if we can make that happen moving forward. So thank you again for coming down. We really definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Councilmember uh, Lander wanted to ask a question. Yeah, I just so. want to let you all know what an effective group of advocates the students fighting for Lunch for Learning have been, and the Council is on board. I know there's not a lot of other members uh, here right now, but uh, there was, uh, Council members have been persuaded by young people testifying. There was a rally a couple of days ago, and it, it, um, probably it's, cause a good it's a good idea, and partly it's because young people have been very effective advocates. So we're with you, and thank you for coming out. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Our next panel. Uh, Zion Agostini from Urban Youth Collaborative, Kessie Foster, Urban Youth Collaborative, uh, Zaire Agostini, U Urban Youth Collaborative, Latrell Stone, Urban Youth Collaborative, and Christina, Christine Rodriguez, Urban Youth Collaborative. Uh -huh. All right, so let me just swear you in. Would you raise your right hand, everybody? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Okay, thank you. Cassie, do you want to, Casey, who, where should we start? Yeah, so we're trying to get the uh, video you want to start down here? ready. We can start down okay. here with Latrell. Yep. Yep, just push that button, make sure that little red light is on, and then speak right into the mic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm, with, I'm Latrell. I'm with the um, Urban Youth Collaborative and Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice. All right. Um, so a week before Regents Week at my high school in the Bronx, my AP English teacher decided to give us a mo optional mock AP exam to take as extra credit. Since most of us was already passing the class, we didn't show up for the exam because it wasn't mandatory. That Monday after Regents Week, we came back into class and were informed that most of us were now in danger of failing. Our class vocally expressed how upset we were that she decided to make this exam mandatory without prior notice and was probably, and was probably surprised because she thought more people would show up to the exam. 
After class, I went up to my teacher and apologized for jumping out of character like I did and tried to explain why I felt what she did was wrong. She said okay, and I thought the situation had ended there. The next day when I tried to attend that class, I found out that I was removed from that class for two days. In other words, I got suspended from my AP class for two days. Black students are four times more likely to be suspended, but our approach to school discipline pushes out in ways that aren't always tracked by data. Suspensions are going down, but the racial disparities for black students are still high, higher than the national average. <coughs> investment in restorative justice is not just an investment in a program, and it's, a, it's an investment in changing school culture. School culture that still unfairly pushes out black students, Latino, Latino students, LGBTQ students, and students with disabilities. How many hours of instruction, how many classes, how many school days are missed by students every year? We have to continue to work together in order to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. What if my school had a restorative justice coordinator or the teacher in our class could have been able to have a peer mediation or a group circle to, ter to talk out the um, misunderstanding? We could have gotten to a more positive solution than me and other students be suspended from our AP class for two days. This was my first time getting suspended in my life and it's sad that it had to happen in my senior year of high school. I'm worried about my little sister and other students that will be here after I graduate. We are thankful for the $2.4 million that we received for restorative justice so far and are hoping to see that funding double to $5 million. If there is $20 million for private security guards in schools and for other programs, we can definitely work together to find more money to fully fund restorative justice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So just to tell me, why did you get suspended? Because when she told us that we were in danger of failing uh, the class because she um, all of a sudden made the test mandatory without telling us, we sort of um, pretty much got very upset and got very vocal about it. Sorry, um, I'm not going to lie. I was screaming a little bit because I was really upset because she really did just went behind our backs and decided to make this whole thing mandatory, which she did say it was optional, and that we didn't have to take it. And I guess that she must have felt upset by that or something, I felt the need to um, remove me from that class, even though after that, even though after the incident, I went up to her and I apologized for acting out the way I did. Okay, all right, thank you. Next, please. My name is Zion. I'm a youth leader with Make the Road New York and the Urban Youth Collaborative. Last month, I joined the parents of Molly Graham, my friends, my brother and sister of the city council community groups at the vigil calling for an investigation into his death. My friends and I chanted our hearts out, shouting our truths, and then left to go back to our Brooklyn neighborhood where we, were, we got off the train and started walking home. We were stopped by three police officers. My, friends, my friend was half a block in front of us, and a plainclothes officer came up and stopped him. We watched the officer detain and started to pat him down. Two officers approached us and asked us, what do you have in your pockets? Only two of us from, from on two blocks away from home, after calling for justice for Molly Graham, we had to deal with this injustice. For too long, my neighbor had high, high suspension rates and high stop and frisk. As a young black man, I am faced with racial discrimination and, yes, harassment. But this isn't just about me and that night. It is about all the people and all the young people in New York City that look just like me, my friend, and my sister, and, the, and need to invest in our future. After dealing with the harassment that night, my sister and I woke up and went to school. The first thing we see in school every day is school police officers and metal detectives. And that was many black and brown students see every day for more than 9,000 of us. That is the first thing we see every morning. It can be triggering, traumatizing. Our schools have 5,400 school police officers and only 3,800 guidance counselors and social workers. It should not be a surprise that 94% of students arrested are black and brown. Research shows that the presence of police leads to only an increase in students being arrested for minor incidents. We are investing in the school to prison platform. We don't know, I don't know how our school system ended up employing more police officers than guidance counselors or social workers. But I only know it would be like, the, the, it wouldn't be like that if we weren't black. I know the city council is committed to 
to supporting young people, and that is why we need the city council to lead the push for restorative justice. It would help the schools move away from criminal responses and push-ups, and it would provide resources for schools to hire restorative justice coordinators, restorative justice coordinators, where it prioritize learning environments that that keep us in school and out of, out of criminal courts. We are spending close to $400 million on school police and security and $7 million on restorative justice practice. In four years, when I graduate, the city will have spent a billion dollars on school police, $28 million on restorative justice, and if the city keeps doing that, why are you telling me, my friends and my sister, what's the message for us? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Peace. My name is Zai Kiron. I'm a youth leader with Make the Road New York and Urban Youth Collaborative. Being a black girl in school is hard, and the stereotypes and bias we face is often overlooked. Black girls are treated differently than white girls. Black girls are 10 times more likely to face harsh discipline. Being black is the biggest indicator that you will be suspended or arrested. The majority of suspensions and criminal summits are not for violent and dangerous reasons. They are for minor infractions like the fine authority and disorderly conduct. The Secretary of Education, Attorney General, said these infractions were biased and unfairly impact black students. In my experience, I feel that we are looked at like we are about to cause trouble. If we speak up for ourselves, or even when we're having fun and like joking around and dancing, our behavior is called inappropriate and defiant. And I think it's because we as black girls don't fit people's expectation of what a girl is supposed to act like. An administrator at my old school once, said, once called us crazy because of the way we dance. Old stereotypes like we will never graduate, that we will drop out and have a child, that we are trouble waiting to happen still exist. It feels like the system isn't built to build us up and support us, but break us down mentally and emotionally. We are even treated differently, just not, not by race, but by because of appearance. I've seen I am treated differently in other black, than other black girls because people don't look at me and always think I'm black. Because my hair is naturally long and curly, and adults and other students in my school treat me differently from my friends that have short, curly hair and more so-called normal black features. In 2014, the Federal Department of Education called for the need of bias training. 70% of our students are black and Latino, but 60% of, of our teachers are white. We have to address the bias stereotypes that still make school life so hard for many black girls. As a part for expanding funding for restorative justice, we hope we can make sure schools get anti-racism and gender bias trainings for staff. We need to be honest that racial bias is really is a reality face, students face, and we need a plan to address it. Funding to explain restorative justice is to make sure that training includes anti-racism training is a start. The DOE is spending $7 million for restorative justice, and we are happy that we're starting to get to invest in, in restorative justice, but that's $1 per student. Every school is going to be impacted. It has, if every school is going to be impacted, it has to be a much bigger investment. The council has been the leader on this expending for the investment to five million dollars would be if city would be a push for the city even further. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Next please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Rodriguez. I am a youth leader at Made Throne New York as well as the Urban Youth Collaborative. I currently attend the new school but for the last two years of my high school I had the opportunity to be a youth leader at the Student Success Center or SSC on Bushwick campus. My stipend pro position as a youth leader allowed me to work closely with my peers to help them through the college application process. College is more important than ever, but unfortunately, many black and Latina students in New York City are not moving on to college. Only 26% of incoming freshmen at, New at CUNY top senior colleges are black and Latino. 95% of all high school students have college aspirations, and we have become a society where it is almost impossible to earn a livable wage, but students often don't receive the support they need. As a youth leader, I had, I had a role with a lot of responsibilities. With the training we received during the summer and throughout the school year from college access research and action, youth leaders are able to have have one-on-ones with students and facilitate workshops around college awareness. We help students with their financial aid applications, help students find colleges, write their personal statements, and finish and complete all paperwork. 
having an SSE definitely has a great impact in schools and on the lives of the students. Schools with SSEs see an increase in the number of students applying to college, the number of colleges students apply to, and an increase in financial aid. Due to lack of resources and time, most students are unable to meet their guidance counselor, and, have, and having a SSE opens up access for those who have little to none. Fifty-five percent of high school graduates from low-income families enroll in college in comparison to 84 percent of high school and high-income families. I have encountered many instances where students have sought, sought, colleges, sought college as something accessible and in their future. The Urban Youth Collaborative has been fighting for New York City to lead the way in increasing access and equity to school counselors, college counselors, and college preparation programs, such as the Student Success Centers for Black, Latino, and First Generation College Goers. Currently, I am a College Bridge coach at the SSC. The College Bridge program provides jobs to college students to work with seniors at their old high school. I support seniors during the, the year and in the summer between high school graduation and college matriculation by working alongside counselors and conducting workshops, providing advice on completing financial aid forms, how to pay for textbooks, arranging transportation to college, and registering for class. One-third of graduating seniors who are accepted to college and plan to enroll fail to do so due to lack of support. An important population of students that are underrepresented are undocumented students. And for many undocumented students, this is the first time their citizenship status becomes vulnerable. And I found it interesting how comfortable students are when speaking to peers. The college process is very complicated, especially for first-generation students. I can even it can even be harder when it comes to parent involvement. And as a youth leader and a college bridge coach, I experienced many clarifying moments with parents. This work is very important to me and important to my community. Many students visit the SSEs every day, and it's realistic to say that many students would not be in college if the SSE was not present. This position creates realist, um, leadership for both youth leaders and students and relationship with parents and staff members. I hope to see more student success centers in New York City. Many students miss many opportunities because of the lack of support they have access to. It is important to invest in youth design solutions such as student success centers because we play a big role in helping students realize their dream. It is also important to invest in summer college bridge programs for students matriculating to college. We ask the DOE and the City of New York to financially commit to these programs. We are asking for $4 million commitment this year. You, you will see that young people have solutions to the issues we face. We are hoping to see a res the resources we need because it is important to invest in all students. Thank you. Thank you. And I am before going testifying, we're going to show a short clip from the documentary that's being shot right now featuring Christine Rodriguez, and also Enoch is in here somewhere too. Did this young lady get a chance to give testimony? That's okay. And what's your name? Jordania. Jordania, do we have a slip for you? Did you fill out one of these slips? Uh, no. No, okay. So when you finish, would you fill one out for me and then yeah. bring it and give it to the, one of the sergeants, okay? Okay. All right. Why don't you start? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jordania Monegro, and I am a youth leader with Future of Tomorrow and the Urban Youth Collaborative. This fall, I will be attending college, and I will be a first-generation college student. My school was fortunate to have a student success college center. I received support with college applications, registering for SATs, help with financial aid, and more. My dream is to study fashion and journalism, and now I will have the opportunity to fulfill my dream. Unfortunately, other schools in my neighborhood and in New York City lack the resources needed to help students get into the best college for them. My high school's campus is the only high school campus in my neighborhood with a college student college success center. I cannot imagine how stressful it can be for other students and first-generation college students to successfully get into college when they don't have that extra support system. There, there is currently not enough money and resources being invested to get these students into college, and we must change this now. If we do not want our children to suffer educationally, we need to invest in their futures. That, mean, that means college. We need college counselors. We need more student success centers. We need every school to have a plan, the, 
and the resources to put in place. I think about my younger sisters back home in my country. When they arrive here, will they get the support needed to get to college? Will there still be funding for the current student success center on my campus? Will they be able to live their dreams? If my school did not have the student success center, I would possibly not be attending college in the fall or anytime soon. The Department of Education's new college for all plan is going to provide some students with extra guidance counselors, but a plan for all has to reach everyone. Investing four million in student success centers will provide on campus work for students and support thousands for, of more students to get into college. I'm asking you to support us in getting us to college today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Casey? surface, 
It has nothing to do with an aspiration problem. It has to do with the supports to fulfill those aspirations. And that's where, right now, as a society, we're failing young people. All right, Vamanova. Do you plan on coming? Do you plan on coming? And what about you? Lajah, are you going? Kazo. Kazo, pal. They are saying it's not enough for just me to go. My community needs to go. My school needs to go. They are the ones who are stepping up to make College for All a reality. I will be helping my own friends. So it's something serious. You're making a promise. You are making a promise. I will do whatever it takes to, you know, help them with everything I can. In a year, you guys will be heading off to college soon, and you're probably not like thinking about it right, right now. Like you're you're thinking about it, but you're not where we are at it. Like I'm scared, really scared right now about college. It's never good for you to be the only one striving. I think it, it'd be a lonely place, like on the throne, if you didn't have like your friends with you. I don't know what it is that I want. So it's okay not to be a major. There's a gap in our school, in our system. I will guide you with the college process. We're helping close that gap. Thank you. Very, very good. Do um, you guys know how, much, uh, how many college credits you need to graduate? About? 44. For a uh, for your junior high for a junior college probably, right? So it's about 120 college credits that you'd need to get a bachelor's degree. Okay. Yeah, about that. And do you know how many credits each course is approximately? How many credits do you get for each course? Like it varies two, three, four. That's right. So you have a lot of coursework to do. So sometimes you have to carry 12 credits or 15 credits. Sometimes you have to carry a minimum of 12 credits in order to be able to get financial aid too. So there are all types of things that are hooked into the number of credits that you're taking in order to advance and stuff like that. So that's why I think a program like this is so really important because it will really begin to expose you to all those little details of how you move forward. Does anybody know the difference? Because it was asked in the video, the difference between a community college and a, and a senior college. Christina, yeah. do you know? Um, she said, "What is, if if you know the difference between the two?" You I can't hear you. Oh, is that, and if you know the difference, do you know the difference between the two community? Oh well, community college, you um, basically receive an associate's degree, and then um, with the senior college, you can receive a bachelor's. Absolutely. And move forward to a master's degree. Do you know how to get a master's degree? Mm -hmm. After you you apply. After that, good. So you should be aiming for that too. Okay. That's a great program. Thank you. Councilmember Lander, do you have questions? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to all of you for coming out and testifying. I think the Urban Youth Collaborative is doing a great job, and the restorative justice work uh, is tremendously important. I, I just, uh, I've had a chance to get to look at the Student Success Centers, um, and I'm really uh, so impressed. I just want to make sure I understand a few things right. First, it, it, essentially all of the work is done by peer counseling by other high school students, mm -hmm. yes? Well, the ones that are trained, yeah. And it's mostly people who themselves are first generation, whose parents haven't gone to college. Yeah, I'm a first generation student. So you are, and it seems like mo you know, a lot of the counselors are as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the um, students that are actually helping the students through the application process themselves are also first generation mm -hmm. uh, college students. Many students also, their campuses where they're undocumented students that are also acting as student success center leaders as well. Uh, and so how do you, I mean, how do you learn what you need to know to be peer counselors if you haven't done it before and almost no one in your family has done it before? Mm -hmm. Well, we receive a lot of support in the student success centers from peers and our supervisors and also the training that we receive in CARA really helps. And that's what, that's what the money you're asking from the city and the city council is to help set those uh, centers up and provide that support and training so you can we help are, other people. Uh, sorry. So CARA Community uh, College Action and Research and Action at CUNY is our technical, assist, a technical assistance provider. Um, also full service community, uh, students 
success centers have community partnerships. And so the one on the Bushwick campus is run by Make the Road. The most recent one that just opened on DeWitt Clinton in the Bronx as a Good Shepherd as a community partnership. So each uh, student success center has a strong community partnership. And then CARA acts as the trainer and technical assistance provider to train the young people on how to be the college advisors. And my last question is just, I, it's also my understanding that a lot of these are in campus schools where there's three, four, five high schools in one building and they function as a way of bringing people together across the campus, which is not always that easy to do, and especially if the schools don't have themselves, you know, enough college support and, and access. Have you found that to be effective in your, in your school? Yeah, um, Bushwick campus have, has four schools and um, mo most of the students, they don't have uh, the opportunity to meet their guidance counselors because of time. And so they come to the SSC during their lunch time or after school or we reach out to them. So yeah, it is very effective. That's great. Well, thank you very much for your work. I really want one of these at John Jay Educational Campus for the high school students there, a lot of whom don't have access to enough college counseling, but thanks all of you guys. Thank, and I would just say briefly, um, there are also two middle school success centers that are part of our proposal, and that has middle school students playing the same role as the high school students helping families through the high school application process. It's only in New York City that middle school students would need the level of support to apply to high school that uh, most Americans need to apply to college, but yeah. you're right, we do, so thank you. Thanks, thank you. Mr. Chairman. We may soon need that for kindergarten, believe me. <laughs> thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much to this panel. Thank you for your testimony. All right, our next panel, Katie McDonald, Girls for Gender Equity, Robin Vitale, American Heart Association, Karen Jimenez, Dignity in School and Parent Action Committee, Terence Renton, and Esperanza Vasquez. Excuse me, do you want to raise your right hand, please, so I can swear you in? Okay. Do you all, uh, uh, excuse me, do you swear to tell the truth, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay. Would you like to start? Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Karen Jiménez y soy un miembro del Comité de Padres en Good afternoon. Un poquito más alto, can you move the microphone? Yeah. Um, buenas tardes, mi nombre es uh, Karen Jiménez y soy un miembro del Comité de Padres en Acción de New Cerema. Good afternoon, my name is Karen Jiménez. I am a member of the Parent Committee in Action of New Settlement. Y estoy um, muy agradecida de estar aquí. Gracias por tenernos. I am very thankful to be here. Thank you for having us. Este, estoy aquí para que el Consejo Municipal nos dé su apoyo en la lucha por la justicia restaurativa dentro de nuestras escuelas en el condado del Bronx. I am here to request the municipal council to give us their support with our fight for restorative justice uh, within our schools in the Bronx. Nada más en el año escolar del 2014 al 2015 en el Bronx vio un 30.7% de los arrestos y un 60.4% en citaciones dentro de las escuelas públicas más que cualquier otro condado. Just in the year between 2014 and 2015 in the Bronx, 
we've seen 30.7% of arrests and 60.4% of suspensions in public schools, more than any other county. Nosotros hicimos una encuesta eh, el año pasado sobre la relación de entre el ambiente escolar y un impacto dentro de los jóvenes que son más vulnerables a ser empujados fuera de las escuelas. Y a base de esta encuesta nos dimos cuenta que del 21% de los estudiantes que no disfrutaban su experiencia en la escuela académicamente, 57% de ellos no acudirían a un consejero escolar o a un trabajador social, aunque estuvieran en una situación muy difícil. And we made an investigation about a year ago in relation to the uh, school environment and the impact that young people have who are vulnerable and are pushed out of school. Based on our findings, we noticed that 21% of students did not enjoy their experience to be in school academically and 57% will not go to a counselor or to a social worker even if they were passing through a tough time in school. Solamente el 11% de ellos dijeron que un trabajador social o un consejero escolar se acercaban a ellos. El 56% reportaron que nunca se acercaron a ellos y en realidad muchos de los estudiantes que prefirieron buscar ayuda entre sus amigos y familiares antes de acudir a un trabajador social. Only 11% said that a social worker or school counselor would approach them and within them 60, uh, 56% reported that they would never approach them. And in reality, a lot of our students have said that they prefer to seek help from their friends or family members instead of going to social workers or school counselors. Por eso es que queremos un cambio dentro de las escuelas, en cual nos enfocaríamos en el desarrollo emocional de los jóvenes de una manera positiva. Queremos padres líderes que trabajen en conjunto con las escuelas y construyendo una cadena de confianza para transformar la cultura escolar. That's why we would like change within our schools that they will be able to focus in a, the emotional development of our young uh, students in a positive manner. We want parents to be leaders who will work together with schools and to be able to build a chain of trust to be able to transform our uh, school culture. The program of peace Um, de centros de paz, un modelo a seguir en Chicago que queremos implementar en el Bronx, donde un miembro de la comunidad capacitado ayuda a jóvenes a resolver sus conflictos sin necesidad de violencia, solo ayudándolo para expresar de manera con, con palabras, ayudando a los jóvenes a reflexionar y a construir su carácter de manera positiva. Cuenta hasta donde ellos pueden llegar a capacitarse hasta que ellos sepan cómo ellos pueden reflexionarse a sí mismos y que ellos sepan reconstruir su manera y su visión. There is a program called Center of Peace, which is modeled in Chicago, that we would like to implement in the Bronx, where a member of our community who is uh, able and is proficient to help our young uh, students uh, will be able to resolve their, uh, help them resolve their conflicts without the necessity of violence and only with the use of words so that our young people will be able to reflect and will be able to be construed in a matter that uh, where they find themselves, that they are themselves capable to be able to reach that goal. Por eso es que estamos hoy abogando por la justicia restaurativa, pidiendo al Consejo que nos apoye hoy con 2.4 millones para expandir la justicia restaurativa para el próximo año y también necesitamos 2.6 millones para expandir este programa a más escuelas, especialmente en Del Moros, ya que hay descendencia y hay más violencia en las escuelas. Muchas gracias por su atención. And that's why we are advocating a restorative justice. We're asking 
the council, city council to support us with 2.4 million so that we will be able to expand justice that is restorative and into the next year and that we need this 2.6 million to be able to expand this program so that especially more schools in the Bronx will be able to decrease this violence that exists in schools. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Uh, my name is Terence Rienten, and I'm a youth organizer for Ignite Youth for Justice and Social Change. Can you just speak more into that mic and state okay. your name again? So my name is Terence Rienten, and I am a youth organizer for Ignayan Youth for Justice and Social Change, a member organization for the Dignity in Schools Campaign New York. This is my first testimony to the city and definitely not my last. First, I would like to thank all of you for coming out here to share my story and the stories of young people in the Filipino community. I am here to remind the City Council of the importance of restorative practices in our schools and how the current punitive system in place needs their compassion to allocate sufficient resources for it to be drastically reformed. Young people of color are the crossfires of the school to prison pipeline and your leadership and urgent action can make a difference in our lives. As a young adult that has gone through the public school system, I witnessed firsthand the need for a reform in our school policies. As a new immigrant to the United States and living in a working class neighborhood, I struggled in school. I had been suspended and I felt like the school environment was set up like a prison, with guards, metal detectors, limited resources, and adults treating us so relentlessly. I had many friends who were intelligent and capable, but when they made a mistake, many of which were minor, they were given unfair punishment, whether it's suspension, expulsion, or even arrest. Our black and brown sisters and brothers are disproportionately targeted by this broken education system. Is it fair that black students make up about 26% of the student population in New York City, but were 53% of those suspensions? The Filipino community is not immune from this broken education system. One of our undocumented members had a traumatic experience in high school. He was falsely accused and implicated by the dean of the school in video where he was allegedly selling drugs. When he requested to see the video footage, he was bullied and threatened. The ultimatum was to get arrested by the police or be suspended. With life and the safety of his family on the line, he was forced to lie and admit to, to the false accusation. He was suspended for several days and that had a huge impact on his acad academic record. What kind of a message are young people receiving in the currently school to prison climate that treats us as guilty offenders without any due process? We are judged and criminalized by the color of our skin and the years of our experience. This is not right. We are not disposable people. We deserve the same basic human rights and dignity as any other person. What is your responsibility as city officials in changing this? What can you do to right the wrongs that are happening to tens of thousands of young people in New York City? We urge the council to push the administration to increase its investment in whole school restorative justice models in schools, including sustainable, full-time school-based staff, youth and parent leadership, professional development, and district-wide coordination. Concretely, this means that you must allocate $5 million to restorative initiatives in the 2016 fiscal year. Our schools and our young people are desperate to have the resources to create an alternative to the school-to-prison pipeline. Already, there have been over 50 schools that have, that have submitted their application to incorporate restorative justice within a week of sending out 115 applications. It is clear to the schools that what needs to be done. We need to change old beliefs and find ways for the most effective way to teach and sustain a school community. Mayor de Blasio is also clear about the leadership it takes to reform our public schools. As a mayor who has backed restorative justice and has said change takes time and processing, the council members can do your part in this long-term restorative justice initiative. We implore you to allocate the resources towards the future of young people public schools, and our communities. We also need your leadership and action to continue to transform, invest, and change our school system into a safe and nurturing one that all young people deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Terrence. And um, your organization, I may say it wrong. Ugnayan. Ugnayan. It means you, linking. So you're in my district. Yes. But I have not, I have not met that organization yet. Uh, we are actually sharing the office with Drum. OK. That is rising up and moving. Very good. Yes. Uh, why don't you come in and see me too? Of course. Okay. Bring, bring your group in. I'd like to meet with you. Of course. I will. Thank, Thank you. you.
Okay, next, please. Buenas, buenas tardes. Gracias por darme la oportunidad. Mi nombre es Esperanza Vázquez, soy miembro y líder del Comité Padres en Acción de Nocerman y madre de dos hijos. Estoy aquí para abogar para los fondos para la Iniciativa de Justicia Restaurativa para el próximo año de las escuelas que están participando en el programa de aumentar 25 escuelas más. Good afternoon. My name is Esperanza Vázquez. I am a member and leader of the Parent Committee in Action of New Settlement. I'm mother of two children. I am here to request funds for the Restorative Justice Initiative for next year for our schools that are participating in the program and to be able to increase 25 more, more schools. Ya que estos programas benefician y son saludables para nuestra comunidad y atraen prácticas restaurativas y no castigar a nuestros hijos, sino apoyarlos para que continúen su educación y vayan a la universidad. And with these programs, there we, we will have find benefits that are healthy for our community and that would attract restorative practices to not punish our children and to be able to uh, support them so that they will continue their education and they will be able to go to college. La razón es que es necesario porque el Bronx todavía tiene las tasas más altas de arrestos y citaciones y hay un alto riesgo que los estudiantes más necesitados vayan a, a la escuela a prisión. Estos programas de justicia restaurativa ayudan a romper esa barrera para que los jóvenes vayan a un conducto de escuela a universidad y no a las cárceles. The reason why this is necessary is because in the Bronx we still have high rates of arrests and suspensions, and there's a high risk that our students uh, who are needing to go to school instead of prison, that they will be able to get these programs of justice, which are uh, a help to be able to break this barrier for the, so that our young people will be able to go into this path of university schooling and not to jails. El beneficio de las prácticas restaurativas en las escuelas públicas de la ciudad de Nueva York dirige a las necesidades de la escuela comunitaria y reduce las desigualdades de disciplinarias y crean relaciones saludables entre educadores, estudiantes, involucran a estudiantes y familias, reducen y previenen el daño y restauran las relaciones positivas y resuelven el conflicto y mantienen los miembros de la comunidad escolar responsables. The benefit of these restorative practices for schools in our public schools in the city of New York are geared towards the necessities of our community schools, which will reduce the inequalities and disciplinarian actions that create uh, healthy relationships between educators and students, and which will involve uh, students and families, which will reduce and prevent damages, which will restore re positive relationships, which will uh, re resolve conflicts and maintain uh, a re uh, scholar, uh, uh, maintain a leader, a sc a school leaders in our community responsible. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, please. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kate McDonough, and I'm the director of organizing at Girls for Gender Equity. Mm -hmm. uh, Girls for Gender. That's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> Girls for Gender Equity is an intergenerational uh, organization committed to the physical, psychological, social, and economic development of girls and women. Mm -hmm. Through education and organizing, uh, GGE encourages communities to remove barriers and create opportunities for girls and women to live self-determined lives. We're also active members of the Dignity in Schools campaign. Mm -hmm. For the past two years, our Sister and Strength Youth Organizers, who are all high school aged young women of color, have been conducting their own research on discipline practices in school and calling uh, attention to how racial and gender stereotypes about young women of color, particularly black girls, cause them to be uniquely and unfairly disciplined. One of our Sisters in Strength, can't express her own opinion without being told that she needs to stop being loud and angry. Yeah, yeah. This same young woman can't come to school with her hair wrapped without it being assumed that she will get into a fight. Yeah, 
Another sister in strength was suspended for a week for accidentally breaking her teacher's pencil sharpener. The teacher's reasoning for the suspension was that she broke it on purpose because she wanted attention. These are not isolated incidents, systematic racism and sexism. Studies have found that black girls are more likely to be disciplined for talking back and receive informal forms of discipline such as being asked to leave the classroom for chewing gum, getting up to throw away trash, or speaking too loudly. One study entitled Ladies or Loudies uh, by E.W. Morris found that much of the discipline that black girls face stems from a perception that their femininity is somehow flawed and the discipline administered is used as a means to have black girls conform to stereotypical forms of femininity, such as being quieter and more passive. In other words, white upper class femininity. Uh, a major shift needs to happen, and I encourage city government to help foster this change by investing $5 million in restorative justice to our school. I support this work because I've seen it happen, um, and I've seen it work. Girls for Gender Equity is currently working uh, with Roy H. Mann, a middle school in the Mill Basin section of Brooklyn, to incorporate restorative practices into the fabric of their school community. Uh, the school has decided to go in this direction to uphold their core value that everyone matters um, and to work from a preventative approach as opposed to a reactive one. So things like asking a young person if how they're doing when they seem upset as opposed to letting that fester and come out later in the school day. Um, since this approach, they've seen a 90% de decrease in suspensions. They have yet to open their safe room uh, at all this year and are now moving in the next step to start uh, community building circles during classroom, class time so that they can have a school environment that is worth restoring. So, Schools need resources to implement restorative practices well, for it is not simply a program to help reduce suspensions, but a value system that yields a more humane approach to working with young people, an approach that systematic racism and sexism has kept from them for tar far too long. There are great schools that are tackling this issue head on, and many more that want to go in this direction, so let's make sure that they have the resources they need to be successful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody that came in from the panel. You know, these are issues that we're fighting for in the council. We hope to be able to increase the budget for our restorative justice uh, projects and programs in the schools, and it's a priority for this committee. So, really appreciate having your testimony. Muchísimas gracias a todos por venir. Me aprecio mucho su testimonio. Gracias. Okay, our next group, uh, E.M. Eisen Markowitz from Teachers Unite, Shana Lou Allen from Teachers Unite, uh, Miho Wontanavi uh, from Class Size Matters, and Dinaya Ilyas from Drum. I just want to check before we begin, is Rashida Latet here? Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll be next. Uh, Naima from Yaya Network? Yep. You're here? Okay. Uh, Rahul Patel from Educators for Excellence? Okay. And Cameron Maxwell? Yep. Educators for Excellence. Okay, so you'll be on the next panel. Thank you. Thank you for sticking with us, too. Appreciate it. All right, can I ask you to raise your right hands, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? All right, let's start over here. Hi, I am not E.M. Eisen Markowitz. She's a teacher at City As School High School, and so I'm speaking on her behalf. She had to go back to school for the end of the day, um, but I'm going to read her statement. Um, hello, I am E.M. Eisen Markowitz. Did you, did you state your name? Anna Bean with Teachers Unite. Okay. E.M. Um, hello, I am E.M. Eisen Markowitz, and I am in my 10th year as a teacher in New York City, and I am here even during the middle of the school day because making the city council investment go in 
the right direction is urgent in the lives of the young people I work with. In 10 years, I've seen hundreds of small human conflicts lead unnecessarily to the suspension, arrest, and or push out of black and Latino high school students. But the decades-long movement against zero tolerance, metal detectors, and policing in schools in New York City is building momentum and the political tide is turning thanks to committed grassroots organizing by educators, parents, and young people. Uh, Mayor de Blasio's preliminary budget released in January proposed new funding for positive school safety resources in the City Council itself. Thank you. Has invested $2.4 million in the restorative justice initiative from fiscal year 2016 but this money needs to go directly to schools. We need real, sustainable investment in full-time school-based staff, not just contracts for professional development with outside vendors. In my school, we used DOE funding for restorative practices training for 10 staff members every summer for three years, and by the following school year, only four or six of those teachers return, and we'd be back at the beginning. Meaningful change only started to happen in our school when our UFT chapter voted to develop two release time positions for classroom teachers to work as part-time restorative co-coordinators. The two of us didn't do all of the restorative interventions, conferences, group assists, mediations, because we had other teachers uh, and parents and students who could, but we coordinated when, where, and how they'd happen. And we connected people to ongoing training and professional development. We also connected people at times and places that meant, made sense for our school day, and we followed up. Had I been a classroom teacher with a full teaching load, I would not have had the time, energy, or resources for this kind of coordination connection. This kind of position is vital in sustaining restorative justice work in schools, and it can only function meaningfully as a school-based role fully integrated into the school community over several school years. Lots of people already in schools every day want to build restorative school climates, and lots of people in schools every day have the skills we need to do this. What we don't have is money, time, and dedicated staff. As a public school educator and a member of Teachers Unite and the Dignity in Schools Campaign New York, I'm here today to ask the City Council to allocate $5 million for, restorative justice, for the Restorative Justice Initiative to fund the second year of the initiative to ensure sustainability and to expand the number of participating schools. Uh, to direct funds to schools in order to include funding for full-time DOE staff as RJ coordinators, and encourage the mayor to invest in youth and parent leadership and district-wide coordination. Um, with a school safety budget nearing half a billion dollars, the administration must divest from police in schools and invest in what really makes schools safer for students and families. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I can't help but to remark on your comment about the political tide turning. And I think you're right in our, in our district public schools. But if you look at charter schools, it's still a huge problem. And there's two standards there. And I've brought this up at other hearings as well. And if charter schools are going to consider themselves to be public schools, then they need to also get in line with restorative practices. Because when I read about and hear about schools like Coney Island Prep, where they make kids wear an orange shirt if they have run out of pride dollars mm. so that everybody else in the class knows who has run out of pride dollars and all of the other kids in their class are forbidden from talking to the child with the orange shirt. And if you talk to the kid in the orange shirt, then you have to wear an orange shirt as well. And when I hear about those types of policies in our charter schools, I freak out. So thank you for, for saying the tide is turning and I agree with you on that. And I think we should continue to move in that direction for all public schools. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you to the City Council for your leadership in addressing how we dismantle the school to prison pipeline. This has been showcased by your $2.4 million investment in the Restorative Justice Initiative for the fiscal year of 2016. So my name is Shauna Lou Allen, and I'm a school social worker. I have been for quite some time um, for the last few years. And like many of my colleagues, I too have had to serve as the sole social worker for a school, counseling upwards of 375 students while engaging in restorative practices for conflict re resolution between students and staff. So doing mandated counseling, treatment plans, mediation, breaking up fights, running social emotional PDs for staff, guiding social emotional content for advisories, making parent calls, leading family conferences, creating safety and harm reduction plans, makes social work in schools a really hard job. And it also makes the task of shifting a counterintuitive, punitive school culture to a restorative one, a lonely one. When, however, I worked at school where there were school culture embraced, where their school culture embraced restorative practices, I saw a shift in students of color inclusive of improved engagement and support. 
The shift allows social workers to engage in more deeply clinical and family work, in addition to collaborative participation and restorative planning. The key word is collaborative. With the help of restorative coordinators, this took years to happen, and I must be clear in stating that this work cannot happen solely on the backs of social workers, teachers in schools, nor on the backs of staff of color. It is a community effort. It requires priority treatment by school administrators, um, frank conversations about race, class, power, and privilege, and strategic actions that follow, as well as buy-in from staff, students, and families. If we're saying that student voice matters, that students of color matter, and that specifically black lives matter, then we, as frontline workers, need more support on the second round of the initiative. As a member of Teachers Unite and Dignity in Schools Campaign New York, I am requesting the following. Allocating for $5 million for the Restorative Justice Initiative for the next year to ensure sustainability and expand the number of schools able to participate. To allow for the initiative to fund full-time based school staff and professional development around school climate as well as race, class, power, and privilege with respect to restorative practices. To push Mayor de Blasio's administration to increase the investment in whole school restorative justice models that also include youth and parent leadership, but most importantly, community involvement, as well as district-wide coordination. And to push for the administration to divest from policing in schools via school safety and invest in successful processes, as well as people who really make schools safe for students and families. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, and thank you to your dedication for our students. 375 cases is an awful lot to carry, believe me. Thank you. No problem. Next, please. Good evening, Chair Drum and members of the Education Committee. Thank you for holding these important hearings today. My name is Miha Watabi, and I am the Research Associate for Class Size Matters, a citywide parent and public interest group that advocates for better schools and smaller classes in New York City. Uh, my written testimony has a lot more information, but I'm going to try to breeze through it right now. Unfortunately, school budgets have not recovered since the recession, as well as the cuts both the city and the state started to impose in 2007. In 2008, schools got 100% on average fair student funding. If the mayor's proposed budget is adopted, it will mean a 9% cut to our school's funding since 2007. The result of these cuts to schools has been a loss of more than 4,000 teachers between 2007 and 2014, and an increase of class sizes since 2008. Um, now, there are more, now there are over 350,000 students crammed into classes of 30 or more this year. In light of this reality, there are many aspects of the administration's spending which appears unwise. One example, since October, the DOE has spent almost $70 million on consultants for professional development related to the Common Core, even though the State Education Commissioner has said the Common Core is likely to be significantly changed. There are a few other examples in my written testimony, but I should also quickly mention the $1.1 billion internet contract that was to be awarded to custom computer specialists, a company that had been implicated in the Ross Lanham kickback scene just a few years before. Along with Patrick Sullivan, former, Ma former Manhattan member of the PEP, we have formed a Citizens Contract Oversight Committee to provide more transparency for the DOE's contracting and procurement process. We believe there needs, to be a more there needs to be more public officials, including the City Council, involved in the oversight process to ensure against waste and fraud. For example, in the proposed contracts to be voted at the PEP this month, about half of them are retroactive, which prompts the question, what is the point of a vote that is held months after the money has been paid? On the fair student funding, the DOE weights per student do not make sense to us given the research on what is most effective to help students learn. One example is the smallest amount of, fun of funding is allocated to students in grades five, K through 5, where the investment in small classes has huge payoffs. As many studies indicate, remediation is far less effective than prevention. Um, and one last thing. Uh, finally, we are concerned about the rapid growth of funding for charter schools. Uh, in the mayor's executive budget for next year, charter school funding will cost the DOE a projected $1.5 billion, uh, rising to $2 billion by fiscal year 2020. Um, the DOE is now also funding a new program called District Charter Collaboration, which is projected to sharply increase to $2 million next year. What is this program paying for, and how is this collaboration going to benefit our public school students? Is the private sector providing matching funds for this program, or is the DOE burdened with all the expense? These are the questions that must be asked, especially as we feel the state has not enforced the 2010 charter law that requires that charter schools enroll and retain their fair share of high-need students, including English language learners and students with disabilities. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, and I've worked closely with your organization on a number of these issues, obviously. And um, I am a little bit happy, though, to see that um, this charter uh, district school initiative has happened. I just hope that uh, the results are as good as what they're expecting them to happen to be. So uh, we'll see uh, what happens in the future moving down the road. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. 
Hi, my name is Dani Elias and I'm a youth member at DRUM, Dr uh, Daisy's Rising Up and Mo Moving. DRUM organizes low-income South Asian immigrant youth, adults, and workers for immigrant rights, economic justice, and educational justice. We are also a part of, di of the Dignity in Schools campaign. I'm currently seven, uh, 17 years old and an 11th grade student at Urban Academy High School. Students deserve to have a quality education in an environment that is safe, supportive, and respects the rights and dignity of all young people. However, a few months ago, I had to make the decision to transfer out of my previous school, William Cullen Bryant High School, because I did not feel safe or supported. I had gotten to, got into multiple arguments with my teachers because, they had, because what they taught during the class was different from what was being tested on our class exams. They would always place the blame on me instead of trying to help me succeed in the class. This caused me not to care about the classes and I ended up not doing well. I was not, I was not the only one who had a problem with school administration and at times it resulted in students being suspended. There were many instances where school security agents or teachers would bully students by saying things that made them feel stupid or hurt them emotionally. For example, I used to wear a hijab and when I decided not to wear it anymore, the school, the school security agent compared me to my old school ID and said it was a great idea because I looked prettier without it anyway. Although it might have seemed like a harmless compliment, I found it offensive because I have friends and family members who still wear the hijab. Racial bi biases and institutionalized racism and bullying, whether through actions, inaction, or words, and especially when it comes from those in positions of power, make our schools into places where we do not feel safe or supported. That's what happened to me, and I ended up being pushed out of my high school. I didn't know what I could do because there was no way to address the problems because it was always their word against mine. I felt like leaving was my best option. However, if my school had restorative justice programs, I know things would have worked, a lot, worked out a lot differently. Having access to these programs in a school environment will allow students, teachers, and other school staff to work out their problems in a positive way that will benefit all sides. That is why I am here today to urge the City Council to expand funding for restorative justice in New York City public schools to $5 million in the upcoming year. Together, we can transform our schools into places that values young people and our right to a quality education. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm really sorry that incident happened to you. You know, every time I hear about these ridiculous things that um, some of the school safety agents do, it's, um, it's, it's infuriating, you know? And um, I just had another incident with um, a young man who knew me, transgendered man, actually, who knew me and reached out to me because um, he was standing in front of a school waiting for his mother to pick him up. And school safety agents and a police officer came out and told him to move. And he said, well, no, this is where my, my mother always picks me up. First of all, I don't even know what right they have to move people on a public street, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. That's my first question. But then he, he, he pointed to, um, to his belt. And on his belt, you know, he had his holster and his gun and his handcuffs. And he says, look, if you don't move, choose which one you want, the silver or the black, meaning do you want the handcuffs? or do you want the, uh, the gun? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we keep hearing this and you think the message would get through. Like, like hey, you know, like wake up, you know, um, <laughs> this is not acceptable. So I, I really, when I hear that type of a thing, what happened to you, it's, it's really horrible and we're gonna fight against that type of thing moving forward, continue to do that. So thank you for coming in and sharing that. It took a lot of courage, thank you. Thank you to everybody on the panel. Thank you. And our last, but not least, the ones who stuck with us, Educators for Excellence, Rahul Patel, Cameron Maxwell, and from Yaya Network, Naima, I hope I said it right, or Naima, yeah. And Naima, do you have a, a last name or is that your whole name? Um, Bartholomew. Uh, Rashida uh, Laquette from the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And let's start over here. Hello, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Naima Bartholomew, and I'm youth staff at the Yaya Network Youth Activists, Youth Allies. And I'm a current high school student at the New Design High School, which is located in the Lower East Side on the Seward Park campus. While attending my current high school, 
I lack connection with those in higher positions. I've watched friends close to me have up to three weeks of suspension for defying authority. What was outrageous was the crime administrators said that students committed was wearing a hat in class or even having their phone out in class. There are alternatives to handling situations in school where students and teachers have a lack of communication. This alternative is restorative justice. Restorative justice is a process in repairing or restoring a relationship between the victim and the perpetrator. Restorative justice brings participants closer, encourages accountability, and puts an end to harmful stereotypes. This process also eliminates the school-to-prison pipeline. The school-to-prison pipeline are policies that pushes students out of school and into the criminal justice system. This system disproportionately targets youth of color and youth with disabilities. We need to reverse the school-to-prison pipeline by investing in restorative justice programs. As a high school student, restorative justice practices are not just an alternative to suspensions. They're a way to build community between teachers and students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Good evening. Good, e <laughs> Good evening. I thought we started, it was morning. I know, I was hoping that would make you laugh, actually. <laughs> what time did you get here? Um, let's see. Maybe 1.45 or so. What time? 1.45 or so. Wow. Well, thank you for staying. Thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Rashida Latif. I am the advocacy coordinator at the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. And I'd like to thank Council Member Danny Drum, Chair of the Education Committee, for the opportunity to submit testimony on the fiscal year 2017 preliminary New York City budget, and specifically the need to expand universal free school lunch to all public school students. Founded in 1979, WISCA is an innovative customer choice food pantry that combines access to healthy food with support services, job training, and policy advocacy to help stabilize clients and put them on a path to self-sufficiency. In the last year, we have provided food for more than 1.1 million meals for over 43,000 families. At WISCA, we know firsthand that the impact of universal free school lunch is extremely important to our clients. Many of our clients are parents who, in addition to SNAP and emergency food programs, rely on school meals to fight hunger. Without free school meals, clients like Fatima, a mother of three school-aged children attending New York City public schools, would have fewer resources to ensure her children are not hungry and struggling academically or being bullied because of the stigma of poverty among students. This program would serve students and families across New York City, but especially our clients who we witness struggling financially on a daily basis. Recently, WISCA joined parent leaders, other advocates, and several of your colleagues in calling for expansion of universal free school lunch during a Lunch for Learning press conference in front of City Hall on March 10th. Councilmember Ben Kalos highlighted the very real impacts of stigma in the cafeteria as he described his own experience with being hungry and bullied as a student who qualified for free lunch. Um, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer detailed the administrative and technical benefits that universal free school lunch would yield in removing the need for school administrators to act as bill collectors. And Council Member Margaret Chin reiterated the cost-effective implementation of universal school lunch by emphasizing the state and federal reimbursements the city would receive, thereby costing only $3.6 million to expand universal free school lunch to elementary and high school students. Once again, WISCA would like to thank the City Council's Education Committee for its continued support for this issue and the opportunity to testify about the need to expand this program to all 1.1 million New York City public school students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you uh, for give, letting me give my testimony today. Um, my name is Rahul Patel. Uh, I'm currently a high school science teacher in the poorest urban school district in America. I'm testifying on my own behalf and not on the behalf of uh, the Department of Education. The students that walk into our school building every day are carrying with them a multitude of burdens. The odds are stacked against them, and they know it. School should be a place to ease burdens and a place to feel safe and respected by peers and adults alike. If education is the ticket out from poverty, then we should be doing everything we can to create an environment where students want to be in school, and that needs to include expanding restorative justice programs in all of our schools. Mm -hmm. My introduction to punitive forms of discipline was when I started teaching New York City schools. I witnessed middle school-aged kids who had never been convicted of a crime 
or been caught with a weapon start their day by walking through a metal detector. The message is clear. We already think you're a criminal. One of my students was suspended for losing his temper and directing some choice words towards his teacher. Rather than engaging him in a conversation about his actions, he was kicked out. This is where restorative justice and the ideologies behind restorative justice, restorative practices come into play. Students should be given a chance to analyze what they did wrong and to come up with plans to prevent it from happening again. This teaches them how to deal with difficult situations when they become an adult, how to control their temper, how to handle making mistakes, how to take ownership of mistakes and how to face the damages that they've created. Punitive disciplines does one thing, removes them from their mistake. When you know the person next to you and you know the struggle they've been through, then you are less likely to harm them. This statement has helped suspension rates drop 60% at our school by incorporating restorative justice practices into our everyday. Recently, I was able to incorporate restorative justice circles into my health class, and it was transformative. The students who participated absolutely loved it. They loved how it brought everyone together. Bringing people together exemplifies why restorative justice is the better method of behavior management rather than a punitive consequence. We should be bringing people together, bringing students in and keeping them in the classroom, not pushing them out. I've been fortunate to experience restorative justice in practice at my school and schools like mine that are piloting these approaches to non-punitive discipline. I have also been fortunate enough to study and analyze restorative justice in other school districts as an author of Educators for Excellence's policy paper on school climate and discipline. From my experiences, I firmly believe that restorative approaches can be transformative for a student's relationship with his or her school community and for the culture within a school. Positive forms of discipline practices are more inclusive and fair for the diverse population of students I serve. It is time to move past the current consequence system the New York City Department of Education employs. I ask this community to provide the support and funding to its teachers and schools to promote creating connections with students rather than a focus on corrections. In order to do so, it is necessary to greatly expand the funding currently allocated for restorative justice training for all personnel in schools and to provide funding for restorative justice coordinators at all schools. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, uh, my name is Cameron Maxwell, and I'm a seventh grade English language arts teacher at Isaac Newton Middle School in East Harlem. And I'm speaking here today on behalf of myself and not on behalf of the Department of Education. Uh, I'm speaking in support of a vision articulated by an Educators for Excellence policy team I was part of last year and to speak on behalf of a recommendation I know is critical for our New York City students and teachers. To use the language of our policy paper, we must, quote, prioritize additional training for evaluators and mentors on giving specific feedback on positive classroom culture building, end quote. Creating meaningful systems for improving school culture is a daunting task. It requires not only buy-in from staff and administration, it requires money and energy and consistency and focus and trust. It requires teachers sitting in a room for extended periods of time, having difficult conversations about what their school should look like. Crucially, it demands the hard-won insights of well-trained and experienced teachers, deans, and counselors. Without the knowledge of these mentors and teacher leaders, school culture goals are hashed out on an ad hoc basis. There may be a common desire to change a school's culture and its student-adult interactions for the better, but there is no vision, no set of practices to follow or concrete achievable goals to aspire to. Little gets done to anyone's satisfaction. Anyone who's had the experience of solving a difficult problem or completing a complex task through a series of email chains uh, knows this frustration exactly. New logistics and problem solving happen individually to the point where everyone's either working at cross purposes or miscommunications are fraying people's comedy to the breaking point. Now our school has recently adopted a positive culture building system using principles from the Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, or PBIS method, and it's supported by a great teaching app called Class Dojo. And we use this to track and validate our students' uh, various successes, and the point system allows kids to work towards rewards of various sizes. And I've seen it motivate great successes, occasionally in my own classes, and I've also seen it ignored or disparaged by teachers who haven't known or cared to learn how it can best be used. Now, if these teachers could be observed and mentored and coached by experienced culture builders and shown the craft of relationship building firsthand through observations and video recordings, we'd have a well-guided, confident staff ready to realize holistic change in their difficult classrooms. We all know how powerful one-to-one -one learning opportunities can be, and let's create more of them. And above all, let's bring a full package of resources and incentives to bear in creating a new core of veteran evaluators and mentors. 
75% of teachers surveyed by E4E have known a fellow teacher who left over student discipline issues. There needs to be a sense of urgency. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Raul, uh, in your school, you have a coordinator and uh, restorative practices have, no. There, there's no coordinator. It's been just uh, me and the dean who've been putting in extra hours after school and before school to plan all of this. And you're working to train the whole staff? Um, yeah, this is our first year piloting it. So, so far we've had about... It's you and who else? Uh, me and the dean. And Mary the dean? Price. Yeah. How many kids in your school? Um, we're a middle, high, middle and high school, so uh, I couldn't tell you. Is it a thousand? Uh, no, it's less than that. 500 maybe? Yeah, like 500, okay. 500, 600. So it's a little bit smaller, it's a, a smaller... Yeah. You know, your principal supporting you on this? Um, in words, but not with anything else. So um, it concerns me because I, I, I think that you're probably doing a good job. One of the objectives of this hearing today is to make sure that we begin to get buy-in from everybody involved in the whole school. And so one of the questions I had asked um, the chancellor when they do, I don't know if you were here earlier this morning, but I asked the chancellor when they do trainings in their school, do they do everybody? So like do they do kitchen staff, do they do custodial staff? Because when I was teaching, one of the things that I found was like, you know, as much as I would try to do good in the classroom, I'd come back after lunch and the, you know, the, the aide who had the kids on the yard at lunchtime was like going crazy, you know, and they'd throw the kid at me and, you know, ah, do something with him, you know. And then everything that I tried to do was undone by somebody who was not trained in those methods. So, you know, it would be great if we could try to get you some support to continue this and to, to build upon what it is that you're doing in the school. And, and, and Mr., is it Mr. Maxwell? Yes, correct. So is that the same thing for you? Basically the same situation that he's describing. Uh, communities are uh, very similar, yes. And uh, both of you are with Educators for Excellence. Correct. And um, when, you, when you had um, the idea of doing um, restorative practices, did that come about because of the report that you did, that Educators for Excellence did, or did you contribute to the report, or how did you come to? Well, I had practices? heard of uh, restorative practices prior to uh, joining with Educators for Excellence, but in working with the policy team that I was part of last year, I really became convinced of their value. And so one of the issues that we do see is when we try to implement restorative practices, there is some pushback from teachers who may not be familiar with it or who don't buy into it right away because they think it takes too much time away from teaching, et cetera. Um, that's been your experience? Uh, yes, yes, it has. Okay, and um, how do you go about or, or what, what, is, what do you anticipate doing to try to get some more teacher input or buy into this? Uh, well, I think having... Uh, experienced uh, leaders who can speak to its efficacy in other places and actually demonstrate it through the evidence such as video recordings or uh, through sort of a one-to-one -one, uh, mentorship with uh, some sort of culture leader um, could maybe start to create some of that shift to where they're actually being confronted with, okay, this is how it works, this is why it works, and this is how I can prove that it works. Mm -hmm. And you seventh grade, middle school? Uh, yes. And is your principal supportive? Uh, yeah, very much so. Uh, we are overmatched oftentimes by the challenges of our neighborhood, but she is behind restorative practices. So just finding new ways to do it and more effective ways to do it, I think would be a goal both for her and for myself. Do you have a coordinator? Uh, we do not, no. Okay. So the responsibility for the implementation is falling on the two, two of your shoulders? Uh, the grade level teams are typically where, grade that, level teams. Uh, right, where that, uh, those decisions are worked out. Okay. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, so I think that a lot of teachers are sort of misinformed with the fact that uh, restorative justice wastes time. Um, like I said, 60% suspension rates dropping that much. The kids are staying in the classroom longer um, since they aren't at home doing absolutely nothing. And so I think really if by incorporating restorative justice, it, you're, you could be increasing class time, not decreasing it. I, I agree wholeheartedly, and I think once you, in, uh, you know, implement it and it's done school-wide, I think that ultimately you find that you're able to do better teaching and you're better, you know, better able to even control your class. Right, yeah, it just creates a different tone within the room when you can uh, affect these practices and it really creates a situation where kids feel more positively about their education and their school. Yeah, and I, I mean, initially I think some, you may have to spend some extra time on finding out what the issue is that is making the kids act that way. You know, maybe you didn't have food at home, maybe you had a fight with mom and dad or something like that, or mom and dad's doing something. But I think ultimately when you can form those circles. I, I particularly believe in circles, actually. Um, I think that um, it makes for a much better and easier teaching um, day. So, but thank you, everybody, to the whole panel for coming in. This has been a great expense budget hearing, and I think we are about to close this.
and adjourn. It is now 5.55 p.m. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>